Welcome to Romance Audiobook. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. The 1815 season is well underway, and while one would think that all talk would be of Wellington and Waterloo, in truth there is little change from the conversations of 1814, which centered around that most eternal of society topics, marriage. As usual, the matrimonial hopes among the debutante set center upon the Bridgerton family, most specifically the eldest of the available brothers, Benedict. He might not possess a title, but his handsome face, pleasing form, and heavy purse appear to have made up for that lack handily. Indeed, this author has heard, on more than one occasion, an ambitious mamma saying of her daughter, She'll marry a duke or a Bridgerton. For his part, Mr. Bridgerton seems most uninterested in the young ladies who frequent society events. He attends almost every party, yet he does nothing but watch the doors, presumably waiting for some special person. Perhaps a potential bride? Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 12th of July, 1815. Prologue. Everyone knew that Sophie Beckett was a bastard. The servants all knew it, but they loved little Sophie, had loved her since she'd arrived at Penwood Park at the age of three, a small bundle wrapped in a too big coat left on the doorstep on a rainy July night. And because they loved her, they pretended that she was exactly what the sixth Earl of Penwood said she was the orphaned daughter of an old friend. Never mind that Sophie's moss-green eyes and dark blonde hair matched the Earl's precisely. Never mind that the shape of her face looked remarkably like that of the Earl's recently deceased mother, or that her smile was an exact replica of the Earl's sister's. No one wanted to hurt Sophie's feelings, or risk their livelihoods, by pointing that out. The Earl... One Richard Gunningworth never discussed Sophie or her origins, but he must have known she was his bastard. No one knew what had been in the letter the housekeeper had fished from Sophie's pocket when she'd been discovered that rainy midnight. The Earl had burned the missive mere seconds after reading it. He'd watched the paper shrivel and curl in the flames, then ordered a room made up for Sophie near the nursery. She'd remained there ever since. He called her Sophia, and she called him My Lord, and they saw each other a few times a year whenever the Earl returned home from London, which wasn't very often. But perhaps most importantly, Sophie knew she was a bastard. She wasn't entirely certain how she knew it, just that she did, and probably had her entire life. She had few memories of her life before her arrival at Penwood Park, but she could remember a long coach journey across England, and she could remember her grandmother coughing and wheezing and looking terribly thin, telling her she was going to live with her father. And most of all, she could remember standing on the doorstep in the rain, knowing that her grandmother was hiding in the bushes, waiting to see if Sophie was taken inside. The Earl had touched his fingers to the little girl's chin, tipped her face up to the light, and in that moment... They both knew the truth. Everyone knew Sophie was a bastard, and no one talked about it, and they were all quite happy with this arrangement. Until the Earl decided to marry. Sophie had been quite pleased when she'd heard the news. The housekeeper had said that the butler had said that the Earl's secretary had said that the Earl planned to spend more time at Penwood Park now that he would be a family man. And while Sophie didn't exactly miss the Earl when he was gone, it was hard to miss someone who didn't pay her much attention even when he was there. She rather thought she might miss him if she got to know him better. And if she got to know him better, maybe he wouldn't go away so often. Plus, the upstairs maid had said that the housekeeper had said that the neighbor's butler had said that the Earl's intended wife already had two daughters— and they were near in age to Sophie. After seven years alone in the nursery, Sophie was delighted. Unlike the other children in the district, she was never invited to local parties and events, 
No one actually came out and called her a bastard. To do so was tantamount to calling the Earl, who had made one declaration that Sophie was his ward, and then never revisited the subject, a liar. But at the same time, the Earl never made any great attempt to force Sophie's acceptance. And so, at the age of ten, Sophie's best friends were maids and footmen, and her parents might as well have been the housekeeper and butler. But now she was getting sisters for real. Oh, she knew she could not call them her sisters. She knew that she would be introduced as Sophia Maria Beckett, the Earl's ward, but they would feel like sisters, and that was what really mattered. And so, one February afternoon, Sophie found herself waiting in the great hall, along with the assembled servants, watching out the window for the Earl's carriage to pull up the drive, carrying in it the new Countess and her two daughters, and, of course, the Earl. Do you think she'll like me? Sophie whispered to Mrs. Gibbons, the housekeeper. The Earl's wife, I mean. Of course she'll like you, dearling, Mrs. Gibbons whispered back. But her eyes hadn't been as certain as her tone. The new Countess might not take kindly to the presence of her husband's by-blow. And I'll take lessons with her daughters. No point in having you take your lessons separately. Sophie nodded thoughtfully, then started to squirm, and she saw the carriage rolling up the drive. They're here, she whispered. Mrs. Gibbons reached out to pat her on the head, but Sophie had already dashed off to the window, practically pressing her face up to the glass. The Earl stepped down first, then reached in and helped down two young girls. They were dressed in matching black coats. One wore a pink ribbon in her hair, the other yellow. Then, as the two girls stepped aside, the Earl reached up to help one last person from the carriage. Sophie's breath caught in her throat as she waited for the new Countess to emerge. Her little fingers crossed, and a single, Please, whispered over her lips. Please let her love me. Maybe if the Countess loved her, then the Earl would love her as well. And maybe, even if he didn't actually call her daughter, he'd treat her as one, and they'd be a family truly. As Sophie watched through the window, the new Countess stepped down from the carriage, her every movement so graceful and pure that Sophie was reminded of the delicate lark that occasionally came to splash in the birdbath in the garden. Even the Countess's hat was adorned by a long feather, its turquoise plume glittering in the hard winter sun. She's beautiful, Sophie whispered. She darted a quick look back at Mrs. Gibbons to gauge her reaction, but the housekeeper was standing at strict attention, eyes straight ahead, waiting for the Earl to bring his new family inside for introductions. Sophie gulped, not exactly certain where she was meant to stand. Everyone else seemed to have a designated place. The servants were lined up according to rank, from the butler right down to the lowliest scullery maid. Even the dogs were sitting dutifully in the corner, their leads held tight by the keeper of the hounds. But Sophie was rootless. If she were truly the daughter of the house, she'd be standing with her governess, awaiting the new countess. If she were truly the earl's ward, she'd be in much the same place. But Miss Timmons had caught a head cold, and refused to leave the nursery and come downstairs. None of the servants believed for a second that the governess was truly ill. She'd been fine the night before, but no one blamed her for the deception. Sophie was, after all, the Earl's bastard, and no one wanted to be the one to offer potential insult to the new Countess by introducing her to her husband's by-blow. And the Countess would have to be blind, stupid, or both, not to realise in an instant that Sophie was something more than the Earl's ward. Suddenly overcome with shyness, Sophie shrank into a corner, as two footmen threw open the front doors with a flourish. The two girls entered first, then stepped to the side as the Earl led the Countess in. The Earl introduced the Countess and her daughters to the butler, and the butler introduced them to the servants. And Sophie waited. The butler presented the footman, the chef, the housekeeper, the grooms. And Sophie waited.
He presented the kitchen maids, the upstairs maids, the scullery maids, and Sophie waited. And then finally the butler, Rumsey was his name, presented the lowliest of the lowest of maids, a scullery girl named Dulcie, who had been hired a mere week earlier. The earl nodded and murmured his thanks, and Sophie was still waiting, completely unsure of what to do. So she cleared her throat and stepped forward, a nervous smile on her face. She didn't spend much time with the earl, but she was trotted out before him whenever he visited Penwood Park, and he always gave her a few minutes of his time, asking about her lessons before shooing her back up to the nursery. Surely he'd still want to know how her studies were progressing, even now that he'd married. Surely he'd want to know that she'd mastered the science of multiplying fractions, and that Miss Timmons had recently declared her French accent perfection. But he was busy saying something to the Countess's daughters, and he didn't hear her. Sophie cleared her throat again, this time more loudly, and said, My lord! in a voice that came out a bit more squeaky than she'd intended. The earl turned around. Ah, Sophia, he murmured. I didn't realize you were in the hall. Sophie beamed. He hadn't been ignoring her after all. And who might this be? the countess asked, stepping forward to get a better look. My ward, the earl replied. Miss Sophia Beckett. The countess speared Sophie with an assessing look. Then her eyes narrowed, and narrowed, and narrowed some more. I see, she said. And everyone in the room knew instantly that she did see. Rosamond, the countess said, turning to her two girls. Posy, come with me. The girls moved immediately to their mother's side. Sophie hazarded a smile in their direction. The smaller one smiled back, but the older one, whose hair was the colour of spun gold, took her cue from her mother, pointed her nose in the air, and looked firmly away. Sophie gulped and smiled again at the friendly girl, but this time the little girl chewed on her lower lip in indecision, then cast her eyes toward the floor. The countess turned her back on Sophie and said to the earl, I assume you have had rooms prepared for Rosamond and Posy? He nodded near the nursery, right next to Sophie. There was a long silence, and then the Countess must have decided that certain battles should not be conducted before the servants, because all she said was, I would like to go upstairs now. And she left, taking the Earl and her daughters along with her. Sophie watched the new family walk up the stairs, and then, as they disappeared onto the landing, she turned to Mrs. Gibbons and asked, Do you think I should go up to help? I could show the girls the nursery. Mrs. Gibbons shook her head. They looked tired, she lied. I'm sure they'll be needing a nap. Sophie frowned. She'd been told that Rosamond was eleven and Posy was ten. Surely that was a bit old for taking naps. Mrs. Gibbons patted her on the back. Why don't you come with me? I could use a bit of company, and Cook told me that she'd just made a fresh batch of shortbread. I think it's still warm. Sophie nodded and followed her out of the hall. She'd have plenty of time that evening to get to know the two girls. She'd show them the nursery, and then they'd become friends, and before long they'd be as sisters. Sophie smiled. It would be glorious to have sisters. As it happened... Sophie did not encounter Rosamond and Posy, or the Earl and Countess, for that matter, until the next day. When Sophie entered the nursery to take her supper, she noticed that the table had been set for two, not four, and Miss Timmons, who had miraculously recovered from her ailment, said that the new Countess had told her that Rosamond and Posy were too tired from their travels to eat that evening. But the girls had to have their lessons— and so, the next morning, they arrived in the nursery, trailing the countess by one step each. Sophie had been working at her lessons for an hour already, and she looked up from her arithmetic with great interest. She didn't smile at the girls this time. Somehow, it seemed best not to.
Miss Timmons, the Countess said. Miss Timmons bobbed a curtsy, murmuring, My lady, the Earl tells me you will teach my daughters. I will do my best, my lady. The Countess motioned to the older girl, the one with golden hair and cornflower eyes. She looked, Sophie thought, as pretty as the porcelain doll the Earl had sent up from London for her seventh birthday. This, the Countess said, is Rosamond. She is eleven. And this, she then motioned to the other girl, who had not taken her eyes off of her shoes, is Posy. She is ten. Sophie looked at Posy with great interest. Unlike her mother and sister, her hair and eyes were quite dark, and her cheeks were a bit pudgy. Sophie is also ten, Miss Timmons replied. The Countess's lips thinned. I would like you to show the girls around the house and garden. Miss Timmons nodded. Very well. Sophie, put your slate down. We can return to arithmetic. Just my girls, the Countess interrupted, her voice somehow hot and cold at the same time. I will speak with Sophie alone. Sophie gulped and tried to bring her eyes to the Countess's, but she only made it as far as her chin. As Miss Timmons ushered Rosamond and Posy out of the room, she stood up, awaiting further direction from her father's new wife. I know who you are, the Countess said, the moment the door clicked shut. M my lady? You're his bastard, and don't try to deny it. Sophie said nothing. It was the truth, of course, but no one had ever said it aloud, at least not to her face. The Countess grabbed her chin and squeezed and pulled until Sophie was forced to look her in the eye. You listen to me, she said in a menacing voice. You might live here at Penwood Park, and you might share lessons with my daughters, but you are nothing but a bastard, and that is all you will ever be. Don't you ever, ever make the mistake of thinking you are as good as the rest of us. Sophie let out a little moan. The Countess's fingernails were biting into the underside of her chin. My husband, the Countess continued, feels some sort of misguided duty to you. It's admirable of him to see to his mistakes, but it is an insult to me to have you in my home, fed, clothed and educated as if you were his real daughter. But she was his real daughter, and it had been her home much longer than the Countess's. Abruptly, the Countess let go of her chin. I don't want to see you, she hissed. You are never to speak to me, and you shall endeavour never to be in my company. Furthermore, you are not to speak to Rosamond and Posy, except during lessons. They are the daughters of the house now, and should not have to associate with the likes of you. Do you have any questions? Sophie shook her head. Good. And with that, she swept out of the room, leaving Sophie with wobbly legs and a quivering lip, and an awful lot of tears. In time, Sophie learned a bit more about her precarious position in the house. The servants always knew everything, and it all reached Sophie's ears eventually. The Countess, whose given name was Araminta, had insisted that very first day that Sophie be removed from the house. The Earl had refused. Araminta didn't have to love Sophie, he'd said coolly. She didn't even have to like her. But she had to put up with her. He had owned up to his responsibility to the girl for seven years, and he wasn't going to stop now. Rosamond and Posy took their cues from Araminta and treated Sophie with hostility and disdain, although Posy's heart clearly wasn't into torture and cruelty in the way Rosamond's was. Rosamond liked nothing better than to pinch and twist the skin on the back of Sophie's hand when Miss Timmons wasn't looking. Sophie never said anything. She rather doubted that Miss Timmons would have the courage to reprimand Rosamond, who would surely run to Araminta with a false tale, and if anyone noticed that Sophie's hands were perpetually black and blue— no one ever said so.
Posy showed her the occasional kindness, although more often than not she just sighed and said, My mummy says I'm not to be nice to you. As for the Earl, he never intervened. Sophie's life continued in this vein for four years, until the Earl surprised everyone by clutching his hand to his chest while taking tea in the rose garden, letting out one ragged gasp and falling face first to the stone cobbles. He never regained consciousness. Everyone was quite shocked. The Earl was only forty years old. Who could have known that his heart would give out at such a young age? No one was more stunned than Araminta, who had been trying quite desperately since her wedding night to conceive the all-important heir. "'I might be with child,' she hastened to tell the Earl's solicitors. "'You can't give the title over to some distant cousin. I could very well be with child.' But she wasn't with child, and when the Earl's will was read one month later, the solicitors had wanted to be sure to give the Countess enough time to know for sure if she was pregnant— Araminta was forced to sit next to the new Earl, a rather dissolute young man who was more often drunk than not. Most of the Earl's wishes were standard fare. He left bequests to loyal servants. He settled funds on Rosamond, Posy, and even Sophie, ensuring that all three girls would have respectable diaries. And then the solicitor reached Araminta's name. To my wife, Araminta Gunningworth, Countess of Penwood, I leave a yearly income of two thousand pounds. That's all, Araminta cried out. Unless she agrees to shelter and care for my ward, Miss Sophia Maria Beckett, until the latter reaches the age of twenty, in which case her yearly income shall be trebled to six thousand pounds. I don't want her, Araminta whispered. You don't have to take her, the solicitor reminded her. You can live on a measly two thousand a year, she snapped. I don't think so. The solicitor, who lived on considerably less than two thousand a year, said nothing. The new earl, who'd been drinking steadily throughout the meeting, just shrugged. Araminta stood. What is your decision? the solicitor asked. I'll take her, she said in a low voice. Shall I find the girl and tell her? Araminta shook her head. I'll tell her myself. But when Araminta found Sophie, she left out a few important facts. Part One Chapter One this year's most sought-after invitation must surely be that of the Bridgerton Masquerade Ball, to be held Monday next. Indeed, one cannot take two steps without being forced to listen to some society mamma speculating on who will attend, and perhaps more importantly, who will wear what. Neither of the aforementioned topics, however, are nearly as interesting as that of the two unmarried Bridgerton brothers, Benedict and Colin. Before anyone points out that there is a third unmarried Bridgerton brother, let this author assure you that she is fully aware of the existence of Gregory Bridgerton. He is, however, fourteen years of age, and therefore not pertinent to this particular column, which concerns as this author's columns often do, that most sacred of sports, husband hunting. Although the Misters Bridgerton are just that, merely Misters, they are still considered two of the prime catches of the season. It is a well-known fact that both are possessed of respectable fortunes, and it does not require perfect sight to know that they also possess, as do all eight of the Bridgerton offspring, the Bridgerton good looks. Will some fortunate young lady use the mystery of a masquerade night to snare one of the eligible bachelors? This author isn't even going to attempt to speculate. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 31st of May, 1815. Sophie! Sophie! As screeches went, it was enough to shatter glass, or at least an eardrum, 
Coming, Rosamond, I'm coming. Sophie hitched up the hem of her coarse woolen skirts and hurried up the stairs. Slipping on the fourth step, and only just barely managing to grab the banister before landing on her bottom. She should have remembered that the stairs would be slick. She'd helped the downstairs maid wax them just that morning. Skidding to a halt in the doorway to Rosamond's bedroom, and still catching her breath, Sophie said, Yes, my tea is cold. What Sophie wanted to say was, It was warm when I brought it an hour ago, you lazy fiend. What she did say was, I'll get you another pot. Rosamond sniffed. See that you do. Sophie stretched her lips into what the nearly blind might call a smile and picked up the tea service. Shall I leave the biscuits? she asked. Rosamond gave her pretty head a shake. I want fresh ones. Shoulders slightly stooped from the weight of the overloaded tea service, Sophie exited the room careful not to start grumbling until she'd safely reached the hall. Rosamond was forever ordering tea, then not bothering to drink it until an hour passed. By then, of course, it was cold, so she had to order a fresh pot, which meant Sophie was forever running up and down the stairs, up and down, up and down. Sometimes it seemed that was all she did with her life. Up and down, up and down. And, of course, the mending, the pressing, the hairdressing, the shoe polishing, the darning, the bed making. Sophie! Sophie turned around to see Posy heading toward her. Sophie, I've been meaning to ask you, do you think this colour is becoming on me? Sophie assessed Posy's mermaid costume. The cut wasn't quite right for Posy who had never lost all of her baby fat, but the colour did indeed bring out the best in her complexion. It is a lovely shade of green, Sophie replied quite honestly. It makes your cheeks very rosy. Oh, good. I'm so glad you like it. You do have such a knack for picking up my clothing. Posy smiled as she reached out and plucked a sugared biscuit from the tray. Mother has been an absolute bear all week about the masquerade ball, and I know I shall never hear the end of it if I do not look my best. Or, Posy's face twisted into a grimace, if she thinks I do not look my best, she is determined that one of us snare one of the remaining Bridgerton brothers, you know. I know. And to make matters worse, that Whistledown woman has been writing about them again. It only... Posy finished chewing and paused while she swallowed. Wets her appetite. Was the column very good this morning? Sophie asked, shifting the tray to rest on her hip. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Oh, the usual stuff, Posy said with a wave of her hand. Really, it can be quite humdrum, you know. Sophie tried to smile and failed. She'd like nothing more than to live a day of Posy's humdrum life. Well, perhaps she wouldn't want Araminta for a mother, but she wouldn't mind a life of parties, routs, and musicals. Let's see, Posy mused. There was a review of Lady Worth's recent ball, a bit about Viscount Guelph, who seems rather smitten with some girl from Scotland, and then a longish piece on the upcoming Bridgerton masquerade. Sophie sighed. She'd been reading about the upcoming masquerade for weeks, and even though she was nothing but a lady's maid, and occasionally a housemaid as well, whenever Araminta decided she wasn't working hard enough, she couldn't help but wish that she could attend the ball. I, for one, will be thrilled if that Guelph Viscount gets himself engaged, Posy remarked, reaching for another biscuit. It will mean one fewer bachelor for mother to go on and on about as a potential husband. It's not as if I have any hope of attracting his attention anyway. She took a bite of the biscuit. It crunched loudly in her mouth. I do hope Lady Whistledown is right about him. She probably is, Sophie answered. She had been reading Lady Whistledown's society papers since it had debuted in 1813 and the gossip columnist was almost always correct when it came to matters of the marriage mart.
not, of course, that Sophie had ever had the chance to see the marriage mart for herself. But if one read Whistledown often enough, one could almost feel a part of London society without actually attending any balls. In fact, reading Whistledown was really Sophie's one true enjoyable pastime. She'd already read all of the novels in the library, and as neither Araminta, Rosamond, nor Posy was particularly enamoured of reading, Sophie couldn't look forward to a new book entering the house. But Whistledown was great fun. No one actually knew the columnist's true identity. When the single-sheet newspaper had debuted two years earlier, speculation had been rampant. Even now, whenever Lady Whistledown reported a particularly juicy bit of gossip, people started talking and guessing anew, wondering who on earth was able to report with such speed and accuracy. And for Sophie, Whistledown was a tantalising glimpse into the world that might have been hers had her parents actually made their union legal. She would have been an earl's daughter, not an earl's bastard. Her name... Gunningworth, instead of Beckett. Just once, she'd like to be the one stepping into the coach and attending the ball. Instead, she was the one dressing others for their nights on the town, cinching Posy's corset, or dressing Rosamond's hair, or polishing a pair of Araminta's shoes. But she could not, or at least should not, complain. She might have to serve as maid to Araminta and her daughters, but at least she had a home, which was more than most girls in her position had. When her father had died, he'd left her nothing. Well, nothing but a roof over her head. His will had ensured that she could not be turned out until she was twenty. There was no way that Araminta would forfeit four thousand pounds a year by giving Sophie the boot. But that four thousand pounds was Araminta's, not Sophie's, and Sophie hadn't ever seen a penny of it. Gone were the fine clothes she'd used to wear, replaced by the coarse wool of the servants. And she ate what the rest of the maids ate, whatever Araminta, Rosamond, and Posy chose to leave behind. Sophie's twentieth birthday, however, had come and gone almost a year earlier. And here she was, still living at Penwood House, still waiting on Araminta hand and foot, for some unknown reason, probably because she didn't want to train or pay a new maid, Araminta had allowed Sophie to remain in her household. And Sophie had stayed. If Araminta was the devil she knew, then the rest of the world was the devil she didn't. And Sophie had no idea which would be worse. Isn't that tray getting heavy? Sophie blinked her way out of her reverie and focused on Posy who was reaching for the last biscuit on the tray. Drat! She'd been hoping to snitch it for herself. Yes, she murmured. Yes, it is quite. I should really be getting to the kitchen with it. Posy smiled. I won't keep you any longer. But when you're done with that, could you press my pink gown? I'm going to wear it tonight. Oh, and I suppose the matching shoes should be readied as well. I got a bit of dirt on them last time I wore them, and you know how Mother is about shoes. Never mind that you can't even see them under my skirt. She'll notice the tiniest speck of dirt the instant I lift my hem to climb a step. Sophie nodded, mentally adding Posy's requests to her daily list of chores. I'll see you later, then. Biting down on that last biscuit, Posy turned and disappeared into her bedchamber, and Sophie trudged down to the kitchen. A few days later, Sophie was on her knees, pins clamped between her teeth as she made last-minute alterations on Araminta's masquerade costume. The Queen Elizabeth gown had, of course, been delivered from the dressmaker as a perfect fit, but Araminta insisted that it was now a quarter inch too large in the waist. How is that? Sophie asked speaking through her teeth so the pins wouldn't fall. Too tight! Sophie adjusted a few pins. What about that? Too loose! Sophie pulled out a pin and stuck it back in precisely the same spot. There! How does that feel? 
Araminta twisted this way and that, then finally declared, It'll do. Sophie smiled to herself as she stood to help Araminta out of the gown. I'll need it done in an hour if we're to get to the ball on time, Araminta said. Of course, Sophie murmured. She'd found it easiest just to say, of course, on a regular basis, in conversations with Araminta. This ball is very important, Araminta said sharply. Rosamond must make an advantageous match this year. The new Earl... She shuddered with distaste. She still considered the new Earl an interloper, never mind that he was the old Earl's closest living male relative. Well, he has told me that this is the last year we may use Penwood House in London. The nerve of the man... I am the Dowager Countess, after all, and Rosamond and Posy are the Earl's daughters. Stepdaughters, Sophie silently corrected. We have every right to use Penwood House for the season. What he plans to do with the house, I'll never know. Perhaps he wishes to attend the season and look for a wife, Sophie suggested. He'll be wanting an heir, I'm sure. Araminta scowled. If Rosamond doesn't marry into money, I don't know what we'll do. It is so difficult to find a proper house to rent, and so expensive as well. Sophie forbore to point out that at least Araminta didn't have to pay for a lady's maid. In fact, until Sophie had turned twenty, she'd received four thousand pounds per year just for having a lady's maid. Araminta snapped her fingers. Don't forget that Rosamond will need her hair powdered. Rosamond was attending dressed as Marie Antoinette. Sophie had asked if she was planning to put a ring of faux blood around her neck. Rosamond had not been amused. Araminta pulled on her dressing gown, cinching the sash with swift, tight movements. And Posy, her nose wrinkled. Well, Posy will need your help in some manner or other, I'm sure. I'm always glad to help Posy, Sophie replied. Araminta narrowed her eyes as she tried to figure out if Sophie was being insolent. Just see that you do, she finally said, her syllables clipped. She stalked off to the washroom. Sophie saluted as the door closed behind her. Ah, oh, there you are, Sophie, Rosamond said as she bustled into the room. I need your help immediately. I'm afraid it'll have to wait until I said immediately. Rosamond snapped. Sophie squared her shoulders and gave Rosamond a steely look. Your mother wants me to alter her gown. Just pull the pins out and tell her you pulled it in. She'll never notice the difference. Sophie had been considering the very same thing, and she groaned. If she did as Rosamond asked, Rosamond would tattle on her the very next day, and then Araminta would rant and rage for a week. Now she would definitely have to do the alteration. What do you need, Rosamond? There is a tear at the hem of my costume. I have no idea how it happened. Perhaps when you tried it on, don't be impertinent! Sophie clamped her mouth shut. It was far more difficult to take orders from Rosamond than from Araminta, probably because they'd once been equals, sharing the same schoolroom and governess. It must be repaired immediately. Rosamond said with an affected sniff. Sophie sighed. Just bring it in. I'll do it right after I finish with your mother's. I promise you'll have it in plenty of time. I won't be late for this ball, Rosamond warned. If I am, I shall have your head on a platter. You won't be late, Sophie promised. Rosamond made a rather huffy sound, then hurried out the door to retrieve her costume. Oh! Sophie looked up to see Rosamond crashing into Posy, who was barreling through the door. Watch where you're going, Posy! Rosamond snapped. You could watch where you're going too, Posy pointed out. I was watching. It's impossible to get out of your way, you big oaf! Posy's cheeks stained red, and she stepped aside. Did you need something, Posy? Sophie asked, as soon as Rosamond had disappeared. Posy nodded. Could you set aside a little extra time to dress my hair tonight? 
I found some green ribbons that look a little like seaweed. Sophie let out a long breath. The dark green ribbons weren't likely to show up very well against Posy's dark hair, but she didn't have the heart to point that out. I'll try, Posy, but I have to mend Rosamond's dress and alter your mother's. Oh. Posy looked crestfallen. It nearly broke Sophie's heart. Posy was the only person who was even halfway nice to her in Araminta's household, save for the servants. Don't worry, she assured her. I'll make sure your hair is lovely, no matter how much time we have. Oh, thank you, Sophie. I... Haven't you gotten started on my gown yet? Araminta thundered as she returned from the washroom. Sophie gulped. I was talking with Rosamond and Posy. Rosamond tore her gown and just get to work. I will, immediately. Sophie plopped down on the settee and turned the gown inside out so that she could take in the waist. Faster than immediately, she muttered. Faster than a hummingbird's wings. Faster than... What are you chattering about? Araminta demanded. Nothing. Well, cease your prattle immediately. I find the sound of your voice particularly grating. Sophie ground her teeth together. Mama, Posy said. Sophie is going to dress my hair tonight like... Of course she's going to dress your hair... Quit your dilly-dallying this minute and go put compresses on your eyes so they don't look so puffy. Posy's face fell. My eyes are puffy. Sophie shook her head on the off chance that Posy decided to look down at her. Your eyes are always puffy, Araminta replied. Don't you think so, Rosamond? Posy and Sophie both turned toward the door. Rosamond had just entered, carrying her Marie Antoinette gown, Always, she agreed. But a compress will help, I'm sure. You look stunning tonight, Araminta told Rosamond. And you haven't even started getting ready. That gold in your gown is an exquisite match to your hair. Sophie shot a sympathetic look at the dark-haired posy, who never received such compliments from her mother. You shall snare one of those Bridgerton brothers, Araminta continued. I'm sure of it. Rosamond looked down demurely. It was an expression she'd perfected, and Sophie had to admit it looked lovely on her. But then again, most everything looked lovely on Rosamond. Her golden hair and blue eyes were all the rage that year, and thanks to the generous diary settled upon her by the late Earl, it was widely assumed that she would make a brilliant match before the season was through. Sophie glanced back over at Posy who was staring at her mother with a sad, wistful expression. "'You look lovely too, Posy,' Sophie said impulsively. Posy's eyes lit up. "'Do you think so? Absolutely. And your gown is terribly original. I'm sure there won't be any other mermaids.' "'How would you know, Sophie?' Rosamond asked with a laugh. "'It's not as if you've ever been out in society. I'm sure you'll have a lovely time, Posy.' Sophie said pointedly, ignoring Rosamond's jibe. I'm terribly jealous. I do wish I could go. Sophie's little sigh and wish was met with absolute silence, followed by the raucous laughter of both Araminta and Rosamond. Even Posy giggled a bit. Oh, that's rich, Araminta said, barely able to catch her breath. Little Sophie at the Bridgerton Ball! They don't allow bastards out in society, you know. I didn't say I expected to go, Sophie said defensively. Just that I wish I could. Well, you shouldn't even bother doing that, Rosamond chimed in. If you wish for things you can't possibly hope for, you're only going to be disappointed. But Sophie didn't hear what she had to say, because in that moment the oddest thing happened— as she was turning her head toward Rosamond, she caught sight of the housekeeper standing in the doorway. It was Mrs. Gibbons, who had come up from Penwood Park in the country when the town housekeeper had passed away. And when Sophie's eyes met hers, she winked. Winked! Sophie didn't think she'd ever seen Mrs. Gibbons wink. Sophie! Sophie! Are you listening to me? Sophie turned a distracted eye toward Araminta. I'm sorry, 
she murmured. You were saying? I was saying, Araminta said in a nasty voice, that you had better get to work on my gun this instant. If we are late for the ball, you will answer for it tomorrow. Yes, of course, Sophie said quickly. She jabbed her needle into the fabric and started sewing, but her mind was still on Mrs. Gibbons. A wink? Why on earth would she wink? Three hours later, Sophie was standing on the front steps of Penwood House, watching first Araminta, then Rosamond, then Posy, each take the footman's hand and climb up into the carriage. Sophie waved at Posy, who waved back, then watched the carriage roll down the street and disappear around the corner. It was barely six blocks to Bridgerton House, where the masquerade was to be held, but Araminta would have insisted upon the carriage if they'd lived right next door. It was important to make a grand entrance, after all. With a sigh, Sophie turned around and made her way back up the steps. At least Araminta had, in the excitement of the moment, forgotten to leave her with a list of tasks to complete while she was gone. A free evening was a luxury indeed. Perhaps she'd reread a novel. Or maybe she could find today's edition of Whistledown. She'd thought she'd seen Rosamond take it into her room earlier that afternoon. But as Sophie stepped through the front door of Penwood House, Mrs. Gibbons materialised as if from nowhere and grabbed her arm. There's no time to lose, the housekeeper said. Sophie looked at her as if she'd lost her mind. I beg your pardon. Mrs. Gibbons tugged at her elbow. Come with me. Sophie allowed herself to be led up the three flights of stairs to her room, a tiny little chamber tucked under the eaves. Mrs. Gibbons was acting in a most peculiar manner, but Sophie humoured her and followed along. The housekeeper had always treated her with exceptional kindness, even when it was clear that Araminta disapproved. "'You'll need to get undressed,' Mrs. Gibbons said, as she grasped the doorknob. "'What? We really must rush!' "'Mrs. Gibbons, you—' Sophie's mouth fell open, and her words trailed off as she took in the scene in her bedroom. A steaming tub of water lay right in the centre, and all three housemaids were bustling about. One was pouring a pitcher of water into the tub. Another was fiddling with the lock on a rather mysterious-looking trunk, and the third was holding a towel and saying, "'Hurry, hurry!' Sophie cast bewildered eyes at the lot of them, what is going on? Mrs. Gibbons turned to her and beamed. You, Miss Sophia Maria Beckett, are going to the masquerade. One hour later, Sophie was transformed. The trunk had held dresses belonging to the late Earl's mother. They were all fifty years out of date, but that was no matter. The ball was a masquerade. No one expected the gowns to be of the latest styles. At the very bottom of the trunk, they'd found an exquisite creation of shimmering silver, with a tight pearl-encrusted bodice and the flared skirts that had been so popular during the previous century. Sophie felt like a princess just touching it. It was a bit musty from its years in the trunk, and one of the maids quickly took it outside to dab a bit of rose water on the fabric and air it out. She'd been bathed and perfumed, her hair had been dressed, and one of the housemaids had even applied a touch of rouge to her lips. "'Don't tell Miss Rosamond,' the maid had whispered. "'I nicked it from her collection.' "'Oh, look!' Mrs. Gibbons said. "'I found matching gloves!' Sophie looked up to see the housekeeper holding up a pair of long, elbow-length gloves. "'Look!' she said taking one from Mrs. Gibbons and examining it. The Penwood crest, and it's monogrammed, right at the hem. Mrs. Gibbons turned over the one in her hand. S.L.G. Sarah Louisa Gunningworth, your grandmother. Sophie looked at her in surprise. Mrs. Gibbons had never referred to the Earl as her father. No one at Penwood Park had ever verbally acknowledged Sophie's blood ties to the Gunningworth family. Well, she is your grandmother, Mrs. Gibbons declared. We've all danced around the issue long enough. 
It's a crime the way Rosamond and Posey are treated like daughters of the house, and you, the Earl's true blood, must sweep and serve like a maid. The three housemaids nodded in agreement. Just once, Mrs. Gibbon said, for just one night, you will be the belle of the ball. With a smile on her face, she slowly turned Sophie around until she was facing the mirror. Sophie's breath caught. Is that me? Mrs. Gibbons nodded, her eyes suspiciously bright. You look lovely, dearling, she whispered. Sophie's hand moved slowly up to her hair. Don't muss it, one of the maids yelped. I won't, Sophie promised, a smile wobbling a bit as she fought back a tear. A touch of shimmery powder had been sprinkled onto her hair so that she sparkled like a fairy princess. Her dark blonde curls had been swept atop her head in a loose top knot, with one thick lock allowed to slide down the length of her neck, and her eyes, normally moss green, shone like emeralds. Although Sophie suspected that might have had more to do with her unshed tears than anything else. Here is your mask, Mrs. Gibbon said briskly. It was a demi mask, the sort that tied at the back, so that Sophie would not have to use one of her hands to hold it up. Now all we need are shoes. Sophie glanced ruefully at her serviceable and ugly work shoes that sat in the corner. I have nothing suitable for such finery, I'm afraid. The housemaid, who had rouged Sophie's lips, held up a pair of white slippers. From Rosamond's closet, she said. Sophie slid her right foot into one of the slippers, and just as quickly slid it back out. It's much too big, she said, glancing up at Mrs. Gibbons. I'll never be able to walk in them. Mrs. Gibbons turned to the maid. Fetch a pair from Posy's closet. Those are even bigger, Sophie said. I know. I've cleaned enough scuff marks from them. Mrs. Gibbons let out a long sigh. There's nothing for it, then. We shall have to raid Araminta's collection. Sophie shuddered. The thought of walking anywhere in Araminta's shoes was somewhat creepy. But it was either that or go without, and she didn't think that bare feet would be acceptable at a fancy London masquerade. A few minutes later, the maid returned with a pair of white satin slippers, stitched in silver and adorned with exquisite faux diamond rosettes. Sophie was still apprehensive about wearing Araminta's shoes, but she slipped one of her feet in anyway. It fit perfectly. And they match too, one of the maids said, pointing to the silver stitching. As if they were made for the dress. We don't have time for admiring shoes. Mrs. Gibbon suddenly said. Now listen to these instructions very carefully. The coachman has returned from taking the Countess and her girls, and he will take you to Bridgerton House, but he has to be waiting outside when they wish to depart, which means you must leave by midnight and not a second later. Do you understand? Sophie nodded and looked at the clock on the wall. It was a bit after nine, which meant she'd have more than two hours at the masquerade. Thank you, she whispered. Oh, thank you so much. Mrs. Gibbons dabbed her eyes with a handkerchief. You just have a good time, dearling. That's all the thanks I need. Sophie looked again at the clock. Two hours. Two hours that she'd have to make last a lifetime. Chapter Two the Bridgertons are truly a unique family. Surely there cannot be anyone in London who does not know that they all look remarkably alike, or that they are famously named in alphabetical order. Antony, Benedict, Colin, Daphne, Eloise, Francesca, Gregory, and Hyacinth. It does make one wonder what the late Viscount and, still very much alive, Dowager Viscountess would have named their next child had their offspring numbered nine. Imogen? Inigo? Perhaps it is best they stopped at eight. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 2nd of June, 1815 Benedict Bridgerton was the second of eight children but sometimes it felt more like a hundred.
This ball his mother had insisted upon hosting was supposed to be a masquerade, and Benedict had dutifully donned a black demi-mask. But everyone knew who he was. Or rather, they all almost knew. A Bridgerton! they would exclaim, clapping their hands together with glee. You must be a Bridgerton! A Bridgerton! I can spot a Bridgerton anywhere! Benedict was a Bridgerton, and while there was no family to which he'd rather belong, he sometimes wished he were considered a little less a Bridgerton and a little more himself. Just then, a woman of somewhat indeterminate age, dressed as a shepherdess, sauntered over. A Bridgerton, she trilled. I'd recognise that chestnut hair anywhere. Which are you? No, don't say. Let me guess. You're not the Viscount, because I just saw him. You must be number two. Or number three. Benedict eyed her coolly. Which one? Number two? Or number three? Two, he bit off. She clapped her hands together. That's what I thought. Oh, I must find Portia. I told her you were number two. Benedict, he nearly growled. But she said, no, he's the younger one, but I... Benedict suddenly had to get away. It was either that or kill the twittering ninny hammer. And with so many witnesses, he didn't think he could get away with it. If you'll excuse me, he said smoothly, I see someone with whom I must speak. It was a lie, but he didn't much care. With a curt nod toward the overage shepherdess, he made a beeline toward the ballroom's side door, eager to escape the throng and sneak into his brother's study, where he might find some blessed peace and quiet and perhaps a glass of fine brandy. Benedict! Damn! He'd nearly made a clean escape. He looked up to see his mother hurrying toward him. She was dressed in some sort of Elizabethan costume. He supposed she was meant to be a character in one of Shakespeare's plays, but for the life of him he had no idea which. "'What can I do for you, mother?' he asked. "'And don't say, dance with Hermione Smythesmith. "'Last time I did that, I nearly lost three toes in the process.' I wasn't going to ask anything of the sort, Violet replied. I was going to ask you to dance with Prudence Featherington. Have mercy, mother, he moaned. She's even worse. I'm not asking you to marry the chit, she said. Just dance with her. Benedict fought a groan. Prudence Featherington, while essentially a nice person, had a brain the size of a pea and a laugh so grating he'd seen grown men flee with their hands over their ears. "'I'll tell you what,' he wheedled. "'I'll dance with Penelope Featherington if you keep prudence at bay.' "'That'll do,' his mother said with a satisfied nod, leaving Benedict with a sinking sensation that she'd wanted him to dance with Penelope all along. "'She's over there by the lemonade table,' Violet said, "'dressed as a leprechaun, poor thing.' The colour is good for her, but someone really must take her mother in hand next time they venture out to the dressmaker. A more unfortunate costume I can't imagine. You obviously haven't seen the mermaid, Benedict murmured. She swatted him lightly on the arm. No poking fun at the guests. But they make it so easy. She shot him a look of warning before saying, I'm off to find your sister. Which one? One of the ones who isn't married, Violet said pertly. Viscount Guelph might be interested in that Scottish girl, but they aren't betrothed yet. Benedict silently wished Guelph luck. The poor bloke was going to need it. And thank you for dancing with Penelope, Violet said pointedly. He gave her a rather ironic half-smile. They both knew that her words were meant as a reminder, not as thanks. His arms crossed in a somewhat forbidding stance. He watched his mother depart, before drawing a long breath and turning to make his way to the lemonade table. He adored his mother to distraction, but she did tend to err on the side of meddlesome when it came to the social lives of her children.' 
And if there was one thing that bothered her even more than Benedict's unmarried state, it was the sight of a young girl's glum face when no one asked her to dance. As a result, Benedict spent a lot of time on the ballroom floor, sometimes with girls she wanted him to marry, but more often with the overlooked wallflowers. Of the two, he rather thought he preferred the wallflowers. The popular girls tended to be shallow, and, to be frank, just a little bit dull. His mother had always had a particular soft spot for Penelope Featherington, who was on her... Benedict frowned. On her third season? It must be her third. And with no marriage prospects in sight. Ah, oh, well, he might as well do his duty. Penelope was a nice enough girl, with a decent wit and personality. Some day she'd find herself a husband. It wouldn't be him, of course, and in all honesty it probably wouldn't be anyone he even knew. But surely she'd find someone. With a sigh, Benedict started to make his way toward the lemonade table. He could practically taste that brandy, smooth and mellow in his mouth, but he supposed that a glass of lemonade would tide him over for a few minutes. "'Miss Featherington!' he called out, trying not to shudder when three Miss Featheringtons turned around. With what he knew could not possibly be anything but the weakest of smiles, he added, "'Er, uh, Penelope, that is.' From about ten feet away, Penelope beamed at him, and Benedict was reminded that he actually liked Penelope Featherington. Truly, she wouldn't be considered so antidotal if she weren't always lumped together with her unfortunate sisters, who could easily make a grown man wish himself aboard a ship to Australia. He'd nearly closed the gap between them when he heard a low rumble of whispers rippling across the ballroom behind him. He knew he ought to keep going and get this duty dance over with. But God help him, his curiosity got the best of him, and he turned around and found himself facing what had to be the most breathtaking woman he'd ever seen. He couldn't even tell if she was beautiful. Her hair was a rather ordinary dark blonde, and with her mask tied securely around her head, he couldn't even see half of her face. But there was something about her that held him mesmerized. It was her smile, the shape of her eyes, the way she held herself and looked about the ballroom as if she'd never seen a more glorious sight than the silly members of the ton all dressed up in ridiculous costumes. Her beauty came from within. She shimmered. She glowed. She was utterly radiant. And Benedict suddenly realized that it was because she looked so damned happy. Happy to be where she was. Happy to be who she was happy in a way Benedict could barely remember. His was a good life, it was true, maybe even a great life. He had seven wonderful siblings, a loving mother, and scores of friends. But this woman, this woman knew joy, and Benedict had to know her. Penelope forgotten, he pushed his way through the crowd until he was but a few steps from her side. Three other gentlemen had beaten him to his destination and were presently showering her with flattery and praise. Benedict watched her with interest. She did not react as any woman of his acquaintance might. She did not act coy, nor did she act as if she expected their compliments as her due. Nor was she shy or tittering or arch or ironic or any of those things one might expect from a woman. She just smiled, beamed, actually. Benedict supposed that compliments were meant to bring a measure of happiness to the receiver, but never had he seen a woman react with such pure, unadulterated joy. He stepped forward. He wanted that joy for himself. Excuse me, gentlemen, but the lady has already promised this dance to me, he lied. Her mask's eye holes were cut a bit large, and he could see that her eyes widened considerably, then crinkled with amusement. He held out his hand to her, silently daring her to call his bluff. But she just smiled at him, a wide, radiant grin that pierced his skin and travelled straight to his soul. 
she put her hand in his, and it was only then that Benedict realised he'd been holding his breath. "'Have you permission to dance the waltz?' he murmured, once they reached the dance floor. She shook her head. "'I do not dance. You jest. I'm afraid I do not. The truth is,' she leaned forward and, with a glimmer of a smile, said, "'I don't know how.' He looked at her with surprise. She moved with an inborn grace, and furthermore, what gently bred lady could reach her age without learning how to dance? There is only one thing to do, then, he murmured. I shall teach you. Her eyes widened, then her lips parted, and a surprised laugh burst forth. What, he asked, trying to sound serious, is so funny? She grinned at him, the sort of grin one expects from an old school chum, not a debutante at a ball. Still smiling, she said, Even I know that one does not conduct dancing lessons at a ball. What does that mean, I wonder, he murmured. Even you. She said nothing. I shall have to take the upper hand, then, he said, and force you to do my bidding. Force me? but she was smiling as she said it, so he knew she took no offence, and he said, It would be ungentlemanly of me to allow this sorrowful state of affairs to continue. Sorrowful, you say? He shrugged. A beautiful lady who cannot dance. It seems a crime against nature. If I allow you to teach me... When you allow me to teach you... If I allow you to teach me, where shall you conduct the lesson? Benedict lifted his chin and scanned the room. It wasn't difficult to see over the heads of most of the party-goers. At an inch above six feet, he was one of the tallest men in the room. "'We shall have to retire to the terrace,' he said finally. "'The terrace?' she echoed. "'Won't it be terribly crowded? It's a warm night, after all.' He leaned forward. "'Not the private terrace.' The private terrace, you say? she asked, amusement in her voice. And how, pray tell, would you know of a private terrace? Benedict stared at her in shock. Could she possibly not know who he was? It wasn't that he held such a high opinion of himself that he expected all of London to be aware of his identity. It was just that he was a Bridgerton, and if a person met one Bridgerton, that generally meant he could recognise another. And as there was no one in London who had not crossed paths with one Bridgerton or another, Benedict was generally recognised everywhere. Even, he thought ruefully, when that recognition was simply as number two. You did not answer my question, his mystery lady reminded him. About the private terrace. Benedict raised her hand to his lips and kissed the fine silk of her glove. Let us just say that I have my ways. She appeared undecided, and so he tugged at her fingers, pulling her closer, only by an inch, but somehow it seemed she was only a kiss away. Come, he said, dance with me. She took a step forward, and he knew his life had been changed forever. Sophie hadn't seen him when she'd first walked into the room, but she'd felt magic in the air, and when he'd appeared before her, like some charming prince from a children's tale, she somehow knew that he was the reason she'd stolen into the ball. He was tall, and what she could see of his face was very handsome, with lips that hinted of irony and smiles, and skin that was just barely touched by the beginnings of a beard. His hair was a dark, rich brown, and the flickering candlelight lent it a faint reddish cast. People seemed to know who he was as well. Sophie noticed that when he moved, the other party-goers stepped out of his path, and when he'd lied so brazenly and claimed her for a dance, the other men had deferred and stepped away. He was handsome and he was strong, and for this one night he was hers. When the clock struck midnight, she'd be back to her life of drudgery,
of mending and washing and attending to Araminta's every wish. Was she so wrong to want this one heady night of magic and love? She felt like a princess, a reckless princess, and so when he asked her to dance, she put her hand in his. And even though she knew that this entire evening was a lie, that she was a nobleman's bastard and a countess's maid, that her dress was borrowed and her shoes practically stolen, none of that seemed to matter as their fingers twined. For a few hours at least, Sophie could pretend that this gentleman could be her gentleman, and that from this moment on her life would be changed forever. It was nothing but a dream, but it had been so terribly long since she'd let herself dream. Banishing all caution, she allowed him to lead her out of the ballroom. He walked quickly, even as he wove through the pulsing crowd, and she found herself laughing as she tripped along after him. "'Why is it?' he said, halting for a moment when they reached the hall outside the ballroom, "'that you always seem to be laughing at me.' She laughed again. She couldn't help it. "'I'm happy,' she said with a helpless shrug. "'I'm just so happy to be here.' "'And why is that?' A ball such as this must be routine for one such as yourself. Sophie grinned. If he thought she was a member of the Ton, an alumna of dozens of balls and parties, then she must be playing her role to perfection. He touched the corner of her mouth. You keep smiling, he murmured. I like to smile. His hand found her waist, and he pulled her toward him. The distance between their bodies remained respectable, but the increasing nearness robbed her of breath. "'I like to watch you smile,' he said. His words were low and seductive, but there was something oddly hoarse about his voice, and Sophie could almost let herself believe that he really meant it, that she wasn't merely that evening's conquest. But before she could respond, an accusing voice from down the hall suddenly called out, there you are! Sophie's stomach lurched well into her throat. She'd been found out. She'd be thrown into the street, and tomorrow probably into jail for stealing Araminta's shoes, and... And the man who'd called out had reached her side, and was saying to her mysterious gentleman, Mother has been looking all over for you. You weaseled out of your dance with Penelope, and I had to take your place. So sorry her gentleman murmured. That didn't seem to be enough of an apology for the newcomer, because he scowled mightily as he said, If you flee the party and leave me to that pack of she-devil debutantes, I swear I shall exact revenge to my dying day. A chance I'm willing to take, her gentleman said. Well, I covered up for you with Penelope, the other man grumbled. You're just lucky that I happen to be standing by. The poor girl's heart looked broken when you turned away. Sophie's gentleman had the grace to blush. Some things are unavoidable, I'm afraid. Sophie looked from one man to the other. Even under their demi-masks, it was more than obvious that they were brothers. And she realised in a blinding flash that they must be the Bridgerton brothers. And this must be their house. And, oh, good Lord! Had she made a total and utter fool of herself by asking him how he knew of a private terrace? But which brother was he? Benedict. He had to be Benedict. Sophie sent a silent thank you to Lady Whistledown, who'd once written a column completely devoted to the task of telling the Bridgerton siblings apart. Benedict, she recalled, had been singled out as the tallest. The man who made her heart flip in triple time stood a good inch above his brother, who, Sophie suddenly realised, was looking at her quite intently. "'I see why you departed,' Colin said, for he must be Colin. He certainly wasn't Gregory, who was only fourteen, and Antony was married, so he wouldn't care if Benedict fled the party and left him to fend off the debutantes by himself.' He looked at Benedict with a sly expression. "'Might I request an introduction?' Benedict raised a brow. "'You can try your best, but I doubt you'll meet with success. 
I haven't learned her name yet myself. You haven't asked, Sophie could not help pointing out. And would you tell me if I did? I'd tell you something, she returned. But not the truth. She shook her head. This isn't a night for truth. My favourite kind of night, Colin said in a jaunty voice. Don't you have somewhere to be? Benedict asked. Colin shook his head. I'm sure Mother would prefer that I be in the ballroom, but it's not exactly a requirement. I require it, Benedict returned. Sophie felt a giggle bubbling in her throat. Very well, Colin sighed. I shall take myself off. Excellent, Benedict said. All alone to face the ravenous wolves. Wolves? Sophie queried. Eligible young ladies, Colin clarified. A pack of ravenous wolves, the lot of them. Present company excluded, of course. Sophie thought it best not to point out that she was not an eligible young lady at all. My mother, Colin began. Benedict groaned. Would like nothing better than to see my dear elder brother married off. He paused and pondered his words. Except, perhaps, to see me married off. If only to get you out of the house, Benedict said dryly. This time, Sophie did giggle. But then again, he's considerably more ancient, Colin continued. So perhaps we should send him to the gallows, er, uh, altar, first. Do you have a point? Benedict growled. None whatsoever, Colin admitted. But then again... I really do. Benedict turned to Sophie. He speaks the truth. So then, Colin said to Sophie, with a grand flourish of his arm, will you take pity on my poor, long-suffering mother and chase my dear brother up the aisle? Well, he hasn't asked, Sophie said, trying to join the humour of the moment. How much have you had to drink? Benedict grumbled. Me? Sophie queried. Him. Nothing at all, Colin said jovially. But I'm thinking quite seriously of remedying that. In fact, it might be the only thing that will make this eve bearable. If the procurement of drink removes you from my presence, Benedict said, then it will certainly be the only thing that will make my night bearable as well. Colin grinned, gave a jaunty salute, and was gone. It's nice to see two siblings who love each other so well, Sophie murmured. Benedict, who had been staring somewhat menacingly at the doorway through which his brother had just disappeared, snapped his attention back to her. You call that love? Sophie thought of Rosamond and Posy, who were forever sniping at each other, and not in jest. I do, she said firmly. It's obvious you would lay your life down for him, and vice versa. I suppose you're right. Benedict let out a beleaguered sigh, then ruined the effect by smiling, much as it pains me to admit it. He leaned against the wall, crossing his arms and looking terribly sophisticated and urbane. So tell me, he said, have you any siblings? Sophie pondered that question for a moment then gave a decisive no. One of his brows rose into a curiously arrogant arch. He cocked his head very slightly to the side as he said, I find myself rather curious as to why it took you so long to determine the answer to that question. One would think the answer would be an easy one to reach. Sophie looked away for a moment, not wanting him to see the pain that she knew must show in her eyes. She had always wanted a family. In fact, there was nothing in life she had ever wanted more. Her father had never recognised her as his daughter, even in private, and her mother had died at her birth. Araminta treated her like the plague, and Rosamond and Posy had certainly never been sisters to her. Posy had occasionally been a friend, but even she spent most of the day asking Sophie to mend her dress or style her hair, or polish her shoes. And in all truth, even though Posy asked, rather than ordered, as her sister and mother did, 
Sophie didn't exactly have the option of saying no. I am an only child, Sophie finally said. And that is all you're going to say on the subject, Benedict murmured. And that is all I'm going to say on the subject, she agreed. Very well. He smiled, a lazy, masculine sort of smile. What, then, am I permitted to ask you? Nothing, really. Nothing at all? I suppose I might be induced to tell you that my favourite colour is green, but beyond that I shall leave you with no clues to my identity. Why so many secrets? If I answered that, Sophie said with an enigmatic smile, truly warming to her role as a mysterious stranger, then that would be the end of my secrets, wouldn't it? He leaned forward ever so slightly. You could always develop new secrets. Sophie backed up a step. His gaze had grown hot, and she had heard enough talk in the servants' quarters to know what that meant. Thrilling as that was, she was not quite as daring as she pretended to be. This entire night, she said, is secret enough. Then ask me a question, he said. I have no secrets. Her eyes widened. None? Truly? Doesn't everyone have secrets? Not I. My life is hopelessly banal. That I find difficult to believe. It's true, he said with a shrug. I've never seduced an innocent, or even a married lady. I have no gambling debts, and my parents were completely faithful to one another. Meaning he wasn't a bastard. Somehow the thought brought an ache to Sophie's throat. Not, of course, because he was legitimate, but rather because she knew he would never pursue her, at least not in an honourable fashion, if he knew that she wasn't. You haven't asked me a question, he reminded her. Sophie blinked in surprise. She hadn't thought he'd been serious. All right, she half stammered, caught off guard. What, then, is your favourite colour? He grinned. You're going to waste your question on that. I only get one question. More than fair, considering you're granting me none. Benedict leaned forward his dark eyes glinting. And the answer is blue. Why? Why? he echoed. Yes, why? Is it because of the ocean? Or the sky? Or perhaps just because you like it? Benedict eyed her curiously. It seemed such an odd question. Why his favourite colour was blue? Everyone else would have taken blue for an answer and left it at that, but this woman, whose name he still didn't even know, went deeper, beyond the what's and into the why's. Are you a painter? he queried. She shook her head. Just curious. Why is your favourite colour green? She sighed, and her eyes grew nostalgic. The grass, I suppose, and maybe the leaves, but mostly the grass— the way it feels when one runs barefoot in the summer. The smell of it after the gardeners have gone through with their scythes and trimmed it even. What does the feel and smell of grass have to do with the colour? Nothing, I suppose. And maybe everything. I used to live in the country, you see. She caught herself. She hadn't meant to tell him even that much. But there didn't seem to be harm in his knowing such an innocent fact— and you were happier there? he asked quietly. She nodded, a faint rush of awareness shivering across her skin. Lady Whistledown must never have had a conversation with Benedict Bridgerton beyond the superficial, because she'd never written that he was quite the most perceptive man in London. When he looked into her eyes, Sophie had the oddest sense that he could see straight into her soul. You must enjoy walking in the park, then he said. Yes, Sophie lied. She never had time to go to the park. Araminta didn't even give her a day off like the other servants received. We shall have to take a stroll together, Benedict said. Sophie avoided a reply by reminding him 
You never did tell me why your favourite colour is blue. His head cocked slightly to the side, and his eyes narrowed just enough so that Sophie knew that he had noticed her evasion. But he simply said, I don't know. Perhaps, like you, I'm reminded of something I miss. There is a lake at Aubrey Hall. That is where I grew up in Kent. But the water always seemed more grey than blue. It probably reflects the sky, Sophie commented. Which is, more often than not, more grey than blue, Benedict said with a laugh. Perhaps that is what I miss. Blue skies and sunshine. If it weren't raining, Sophie said with a smile, this wouldn't be England. I went to Italy once, Benedict said. The sun shone constantly. It sounds like heaven. You'd think, he said, but I found myself missing the rain. I can't believe it, she said with a laugh. I feel like I spent half my life staring out the window and grumbling at the rain. If it were gone, you'd miss it. Sophie grew pensive. Were there things in her life she'd miss if they were gone? She wouldn't miss Araminta, that was for certain, and she wouldn't miss Rosamond. She'd probably miss Posy, and she'd definitely miss the way the sun shone through the window in her attic room in the mornings. She'd miss the way the servants laughed and joked, and occasionally included her in their fun, even though they all knew she was the late Earl's bastard. But she wasn't going to miss these things. She wouldn't even have the opportunity to miss them, because she wasn't going anywhere. After this evening, this one amazing, wonderful, magical evening, it would be back to life as usual. She supposed that if she was stronger, braver, she'd have left Penwood House years ago. But would that have really made much difference? She might not like living with Araminta, but she wasn't likely to improve her lot in life by leaving. She might have liked to have been a governess, and she was certainly well qualified for the position. But jobs were scarce for those without references, and Araminta certainly wasn't going to give her one. You're very quiet, Benedict said softly. I was just thinking. About? About what I'd miss, and what I wouldn't miss, should my life drastically change. His eyes grew intense. And do you expect it to drastically change? She shook her head and tried to keep the sadness out of her voice when she answered, No. His voice grew so quiet it was almost a whisper. Do you want it to change? Yes, she sighed before she could stop herself. Oh, yes. He took her hands and brought them to his lips gently kissing each one in turn. Then we shall begin right now, he vowed, and tomorrow you shall be transformed. Tonight I am transformed, she whispered. Tomorrow I shall disappear. Benedict drew her close and dropped the softest, most fleeting of kisses onto her brow. Then we must pack a lifetime into this very night. Chapter 3 This author waits with bated breath to see what costumes the ton will choose for the Bridgerton masquerade. It is rumoured that Eloise Bridgerton plans to dress as Joan of Arc, and Penelope Featherington, out for her third season and recently returned from a visit with Irish cousins, will don the costume of a leprechaun. Miss Posy Ryling, stepdaughter to the late Earl of Penwood, plans a costume of mermaid, which this author personally cannot wait to behold. But her elder sister, Miss Rosamond Ryling, has been very close-lipped about her own attire. As for the men, if previous masquerade balls are any indication, the portly will dress as Henry the Eighth, the more fit as Alexander the Great, or perhaps the Devil, and the bored... The eligible Bridgerton brothers sure to be among these ranks, as themselves. Basic black evening kit, with only a demi-mask as a nod to the occasion. <laughs>
Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 5th of June, 1815. Dance with me, Sophie said impulsively. His smile was amused, but his fingers twined tightly with hers as he murmured, I thought you didn't know how. You said you would teach me. He stared at her for a long moment, his eyes boring into hers. Then he tugged on her hand and said, Come with me. Pulling her along behind him, they slipped down a hallway, climbed a flight of stairs, and then rounded a corner, emerging in front of a pair of French doors. Benedict jiggled the wrought iron handles and swung the doors open, revealing a small private terrace, adorned with potted plants and two chaises long. Where are we? Sophie asked, looking around. Right above the ballroom terrace. He shut the doors behind them. Can't you hear the music? Mostly, what Sophie could hear was the low rumble of endless conversation. But if she strained her ears, she could hear the faint lilt of the orchestra. Handel, she said with a delighted smile. My governess had a music box with this very tune. You loved your governess very much, he said quietly. Her eyes had been closed as she hummed along with the music, but when she heard his words, she opened them in a startled fashion. How did you know? The same way I knew you were happier in the country. Benedict reached out and touched her cheek, one gloved finger trailing slowly along her skin until it reached the line of her jaw. I can see it in your face. She held silent for a few moments, then pulled away, saying, Yes, well, I spent more time with her than with anyone else in the household. It sounds a lonely upbringing, he said quietly. Sometimes it was. She walked over to the edge of the balcony and rested her hands on the balustrade as she stared out into the inky night. Sometimes it wasn't. Then she turned around quite suddenly, her smile bright, and Benedict knew that she would not reveal anything more about her childhood. Your upbringing must have been the complete opposite of lonely, she said, with so many brothers and sisters about. You know who I am, he stated. She nodded. I didn't at first. He walked over to the balustrade and leaned one hip against it, crossing his arms. What gave me away? It was your brother, actually. You looked so alike. Even with our masks? Even with your masks, she said, with an indulgent smile. Lady Whistledown writes about you quite often, and she never passes up an opportunity to comment upon how alike you look. And do you know which brother I am? Benedict, she replied. If indeed Lady Whistledown is correct when she says that you are tallest among your brothers. You're quite the detective. She looked slightly embarrassed. I merely read a gossip sheet. It makes me no different from the rest of the people here. Benedict watched her for a moment, wondering if she realised that she'd revealed another clue to the puzzle of her identity. If she'd recognised him only from Whistledown, then she'd not been out in society for long. Or perhaps not at all. Either way, she was not one of the many young ladies to whom his mother had introduced him. What else do you know about me from Whistledown? He asked, his smile slow and lazy. Are you fishing for compliments? She asked, returning the half-smile with the vaguest tilt of her lips. For you must know that the Bridgertons are almost always spared her rapier quill. Lady Whistledown is nearly always complimentary when writing about your family. It's led to quite a bit of speculation about her identity, he admitted. Some think she must be a Bridgerton. Is she? He shrugged. Not that I'm aware of. And you didn't answer my question. Which question was that? What you know of me from Whistledown. She looked surprised. Are you truly interested? If I cannot know anything about you, at least I might know what you know about me. She smiled and touched the tip of her index finger to her lower lip in an endearingly absent-minded gesture. Well, let's see.
Last month you won some silly horse race in Hyde Park. It wasn't the least bit silly, he said with a grin. And I'm a hundred quid richer for it. She shot him an arch look. Horse races are almost always silly. Spoken just like a woman, he muttered. Well, don't point out the obvious, he interrupted. That made her smile. What else do you know? he asked. From Whistledown, she tapped her finger against her cheek. You once lopped the head off your sister's doll. And I'm still trying to figure out how she knew about that, Benedict muttered. Maybe Lady Whistledown is a Bridgerton after all. Impossible. Not, he added rather forcefully, that we're not smart enough to pull it off. Rather, the rest of the family would be too smart not to figure it out. She laughed out loud at that, and Benedict studied her, wondering if she was aware that she'd given away yet another tiny clue to her identity. Lady Whistledown had written of the doll's unfortunate encounter with a guillotine two years earlier, in one of her very earliest columns. Many people now had the gossip sheet delivered all the way out in the country, but in the beginning Whistledown had been strictly for Londoners, which meant that his mystery lady had been in London two years ago, and yet she hadn't known who he was until she'd met Colin. She'd been in London, but she'd not been out in society. Perhaps she was the youngest in her family, and had been reading Whistledown while her older sisters enjoyed their seasons. It wasn't enough to figure out who she was, but it was a start. What else do you know? he asked, eager to see if she'd inadvertently reveal anything else. She chuckled, clearly enjoying herself. Your name has not been seriously linked with any young lady, and your mother despairs of ever seeing you married. The pressure has lessened a bit now that my brother's gone and got himself a wife. The Viscount, Benedict nodded. Lady Whistledown wrote about that as well. In great detail. Although, he leaned toward her and lowered his voice. She didn't get all the facts. Really? she asked with great interest. What did she leave out? He tisked, tisked, and shook his head at her. I'm not about to reveal the secrets of my brother's courtship, if you won't reveal even your name. She snorted at that. Courtship might be too strong a word. Why, Lady Whistledown wrote... Lady Whistledown, he interrupted, with a vaguely mocking half-smile, is not privy to all that goes on in London. She certainly seems privy to most. Do you think? he mused. I tend to disagree. For example, I suspect that if Lady Whistledown were here on the terrace, she would not know your identity. Her eyes widened under her mask. Benedict took some satisfaction in that. He crossed his arms. Is that true? She nodded. But I am so well disguised that no one would recognize me right now. He raised a brow. What if you removed your mask? Would she recognize you then? She pushed herself away from the railing and took a few steps toward the center of the terrace. I'm not going to answer that. He followed her. I didn't think you would, but I wanted to ask nonetheless. Sophie turned around, then caught her breath as she realized he was mere inches away. She'd heard him following her but she hadn't thought he was quite that close. She parted her lips to speak, but to her great surprise, she hadn't a thing to say. All she could seem to do was stare up at him, at those dark, dark eyes peering at her from behind his mask. Speech was impossible. Even breathing was difficult. You still haven't danced with me, he said. She didn't move, just stood there, as his large hand came to rest at the small of her back. Her skin tingled where he touched her, and the air grew thick and hot. This was desire, Sophie realized. This was what she'd heard the maids whispering about. This was what no gently-bred lady was even supposed to know about. But she was no gently-bred lady, she thought defiantly. She was a bastard.' 
a nobleman's by-blow. She was not a member of the ton and never would be. Did she really have to abide by their rules? She'd always sworn that she would never become a man's mistress, that she'd never bring a child into this world to suffer her fate as a bastard, but she wasn't planning anything quite so brazen. This was one dance, one evening, perhaps one kiss. It was enough to ruin a reputation, but what sort of reputation did she have to begin with? She was outside society, beyond the pale, and she wanted one night of fantasy. She looked up. You're not going to run, then, he murmured, his dark eyes flaring with something hot and exciting. She shook her head, realising that once again he'd known what she was thinking. It should have scared her that he so effortlessly read her thoughts, but in the dark seduction of the night, with the wind tugging at the loose strands of her hair and the music floating up from below, it was somehow thrilling instead. Where do I put my hand? she asked. I want to dance. Right here on my shoulder, he instructed. No, just a touch lower. There you are. You must think me the veriest ninny, she said, not knowing how to dance. I think you're very brave, actually, for admitting it. His free hand found hers and slowly lifted it into the air. Most women of my acquaintance would have feigned an injury or disinterest. She looked up into his eyes, even though she knew it would leave her breathless. I haven't the acting skills to feign disinterest, she admitted. The hand at the small of her back tightened. Listen to the music, he instructed, his voice oddly hoarse. Do you feel it rising and falling? She shook her head. Listen harder, he whispered, his lips drawing closer to her ear. One, two, three. One, two, three. Sophie closed her eyes and somehow filtered out the endless chatter of the guests below them, until all she heard was the soft swell of the music. Her breathing slowed, and she found herself swaying in time with the orchestra, her head rocking back and forth with Benedict's softly uttered numerical instructions. One, two, three. One, two, three. I feel it, she whispered. He smiled. She wasn't sure how she knew that. Her eyes were still closed. But she felt the smile heard it in the tenor of his breath. Good, he said. Now watch my feet, and allow me to lead you. Sophie opened her eyes and looked down. One, two, three. One, two, three. Hesitantly, she stepped along with him, right onto his foot. Oh, I'm sorry, she blurted out. My sisters have done far worse, he assured her. Don't give up. She tried again, and suddenly her feet knew what to do. <gasps> she breathed in surprise. This is wonderful. Look up, he ordered gently. But I'll stumble. You won't, he promised. I won't let you. Look into my eyes. Sophie did as he asked, and the moment her eyes touched his, something inside her seemed to lock into place, and she could not look away. He twirled her in circles and spirals around the terrace, slowly at first, then picking up speed, until she was breathless and giddy, and all the while her eyes remained locked on his. What do you feel? he asked. Everything, she said, laughing. What do you hear? The music. Her eyes widened with excitement. I hear the music as I've never heard it before. His hands tightened, and the space between them diminished by several inches. What do you see? he asked. Sophie stumbled, but she never took her eyes off his. My soul, she whispered. I see my very soul. He stopped dancing. What did you say? he whispered. She held silent. The moment seemed too charged, too meaningful and she was afraid she'd spoil it. No, that wasn't true. 
she was afraid she'd make it even better, and that would make it hurt all the more when she returned to reality at midnight. How on earth was she going to go back to polishing Araminta's shoes after this? I know what you said, Benedict said hoarsely. I heard you and... Don't say anything, Sophie cut in. She didn't want him to tell her that he felt the same way, didn't want to hear anything that would leave her pining for this man forever. But it was probably already too late for that. He stared at her for an agonizingly long moment, then murmured, I won't speak. I won't say a word. And then, before she even had a second to breathe, his lips were on hers, exquisitely gentle and achingly tender. With deliberate slowness, he brushed his lips back and forth across hers, the bare hint of friction sending shivers and tingles spiralling through her body. He touched her lips, and she felt it in her toes. It was a singularly odd and singularly wonderful sensation. Then his hand at the small of her back, the one that had guided her so effortlessly in their waltz, started to pull her toward him. The pressure was slow but inexorable, and Sophie grew hot as their bodies grew closer, then positively burned when she suddenly felt the length of him pressing against her. He seemed very large and very powerful, and in his arms she felt like she must be the most beautiful woman in the world. Suddenly anything seemed possible, maybe even a life free of servitude and stigma. His mouth grew more insistent, and his tongue darted out to tickle the corner of her mouth. His hand, which had still been holding hers in a waltz pose, slid down the length of her arm and then up her back until it rested at the nape of her neck, his fingers tugging her hair loose from its coiffure. Your hair is like silk, he whispered, and Sophie actually giggled because he was wearing gloves. He pulled away. What? he asked with an amused expression. Are you laughing about? How can you know what my hair feels like? You're wearing gloves. He smiled a crooked, boyish sort of a smile that sent her stomach into flips and melted her heart. I don't know how I know, he said, but I do. His grin grew even more lopsided, and then he added, but just to be sure, perhaps I'd better test with my bare skin. He held out his hand before her. Will you do the honours? Sophie stared at his hand for a few seconds, before she realized what he meant. With a shaky, nervous breath, she took a step back and brought both of her hands to his. Slowly, she pinched the end of each of the glove's fingertips and gave it a little tug, loosening the fine fabric until she could slide the entire glove from his hand. Glove still dangling from her fingers, she looked up. He had the oddest expression in his eyes, hunger and something else something almost spiritual. I want to touch you, he whispered, and then his bare hand cupped her cheek, the pads of his fingers lightly stroking her skin, whispering upward until they touched the hair near her ear. He tugged gently until he pulled one lock loose. Freed from the coiffure, her hair sprang into a light curl, and Sophie could not take her eyes off it, wrapped golden around his index finger. I was wrong, he murmured. It's softer than silk. Sophie was suddenly gripped by a fierce urge to touch him in the same way, and she held out her hand. It's my turn, she said softly. His eyes flared, and then he went to work on her glove, loosening it at the fingers the same way she had done. But then, rather than pulling it off, he brought his lips to the edge of the long glove, all the way above her elbow, and kissed the sensitive skin on the inside of her arm. Also softer than silk, he murmured. Sophie used her free hand to grip his shoulder, no longer confident of her ability to stand. He tugged at the glove, allowing it to slide off her arm with agonizing slowness, his lips following its progress until they reached the inside of her elbow. Barely breaking the kiss, he looked up and said, you don't mind if I stay here for a bit? 
helplessly, Sophie shook her head. His tongue darted out and traced the bend of her arm. Oh, my, she moaned. I thought you might like that, he said, his words hot against her skin. She nodded. Or rather, she meant to nod. She wasn't sure if she actually did. His lips continued their trail, sliding sensuously down her forearm until they reached the inside of her wrist. They remained there for a moment before finally coming to rest in the absolute center of her palm. Who are you? he asked, lifting his head, but not letting go of her hand. She shook her head. I have to know. I can't say. And then, when she saw that he would not take no for an answer, she lied and added, Yet. He took one of her fingers and rubbed it gently against his lips. I want to see you tomorrow, he said softly. I want to call on you and see where you live. She said nothing, just held herself steady, trying not to cry. I want to meet your parents and pet your damned dog, he continued, somewhat unsteadily. Do you understand what I mean? Music and conversation still drifted up from below, but the only sound on the terrace was the harsh rasp of their breath. I want... His voice dropped to a whisper, and his eyes looked vaguely surprised, as if he couldn't quite believe the truth of his own words. I want your future. I want every little piece of you. Don't say anything more, she begged him. Please, not another word. Then tell me your name. Tell me how to find you tomorrow. I... But then she heard a strange sound, exotic and ringing. What is that? A gong, he replied, to signal the unmasking. Panic rose within her. What? It must be midnight. Midnight? She gasped. He nodded. Time to remove your mask. One of Sophie's hands flew up to her temple, pressing the mask harshly against her skin, as if she could somehow glue it onto her face through sheer force of will. Are you all right? Benedict asked. I have to go, she blurted out, and then, with no further warning, she hitched up her skirts and ran from the terrace. Wait! She heard him call out, felt the rush of air as his arm swiped forward in a futile attempt to grab her dress. But Sophie was fast, and perhaps more importantly, she was in a state of utter panic, and she tore down the stairs as if the fires of hell were nipping at her heels. She plunged into the ballroom, knowing that Benedict would prove a determined pursuer, and she'd have the best chance of losing him in a large crowd. All she had to do was make it across the room, and then she could exit via the side door and scoot around the outside of the house to her waiting carriage. The revellers were still removing their masks, and the party was loud with raucous laughter. Sophie pushed and jostled, anything to beat her way to the other side of the room. She threw one desperate glance over her shoulder. Benedict had entered the ballroom, his face intense as he scanned the crowd. He didn't seem to have seen her yet, but she knew that he would. Her silver gown would make her an easy target. Sophie kept shoving people out of her way. At least half of them didn't seem to notice. Probably too drunk. Excuse me, she muttered, elbowing Julius Caesar in the ribs. Beg pardon, came out more like a grunt. That was when Cleopatra stepped on her toe. Excuse me, I... And then the breath was quite literally sucked out of her, because she found herself face to face with Araminta, or rather face to mask. Sophie was still disguised, but if anyone could recognize her, it would be Araminta. And, watch where you're going, Araminta said haughtily. Then, while Sophie stood open-mouthed, she swished her Queen Elizabeth skirts and swept away. Araminta hadn't recognized her. If Sophie hadn't been so frantic about getting out of Bridgerton House before Benedict caught up with her, she would have laughed with delight. Sophie glanced desperately behind her. Benedict had spotted her and was pushing his way through the crowd with considerably more efficiency than she had done. With an audible gulp and renewed energy, she pushed forth, almost knocking two Grecian goddesses to the ground before finally reaching the far door.
She looked behind her just long enough to see that Benedict had been waylaid by some elderly lady with a cane, then ran out of the building and around front, where the Penwood carriage was waiting, just as Mrs. Gibbons had said it would. Go, go, go! Sophie shouted frantically to the driver, and she was gone. Chapter 4 More than one masquerade at N.D. has reported to this author that Benedict Bridgerton was seen in the company of an unknown lady dressed in a silver gown. Dry as she might, this author has been completely unable to discern the mystery lady's identity. And if this author cannot uncover the truth, you may be assured that her identity is a well-kept secret indeed. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 7th of June, 1815 She was gone. Benedict stood on the pavement in front of Bridgerton House, surveying the street. All of Grosvenor Square was a mad crush of carriages. She could be in any one of them, just sitting there on the cobbles, trying to escape the traffic. Or she could be in one of the three carriages that had just escaped the tangle and rolled around the corner. Either way, she was gone. He was half ready to strangle Lady Danbury, who'd jammed her cane onto his toe and insisted upon giving him her opinion on most of the party-goers' costumes. By the time he'd managed to free himself, his mystery lady had disappeared through the ballroom's side door, and he knew that she had no intention of letting him see her again. Benedict let out a low and rather viciously uttered curse. With all the ladies his mother had trotted out before him, and there had been many, he'd never once felt the same soul-searing connection that had burned between him and the lady in silver. From the moment he'd seen her, no, from the moment before he'd seen her, when he'd only just felt her presence, the air had been alive, crackling with tension and excitement, and he'd been alive too, alive in a way he hadn't felt for years, as if everything was suddenly new and sparkling and full of passion and dreams. And yet, Benedict cursed again, this time with a touch of regret. And yet, he didn't even know the colour of her eyes. They definitely hadn't been brown. Of that much he was positive. But in the dim light of the candled night, he'd been unable to discern whether they were blue or green, or hazel or grey and for some reason he found this the most upsetting. It ate at him, leaving a burning, hungry sensation in the pit of his stomach. They said eyes were the windows to the soul. If he'd truly found the woman of his dreams, the one with whom he could finally imagine a family and a future, then by God he ought to know the colour of her eyes. It wasn't going to be easy to find her. It was never easy to find someone who didn't want to be found, and she'd made it more than clear that her identity was a secret. His clues were paltry at best. A few dropped comments concerning Lady Whistledown's column, and Benedict looked down at the single glove still clutched in his right hand. He'd quite forgotten that he'd been holding it as he'd dashed through the ballroom. He brought it to his face and inhaled its scent, but much to his surprise... It didn't smell of rose water and soap, as had his mystery lady. Rather, its scent was a bit musty, as if it had been packed away in an attic trunk for many years. Odd, that. Why would she be wearing an ancient glove? He turned it over in his hand, as if the motion would somehow bring her back, and that was when he noticed a tiny bit of stitching at the hem. S. L. G. Someone's initials. Were they hers? And a family crest, one he did not recognise. But his mother would. His mother always knew that sort of thing. And chances were, if she knew the crest, she'd know who the initials S.L.G. belonged to. Benedict felt his first glimmer of hope. He would find her. He would find her, and he would make her his. It was as simple as that. It took a mere half-hour to return Sophie to her regular, drab state. Gone were the dress, the glittering ear-bobs, and the fancy coiffure. The jewelled slippers were tucked neatly back in Araminta's closet, 
and the rouge the maid had used for her lips was resting in its place on Rosamond's dressing table. She'd even taken five minutes to massage the skin on her face to remove the indentations left by the mask. Sophie looked as she always looked before bed, plain, simple and unassuming, her hair pulled into a loose braid, her feet tucked into warm stockings to keep out the chill night air. She was back to looking what she was, in truth, nothing more than a housemaid. Gone were all traces of the fairy princess she'd been for one short evening. And saddest of all, gone was her fairy prince. Benedict Bridgerton had been everything she'd read in Whistledown. Handsome, strong, debonair. He was the stuff of a young girl's dreams. But not, she thought glumly, of her dreams. A man like that didn't marry an earl's by-blow, and he certainly didn't marry a housemaid. But for one night he'd been hers, and she supposed that would have to be enough. She picked up a little stuffed dog she'd had since she'd been a small girl. She'd kept it all these years as a reminder of happier times. It usually sat on her dresser, but for some reason she wanted it closer right now. She crawled into bed, the little dog tucked under her arm and curled up under the covers. Then she squeezed her eyes shut, biting her lip as silent tears trickled onto her pillow. It was a long, long night. Do you recognize this? Benedict Bridgerton was sitting next to his mother in her very feminine rose and cream drawing room, holding out his only link to the woman in silver. Violet Bridgerton took the glove and examined the crest. She needed only a second before she announced, Penwood, as in Earl of. Violet nodded. And the G would be for Gunningworth, the title recently passed out of their family, if I recall correctly. The Earl died without issue. Oh, it must have been six or seven years ago. The title went to a distant cousin. And she added with a disapproving nod of her head. You forgot to dance with Penelope Featherington last night. You're lucky your brother was there to dance in your stead. Benedict fought a groan and tried to ignore her scolding. Who, then, is SLG? Violet's blue eyes narrowed. Why are you interested? I don't suppose, Benedict said on a groan, that you will simply answer my question without posing one of your own. She let out a ladylike snort. You know me far better than that. Benedict just managed to stop himself from rolling his eyes. Who, Violet asked, does the glove belong to, Benedict? And then, when he didn't answer quickly enough for her taste, she added, You might as well tell me everything. You know I will figure it out on my own soon enough, and it will be far less embarrassing for you if I don't have to ask any questions. Benedict sighed. He was going to have to tell her everything, or at least almost everything. There was little he enjoyed less than sharing such details with his mother. She tended to grab hold of any hope that he might actually marry and cling on to it with the tenacity of a barnacle. But he had little choice. Not if he wanted to find her. I met someone last night at the masquerade, he finally said. Violet clapped her hands together with delight. Really? She's the reason I forgot to dance with Penelope. Violet looked nearly ready to die of rapture. Who? One of Penwood's daughters? She frowned. No, that's impossible. He had no daughters. But he did have two stepdaughters. She frowned again. Although I must say, having met those two girls, well... Well, what? Violet's brow wrinkled as she fumbled for polite words. Well, I simply wouldn't have guessed you'd be interested in either of them, that's all. But if you are, she added, her face brightening considerably, then I shall surely invite the Dowager Countess over for tea. It's the very least I can do. Benedict started to say something, then stopped when he saw that his mother was frowning yet again. What now? he asked. Oh, nothing, Violet said. Just that, well, spit it out, mother. She smiled weakly. 
just that I don't particularly like the Dowager Countess. I've always found her rather cold and ambitious. Some would say you're ambitious as well, Mother, Benedict pointed out. Violet pulled a face. Of course I have great ambition that my children marry well and happily, but I am not the sort who'd marry her daughter off to a seventy-year-old man just because he was a duke. Did the Dowager Countess do that? Benedict couldn't recall any seventy-year-old dukes making recent trips to the altar. No, Violet admitted, but she would. Whereas I... Benedict bit back a smile as his mother pointed to herself with great flourish. I would allow my children to marry paupers if it would bring them happiness. Benedict raised a brow. They would be well-principled and hard-working paupers, of course, Violet explained. No gamblers need apply. Benedict didn't want to laugh at his mother, so instead he coughed discreetly into his handkerchief. But you should not concern yourself with me, Violet said, giving her son a sideways look before punching him lightly in the arm. Of course I must, he said quickly. She smiled serenely. I shall put aside my feelings for the Dowager Countess, if you care for one of her daughters. She looked up, hopefully. Do you care for one of her daughters? I have no idea, Benedict admitted. I never got her name, just her glove. Violet gave him a stern look. I'm not even going to ask how you obtained her glove. It was all very innocent, I assure you. Violet's expression was dubious in the extreme. I have far too many sons to believe that, she muttered. The initials, Benedict reminded her. Violet examined the glove again. It's rather old, she said. Benedict nodded. I thought so as well. It smelled a bit musty, as if it had been packed away for some time. And the stitches show wear, she commented. I don't know what the L is for, but the S could very well be for Sarah, the late Earl's mother, who has also passed on, which would make sense given the age of the glove. Benedict stared down at the glove in his mother's hands for a moment before saying, As I'm fairly certain I did not converse with a ghost last night, who do you think the glove might belong to? I have no idea. Someone in the Gunningworth family, I imagine. Do you know where they live? At Penwood House, actually, Violet replied. The new Earl hasn't given them the boot yet. Don't know why. Perhaps he's afraid they'll want to live with him once he takes up residence. I don't think he's even in town for the season. Never met him myself. Do you happen to know where Penwood House is? Violet cut in. Of course I do. It's not far, only a few blocks away. She gave him directions, and Benedict, in his haste to be on his way, was already on his feet and halfway out the door before she finished. Oh, Benedict! Violet called out, her smile very amused. He turned around. Yes? The Countess's daughters are named Rosamond and Posy, just in case you're interested. Rosamond and Posy. Neither seemed fitting, but what did he know? Perhaps he didn't seem a proper Benedict to people he met. He turned on his heel and tried to exit once again, but his mother stopped him with yet another. Oh, uh, Benedict! He turned around. Yes, mother? He asked, sounding purposefully beleaguered. You will tell me what happens, won't you? Of course, mother. You're lying to me, she said with a smile, but I forgive you. It's so nice to see you in love. I'm not whatever you say, dear, she said with a wave. Benedict decided there was little point in replying. So, with nothing more than a roll of his eyes, he left the room and hurried out of the house. Sophie! Sophie's chin snapped up. Araminta sounded even more irate than usual, if that were possible. Araminta was always upset with her. Sophie! Drat it! Where is that infernal girl? The infernal girl is right here, Sophie muttered, setting down the silver spoon she'd been polishing. As Lady's maid to Araminta, 
Rosamond and Posy, she shouldn't have had to add the polishing to her list of chores, but Araminta positively reveled in working her to the bone. Right here, she called out, rising to her feet and walking out into the hall. The Lord only knew what Araminta was upset about this time. She looked this way and that. My lady? Araminta came storming around the corner. What? she snapped, holding something up in her right hand. Is the meaning of this? Sophie's eyes fell to Araminta's hand, and she only just managed to stifle a gasp. Araminta was holding the shoes that Sophie had borrowed the night before. I... I don't know what you mean, she stammered. These shoes are brand new. Brand new. Sophie stood quietly until she realized that Araminta required a reply. Uh, what is the problem? Look at this, Araminta screeched, jabbing her finger toward one of the heels. It's scuffed. Scuffed. How could something like this happen? I'm sure I don't know, my lady, Sophie said. Perhaps there is no perhaps about it, Araminta huffed. Someone has been wearing my shoes. I assure you no one has been wearing your shoes, Sophie replied, amazed that she was able to keep her voice even. We all know how particular you are about your footwear. Araminta narrowed her eyes suspiciously. Are you being sarcastic? Sophie rather thought that if Araminta had to ask, then she was playing her sarcasm very well indeed. But she lied and said, No, of course not. I merely meant that you take very good care of your shoes. They last longer that way. Araminta said nothing. So Sophie added, Which means you don't have to buy as many pairs. Which was, of course, utter ridiculousness, as Araminta already owned more pairs of shoes than any one person could hope to wear in a lifetime. This is your fault, Araminta growled. According to Araminta, everything was always Sophie's fault. But this time she was actually correct. So Sophie just gulped and said, What would you like me to do about it, my lady? I want to know who wore my shoes. Perhaps they were scuffed in your closet, Sophie suggested. Maybe you accidentally kicked them last time you walked by. I never accidentally do anything, Araminta snapped. Sophie silently agreed. Araminta was deliberate in all things. I can ask the maids, Sophie said. Perhaps one of them knows something. The maids are a pack of idiots, Araminta replied. What they know could fit on my littlest fingernail. Sophie waited for Araminta to say, present company excluded, but of course she did not. Finally, Sophie said, I can try to polish the shoe. I'm sure we can do something about the scuff mark. The heels are covered in satin, Araminta sneered. If you can find a way to polish that, then we should have you admitted to the Royal College of Fabric Scientists. Sophie badly wanted to ask if there even existed a Royal College of Fabric Scientists, but Araminta didn't have much of a sense of humour, even when she wasn't in a complete snit. To poke fun now would be a clear invitation for disaster. I could try to rub it out, Sophie suggested, or brush it. You do that, Araminta said. In fact, while you're at it, oh, blast, all bad things began with Araminta saying, while you're at it, you might as well polish all of my shoes. All of them, Sophie gulped. Araminta's collection must have numbered at least eighty pair. All of them. And while you're at it, not again. Lady Penwood. Araminta blessedly stopped in mid-command to turn and see what the butler wanted. A gentleman is here to see you, my lady, he said, handing her a crisp white card. Araminta took it from him and read the name. Her eyes widened, and she let out a little, Oh, before turning back to the butler and barking out, Tea and biscuits, the best silver, at once.
the butler hurried out, leaving Sophie staring at Araminta with unfeigned curiosity. "'May I be of any help?' Sophie asked. Araminta blinked twice, staring at Sophie as if she'd forgotten her presence. "'No,' she snapped. "'I'm far too busy to bother with you. Go upstairs at once.' She paused, then added, "'What are you doing down here, anyway?' Sophie motioned toward the dining room she'd recently exited. "'You asked me to polish. I asked you to see to my shoes!' Araminta fairly yelled. All, "'All right,' Sophie said slowly. Araminta was acting very odd, even for Araminta. "'I'll just put away now!' Sophie hurried to the stairs. "'Wait!' Sophie turned around. "'Yes?' she asked hesitantly. Araminta's lips tightened into an unattractive frown. "'Make sure that Rosamond's and Posy's hair is properly dressed.' "'Of course. Then you may instruct Rosamond to lock you in my closet.' Sophie stared at her. She actually wanted Sophie to give the order to have herself locked in the closet. "'Do you understand me?' Sophie couldn't quite bring herself to nod. Some things were simply too demeaning. Araminta marched over until their faces were quite close. "'You didn't answer,' she hissed. "'Do you understand me?' Sophie nodded, but just barely. Every day, it seemed, brought more evidence of the depth of Araminta's hatred for her. "'Why do you keep me here?' she whispered, before she had time to think better of it. "'Because I find you useful,' was Araminta's low reply. Sophie watched as Araminta stalked from the room, then hurried up the stairs. Rosamond's and Posy's hair looked quite acceptable, so she sighed, turned to Posy, and said, "'Lock me in the closet, if you will.' Posy blinked in surprise. "'I beg your pardon. "'I was instructed to ask Rosamond.' but I can't quite bring myself to do so. Posy peered in the closet with great interest. May I ask why? I meant to polish your mother's shoes. Posy swallowed uncomfortably. I'm sorry. <sighs> so am I, Sophie said with a sigh. So am I. Chapter 5 and in other news from the masquerade ball, Miss Posy Railing's costume as a mermaid was somewhat unfortunate, but not, this author thinks, as dreadful as that of Mrs. Featherington and her two eldest daughters, who went as a bowl of fruit, Philippa as an orange, Prudence as an apple, and Mrs. Featherington as a bunch of grapes. Sadly, none of the three looked the least bit appetising. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 7th of June, 1815 What had his life come to, Benedict wondered, that he was obsessed with a glove? He'd patted his coat pocket about a dozen times since he'd taken a seat in Lady Penwood's sitting room, silently reassuring himself that it was still there. Uncharacteristically anxious, he wasn't certain what he planned to say to the dowager countess once she arrived, but he was usually fairly glib of tongue. Surely he'd figure out something as he went along. His foot tapping, he glanced over at the mantel clock. He'd given his card to the butler about fifteen minutes earlier, which meant that Lady Penwood ought to be down soon. It seemed an unwritten rule that all ladies of the ton must keep their callers waiting for at least fifteen minutes, twenty if they were feeling particularly peevish. A bloody stupid rule, Benedict thought irritably. Why the rest of the world didn't value punctuality as he did, he would never know, but... Mr. Bridgerton! He looked up. A rather attractive, extremely fashionable blonde woman in her forties glided into the room. She looked vaguely familiar, but that was to be expected. They'd surely attended many of the same society functions, even if they had not been introduced. 
You must be Lady Penwood, he murmured, rising to his feet and offering her a polite bow. Indeed, she replied with a gracious incline of her head. I am so delighted that you have chosen to honour us with a call. I have, of course, informed my daughters of your presence. They shall be down shortly. Benedict smiled. That was exactly what he'd hoped she'd do. He would have been shocked if she'd behaved otherwise. No mother of marriageable daughters ever ignored a Bridgerton brother. I look forward to meeting them, he said. Her brow furrowed slightly. Then you have not yet met them? Blast! Now she'd be wondering why he was there. I have heard such lovely things about them, he improvised, trying not to groan. If Lady Whistledown caught hold of this, and Lady Whistledown seemed to catch hold of everything, it would soon be all over town that he was looking for a wife, and that he'd zeroed in on the Countess's daughters. Why else would he call upon two women to whom he had not even been introduced? Lady Penwood beamed. My Rosamond is considered one of the loveliest girls of the season. And your posy? Benedict asked, somewhat perversely. The corners of her mouth tightened. Posy is uh, delightful. He smiled benignly. I cannot wait to meet Posy. Lady Penwood blinked, then covered up her surprise with a slightly hard smile. I'm sure Posy will be delighted to meet you. A maid entered with an ornate silver tea service, then set it down on a table at Lady Penwood's nod. Before the maid could depart, however, the Countess said, somewhat sharply in Benedict's opinion, Where are the Penwood spoons? The maid bobbed a rather panicked curtsy, then replied, Sophie was polishing the silver in the dining room, my lady, but she had to go upstairs when you— Silence! Lady Penwood cut in, even though she'd been the one to ask about the spoons in the first place. I'm sure Mr. Bridgerton is not so high in the instep that he needs monogrammed spoons for his tea. Of course not, Benedict murmured, thinking that Lady Penwood must be a bit too high in the instep herself if she even thought to bring it up. Go, go! The Countess ordered the maid, waving her briskly away. Be gone! The maid hurried out, and the Countess turned back to him, explaining, Our better silver is engraved with the Penwood crest. Benedict leaned forward. Really? he asked with obvious interest. This would be an excellent way to verify that the crest on the glove was indeed that of the Penwoods. We don't have anything like that at Bridgerton House he said, hoping he wasn't lying. In all truth, he'd never even noticed the pattern of the silver. I should love to see it. Really? Lady Penwood asked, her eyes lighting up. I knew you were a man of taste and refinement. Benedict smiled, mostly so he wouldn't groan. I shall have to send someone to the dining room to fetch a piece. Assuming, of course, that infernal girl managed to do her job. The corners of her lips turned down in a most unattractive manner, and Benedict noticed that her frown lines were deep indeed. Is there a problem? he asked politely. She shook her head and waved her hand dismissively. Merely that it is so difficult to find good help. I'm sure your mother says the same thing all the time. His mother never said any such thing, but that was probably because all of the Bridgerton servants were treated very well, and thus were utterly devoted to the family. But Benedict nodded all the same. One of these days I'm going to have to give Sophie the boot, the Countess said with a sniff. She cannot do anything right. Benedict felt a vague pang of pity for the poor, unseen Sophie but the last thing he wanted to do was get into a discussion on servants with Lady Penwood, and so he changed the subject by motioning to the teapot and saying, I imagine it's well steeped by now. Of course, of course. Lady Penwood looked up and smiled. How do you take yours? Milk, no sugar. As she prepared his cup, 
Benedict heard the clatter of feet coming down the stairs, and his heart began to race with excitement. Any minute now, the Countess's daughters would slip through the door, and surely one of them would be the woman he'd met the night before. It was true that he had not seen most of her face, but he knew her approximate size and height, and he was fairly certain that her hair was a long, light brown. Surely he'd recognize her when he saw her. How could he not? But when the two young ladies entered the room, he knew instantly that neither was the woman who'd haunted his every thought. One of them was far too blonde, and besides, she held herself with a prissy, rather affected manner. There was no joy in her aspect, no mischief in her smile. The other looked friendly enough, but she was too chubby, and her hair was too dark. Benedict did his best not to look disappointed. He smiled during the introductions, and gallantly kissed each of their hands, murmuring some nonsense about how delighted he was to meet them. He made a point of fawning over the chubby one, if only because her mother so obviously preferred the other. Mothers like that, he decided, didn't deserve to be mothers. And do you have any other children? Benedict asked Lady Penwood, once the introductions were through. She gave him an odd look. Of course not, else I would have brought them out to meet you. I thought you might have children still in the schoolroom, he demurred. Perhaps from your union with the Earl. She shook her head. Lord Penwood and I were not blessed with children. Such a pity it was that the title left the Gunningworth family. Benedict could not help but notice that the Countess looked more irritated than saddened by her lack of Penwood progeny. Did your husband have any brothers or sisters? he asked. Maybe his mystery lady was a Gunningworth cousin. The Countess shot him a suspicious look, which Benedict had to admit was well-deserved, considering that his questions were not at all the usual fare for an afternoon call. Obviously, she replied, my late husband did not have any brothers, as the title passed out of the family. Benedict knew he should keep his mouth shut, but something about the woman was so bloody irritating he had to say, he could have had a brother who predeceased him. Well, he did not. Rosamond and Posy were watching the exchange with great interest, their heads bobbing back and forth like balls at a tennis match. And any sisters? Benedict inquired. The only reason I ask is that I come from such a large family. He motioned to Rosamond and Posy. I cannot imagine having only one sibling. I thought perhaps that your daughters might have cousins to keep them company. It was, he thought, rather paltry as far as explanations went, but it would have to do. He did have one sister, the Countess replied with a disdainful sniff. But she lived and died a spinster. She was a woman of great faith, she explained, and chose to devote her life to charitable works. So much for that theory. I very much enjoyed your masquerade ball last night. Rosamond suddenly said. Benedict looked at her in surprise. The two girls had been so silent he'd forgotten they could even speak. It was really my mother's ball, he answered. I had no part in the planning, but I shall convey your compliments. Please do, Rosamond said. Did you enjoy the ball, Mr. Bridgerton? Benedict stared at her for a moment before answering. She had a hard look in her eyes, as if she was searching for a specific piece of information. I did indeed, he finally said. I noticed you spent a great deal of time with one lady in particular, Rosamond persisted. Lady Penwood twisted her head sharply to look at him, but she did not say anything. Did you? Benedict murmured. She was wearing silver, Rosamond said was she? A mystery woman, he said with an enigmatic smile. No need for them to know that she was a mystery to him as well. Surely you can share her name with us, Lady Penwood said. Benedict just smiled and stood. 
He wasn't going to get any more information here. I'm afraid I must be going, ladies, he said affably, offering them a smooth bow. You never did see the spoons, Lady Penwood reminded him. I'll have to save them for another time, Benedict said. It was unlikely that his mother would have incorrectly identified the Penwood crest, and besides, if he spent much more time in the company of the hard and brittle Countess of Penwood, he might wretch. It has been lovely, he lied. Indeed, Lady Penwood said, rising to walk him to the door. Brief, but lovely. Benedict didn't bother to smile again. What? Araminta said as she heard the front door close behind Benedict Bridgerton. Do you suppose that was about? Well, Posy said, he might... I didn't ask you, Araminta bit off. Well, then, who did you ask? Posy returned with uncharacteristic gumption. Perhaps he saw me from afar, Rosamond said. And he didn't see you from afar. Araminta snapped as she strode across the room. Rosamond lurched backward in surprise. Her mother rarely spoke to her in such impatient tones. Araminta continued, You yourself said he was besotted with some woman in a silver dress. I didn't say besotted precisely. Don't argue with me over such trivialities. Besotted or not, he didn't come here looking for either of you, Araminta said with a fair amount of derision. I don't know what he was up to. He... Her words trailed off as she reached the window. Pulling the sheer curtain back, she saw Mr. Bridgerton standing on the pavement, pulling something from his pocket. What is he doing? she whispered. I think he's holding a glove, Posy said helpfully. It's not a... Araminta said automatically, too used to contradicting everything Posy had to say. Why, it is a glove. I should think I know a glove when I see one, Posy muttered. What is he looking at? Rosamond asked, nudging her sister out of the way. There's something on the glove, Posy said. Perhaps it's a piece of embroidery. We've some gloves with a penwood crest embroidered on the hem. Maybe that glove has the same. Araminta went white. Are you feeling all right, mother? Posy asked. You look rather pale. He came here looking for her, Araminta whispered. Who? Rosamond asked. The woman in silver. Well, he isn't going to find her here, Posy replied. As I was a mermaid and Rosamond was Marie Antoinette. And you, of course, were Queen Elizabeth. The shoes, Araminta gasped. The shoes! What shoes? Rosamond asked irritably. They were scuffed. Someone wore my shoes. Araminta's face, already impossibly pale, blanched even more. It was her. How did she do it? It had to be her. Who? Rosamond demanded. Mother, are you certain you're all right? Posy asked again. You're not at all yourself. But Araminta had already run out of the room. Stupid, stupid shoe, Sophie grumbled, scrubbing at the heel of one of Araminta's older pieces of footwear. She hasn't even worn this one for years. She finished polishing the toe and put it back in its place in the neatly ordered row of shoes. But before she could reach for another pair, the door to the closet burst open, slamming against the wall with such force that Sophie nearly screamed with surprise. Oh, goodness, you gave me a fright, she said to Araminta. I didn't hear you coming and... Pack your things, Araminta said in a low, cruel voice. I want you out of this house by sunrise. The rag Sophie had been using to polish the shoes fell from her hand. What? she gasped. Why? Do I really need a reason? We both know I ceased receiving any funds for your care nearly a year ago. It's enough that I don't want you here any longer. But where will I go? Araminta's eyes narrowed to nasty slits.
That's not my concern now, is it? But you're twenty years of age, certainly old enough to make your way in the world. There will be no more coddling from me. You never coddled me, Sophie said in a low voice. Don't you dare talk back to me. Why not? Sophie returned, her voice growing shrill. What have I to lose? You're booting me out of the house anyway. You might treat me with a little respect, Araminta hissed, planting her foot on Sophie's skirt so that she was pinned in her kneeling position. Considering that I have clothed and sheltered you this past year out of the goodness of my heart. You do nothing out of the goodness of your heart. Sophie tugged at her skirt, but it was firmly trapped under Araminta's heel. Why did you really keep me here? Araminta cackled. You're cheaper than a regular maid, and I do enjoy ordering you about. Sophie hated being Araminta's virtual slave, but at least Penwood House was home. Mrs. Gibbons was her friend, and Posy was usually sympathetic, and the rest of the world was, well, rather scary. Where would she go? What would she do? How would she support herself? Why now? Sophie asked. Araminta shrugged. You're no longer useful to me. Sophie looked at the long row of shoes she'd just polished. I'm not. Araminta ground the pointy heel of her shoe into Sophie's skirt, tearing the fabric. You went to the ball last night, didn't you? Sophie felt the blood drain from her face, and she knew that Araminta saw the truth in her eyes. N no, she lied. How would I? I don't know how you did it but I know you were there. Araminta kicked a pair of shoes in Sophie's direction. Put these on. Sophie just stared at the shoes in dismay. They were white satin, stitched in silver. They were the shoes she'd worn the night before. Put them on, Araminta screamed. I know that Rosamond's and Posy's feet are too large. You're the only one who could have worn my shoes last night. And from that you think I went to the ball? Sophie asked, her voice breathy with panic. Put on the shoes, Sophie. Sophie did as she was told. They were, of course, a perfect fit. You have overstepped your bounds, Araminta said in a low voice. I warned you years ago not to forget your place in this world. You are a bastard, a by-blow. The product of... I know what a bastard is, Sophie snapped. Araminta raised one haughty brow, silently mocking Sophie's outburst. You are unfit to mingle with polite society, she continued. And yet you dared to pretend you were as good as the rest of us by attending the masquerade. Yes, I dared, Sophie cried out, well past caring that Araminta had somehow discovered her secret. I dared, and I dare again. My blood is just as blue as yours. And my heart far kinder, and... One minute Sophie was on her feet, screaming at Araminta, and the next she was on the floor, clutching her cheek, made red by Araminta's palm. Don't you ever compare yourself to me, Araminta warned. Sophie remained on the floor. How could her father have done this to her, leaving her in the care of a woman who so obviously detested her? Had he cared so little... Or had he simply been blind? You will be gone by morning, Araminta said in a low voice. I don't ever want to see your face again. Sophie started to make her way to the door. But not, Araminta said, planting the heel of her hand against Sophie's shoulder, until you finish the job I have assigned you. It will take me until morning just to finish, Sophie protested. That is your problem. Not mine. And with that, Araminta slammed the door shut, turning the lock with a very loud click. Sophie stared down at the flickering candle she'd brought in to help illuminate the long, dark closet. There was no way the wick would last until morning. And there was no way, absolutely no way in hell, that she was going to polish the rest of Araminta's shoes. Sophie sat down on the floor arms crossed and legs crossed, and stared at the candle flame until her eyes crossed too. When the sun rose tomorrow, her life would be forever altered.
Penwood House might not have been terribly welcoming, but at least it was safe. She had almost no money. She hadn't received so much as a farthing from Araminta in the past seven years. Luckily, she still had a bit of the pin money she'd received when her father had been alive, and she'd been treated as his ward, not his wife's slave. There had been many opportunities to spend it, but Sophie had always known that this day might come, and it had seemed prudent to hold on to what little funds she possessed. But her paltry few pounds wasn't going to get her very far. She needed a ticket out of London, and that cost money, probably well over half what she had saved. She supposed she could stay in town for a bit, but the London slums were dirty and dangerous, and Sophie knew that her budget would not place her in any of the better neighbourhoods. Besides, if she were going to be on her own, she might as well return to the countryside she loved. Not to mention that Benedict Bridgerton was here. London was a large city, and Sophie had no doubt that she could successfully avoid him for years. But she was desperately afraid that she wouldn't want to avoid him, that she'd find herself gazing at his house, hoping for the merest of glimpses as he came through the front door. And if he saw her, well, Sophie didn't know what might happen. He might be furious at her deception. He might want to make her his mistress. He might not recognize her at all. The only thing she was certain he would not do was to throw himself at her feet, declare his undying devotion, and demand her hand in marriage. Sons of Viscounts did not marry base-born nobodies, not even in romantic novels. No, she'd have to leave London, keep herself far from temptation. But she'd need more money, enough to keep her going until she found employment, enough to... Sophie's eyes fell on something sparkly, a pair of shoes tucked away in the corner, except she'd cleaned those shoes just an hour earlier and she knew that those sparklies weren't the shoes, but a pair of jeweled shoe clips, easily detachable and small enough to fit in her pocket. Did she dare? She thought about all the money that Araminta had received for her upkeep, money Araminta had never seen fit to share. She thought about all those years she'd toiled as a lady's maid, without drawing a single wage. She thought about her conscience, then quickly squelched it, in times like these, she didn't have room for a conscience. She took the shoe clips. And then, several hours later, when Posy came, against her mother's wishes, and let her out, she packed up all of her belongings and left. Much to her surprise, she didn't look back. Part 2 Chapter 6 it has now been three years since any of the Bridgerton siblings have wed, and Lady Bridgerton has been heard to declare, on several occasions, that she is nearing her wit's end. Benedict has not taken a bride, and it is the opinion of this author that as he has attained the age of thirty, he is far past due, and neither has Colin, although he may be forgiven his tardiness, since he is, after all, merely six and twenty. The Dowager Viscountess also has two girls about which she must worry. Eloise is nearly one and twenty, and although she has received several proposals, she has shown no inclination to marry. Francesca is nearly twenty. The girls quite coincidentally share a birthday, and she too seems more interested in the season than she does in marriage. This author feels that Lady Bridgerton does not need to worry, it is inconceivable that any of the Bridgertons might not eventually make an acceptable match. And besides, her two married children have already given her a total of five grandchildren, and surely that is her heart's desire. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 30th of April, 1817 Alcohol and cheroots, card games, and lots of hired women. It was just the sort of party Benedict Bridgerton would have enjoyed immensely when he was fresh out of university. Now he was just bored. He wasn't even certain why he'd agreed to attend. More boredom, he supposed, 
the London season of 1817 had thus far been a repeat of the previous year, and he hadn't found 1816 terribly scintillating to begin with. To do the whole thing over again was beyond banal. He didn't even really know his host, one Philip Cavender. It was one of those friend-of-a-friend-of-a-friend situations, and now Benedict was fervently wishing he'd remained in London. He'd just gotten over a blistering head cold, and he should have used that as an excuse to cry off. But his friend, whom he hadn't even seen in the past four hours, had prodded and cajoled, and finally Benedict had given in. Now he heartily regretted it. He walked down the main hall of Cavender's parents' home. Through the doorway to his left, he could see a high-stakes card game in process. One of the players was sweating profusely. Stupid idiot, Benedict muttered. The poor bloke was probably just a breath away from losing his ancestral home. The door to his right was closed, but he could hear the sound of feminine giggling, followed by masculine laughter, followed by some rather unattractive grunting and squealing. This was madness. He didn't want to be here. He hated card games, where the stakes were higher than the participants could afford, and he'd never had any interest in copulating in such a public manner. He had no idea what had happened to the friend who had brought him here, and he didn't much like any of the other guests. "'I'm leaving,' he declared, even though there was no one in the hall to hear him. He had a small piece of property, not so very far away, just an hour's ride, really. It wasn't much more than a cottage, but it was his, and right now it sounded like heaven. But good manners dictated that he find his host and inform him of his departure, even if Mr. Cavender was so sotted that he wouldn't remember the conversation the next day. After about ten minutes of fruitless searching, however, Benedict was beginning to wish that his mother had not been so adamant in her quest to instill good manners in all of her children. It would have been a great deal easier just to leave and be done with it. Three more minutes, he grumbled. If I don't find the bloody idiot in three more minutes, I'm leaving. Just then, a pair of young men stumbled by, tripping over their own feet as they exploded in raucous laughter. Alcoholic fumes filled the air, and Benedict took a discreet step back, lest one of them was suddenly compelled to cast up the contents of his stomach. Benedict had always been fond of his boots. Bridgerton! one of them called out. Benedict gave them a curt nod in greeting. They were both about five years younger than he was, and he didn't know them well. That's not a Bridgerton, the other fellow slurred. That's a... Why, it is a Bridgerton. Got the hair and the nose. His eyes narrowed. But which Bridgerton? Benedict ignored his question. Have you seen our host? We have a host. Of course we have a host, the first man replied. Cavender, damned fine fellow, you know, to let us use his house. His parents' house, the other one corrected. Hasn't inherited yet, poor bloke. Just so. His parents' house. Still jolly of him. Have either of you seen him? growled Benedict. Just outside, replied the one who previously hadn't recalled that they had a host. In the front. Thank you, Benedict said shortly, then strode past them to the front door of the house. He'd head down the front steps, pay his respects to Cavender, then make his way to the stables to collect his phaeton. He'd barely even have to break his stride. It was, thought Sophie Beckett, high time she found a new job. It had been almost two years since she'd left London. Two years since she'd finally stopped being Araminta's virtual slave. Two years since she'd been completely on her own. After she'd left Penwood House, she'd pawned Araminta's shoe clips. But the diamonds Araminta had liked to boast about had turned out not to be diamonds at all, but rather simple paste, and they hadn't brought much money. She'd tried to find a job as a governess, 
but none of the agencies she'd queried was willing to take her on. She was obviously well-educated, but she'd had no references. And besides, most women did not like to hire someone quite so young and pretty. Sophie had eventually purchased a ticket on a coach to Wiltshire, since that was as far as she could go, while still reserving the bulk of her pin money for emergencies. Luckily, she'd found employment quickly, as an upstairs maid for Mr. and Mrs. John Cavender. They were an ordinary sort of couple, expecting good work from their servants, but not demanding the impossible. After toiling for Araminta for so many years, Sophie found the Cavenders a positive vacation. But then their son had returned from his tour of Europe, and everything had changed. Philip was constantly cornering her in the hall, and when his innuendo and suggestions were rebuffed, he'd grown more aggressive. Sophie had just started to think that maybe she ought to find employment elsewhere when Mr. and Mrs. Cavender had left for a week to visit Mrs. Cavender's sister in Brighton, and Philip had decided to throw a party for two dozen of his closest friends. It had been difficult to avoid Philip's advances before, but at least Sophie had felt reasonably protected— Philip would never dare attack her while his mother was in residence. But with Mr. and Mrs. Cavender gone, Philip seemed to think that he could do and take anything he wanted, and his friends were no better. Sophie knew she should have left the grounds immediately, but Mrs. Cavender had treated her well, and she didn't think it was polite to leave without giving two weeks' notice. After two hours of being chased around the house, however, she decided that good manners were not worth her virtue, and so she'd told the thankfully sympathetic housekeeper that she could not stay, packed her meagre belongings in one small bag, stolen down the side stairs, and let herself out. It was a two-mile hike into the village, but even in the dead of night the road to town seemed infinitely safer than remaining at the Cavender home, and, besides, she knew of a small inn where she could get a hot meal and a room for a reasonable price. She'd just come round the house and had stepped onto the front drive, however, when she heard a raucous shout. She looked up. Oh, blast! Philip Cavender, looking even drunker and meaner than usual. Sophie broke into a run, praying that alcohol had impaired Philip's coordination, because she knew she could not match him for speed. But her flight must have only served to excite him, because she heard him yell out with glee, then felt his footsteps rumbling on the ground, growing closer and closer, until she felt his hand close round the back collar of her coat, jerking her to a halt. Philip laughed triumphantly, and Sophie had never been so terrified in her entire life. "'Look what I have here!' he cackled. "'Little Miss Sophie!' I shall have to introduce you to my friends. Sophie's mouth went dry, and she wasn't sure whether her heart started to beat double time or stopped altogether. Let me go, Mr. Cavender, she said in her sternest voice. She knew that he liked her helpless and pleading, and she refused to cater to his wishes. I don't think so, he said, turning her around so that she was forced to watch his lips stretch into a slippery smile. He turned his head to the side and called out, Heasley! Fletcher! Look what I have here! Sophie watched with horror as two more men emerged from the shadows. From the looks of them, they were just as drunk, or maybe even more so than Philip. You always host the best parties, one of them said in an oily voice. Philip puffed out with pride. Let me go, Sophie said again. Philip grinned. What do you think, boys? Should I do as the lady asks? Hell no, came the reply from the younger of the two men. Lady, said the other, the same one who had told Philip that he hosted the best parties, might be a bit of a misnomer, don't you think? Quite right, Philip replied. This one's a housemaid, and as we all know, that breed is born to serve. He gave Sophie a shove, pushing her toward one of his friends. Yeah, have a look at the goods.
Sophie cried out as she was propelled forward, and she clutched tightly to her small bag. She was about to be raped. That much was clear. But her panicked mind wanted to hold on to some last shred of dignity, and she refused to allow these men to spill her every last belonging onto the cold ground. The man who caught her fondled her roughly, then shoved her toward the third one. He'd just snaked his hand around her waist when she heard someone yell out, Cavender! Sophie shut her eyes in agony. A fourth man. Dear God, weren't three enough? Bridgerton! Philip called out. Come, join us! Sophie's eyes snapped open. Bridgerton? A tall, powerfully built man emerged from the shadows, moving forward with easy, confident grace. What have we here? Dear God, she'd recognise that voice anywhere. She heard it often enough in her dreams. It was Benedict Bridgerton, her Prince Charming. The night air was chilly, but Benedict found it refreshing after being forced to breathe the alcohol and tobacco fumes inside. The moon was nearly full, glowing round and fat, and a gentle breeze ruffled the leaves on the trees. All in all, it was an excellent night to leave a boring party and ride home. But first things first. He had to find his host, go through the motions of thanking him for his hospitality, and inform him of his departure. As he reached the bottom step, he called out, Cavender! Over here! came the reply, and Benedict turned his head to the right. Cavender was standing under a stately old elm with two other gentlemen. They appeared to be having a bit of fun with a housemaid, pushing her back and forth between them. Benedict groaned. He was too far away to determine whether the housemaid was enjoying their attentions, and if she was not, then he was going to have to save her, which was not how he'd planned to spend his evening. He'd never been particularly enamoured of playing the hero, but he had far too many younger sisters, four to be precise, to ignore any female in distress. Ho oh, there! he called out as he ambled over, keeping his posture purposefully casual. It was always better to move slowly and assess the situation than it was to charge in blindly. Bridgerton! Cavender called out. Come, join us! Benedict drew close, just as one of the men snaked an arm around the young woman's waist and pinned her to him, her back to his front. His other hand was on her bottom, squeezing and kneading. Benedict brought his gaze to the maid's eyes. They were huge and filled with terror, and she was looking at him as if he'd just dropped fully formed from the sky. "'What have we here?' he asked. "'Just a bit of sport,' Cavender chortled. My parents were kind enough to hire this prime morsel as the upstairs maid. She doesn't appear to be enjoying your attentions, Benedict said quietly. She likes it just fine, Cavender replied with a grin. Fine enough for me, anyway. But not, Benedict said, stepping forward, for me. You can have your turn with her, Cavender said, ever jovial, just as soon as we're through. You misunderstand. There was a hard edge to Benedict's voice, and the three men all froze, looking over at him with wary curiosity. Release the girl, he said, still stunned by the sudden change of atmosphere, and with reflexes most likely dulled by alcohol, the man holding the girl did nothing. I don't want to fight you, Benedict said, crossing his arms, but I will and I can assure you that the three-to-one odds don't frighten me. Now see here, Cavender said angrily, you can't come here and order me about on my own property. It's your parents' property, Benedict pointed out, reminding them all that Cavender was still rather wet behind the ears. It's my home, Cavender shot back, and she's my maid, and she'll do what I want. I wasn't aware that slavery was legal in this country, Benedict murmured. She has to do what I say. Does she? I'll fire her if she doesn't. Very well, 
Benedict said with a tiny quirk of a smile. Ask her then. Ask the girl if she wants to tup with all three of you. Because that is what you had in mind, isn't it? Cavender sputtered as he fought for words. Ask her, Benedict said again, grinning now, mostly because he knew his smile would infuriate the younger man. And if she says no, you can fire her right here on the spot. I'm not going to ask her, Cavender whined. Well then, you can't really expect her to do it, can you? Benedict looked at the girl. She was a fetching thing, with a short bob of light brown curls and eyes that loomed almost too large in her face. Fine, he said, sparing a brief glance back at Cavender. I'll ask her. The girl's lips parted slightly, and Benedict had the oddest sensation that they had met before. But that was impossible, unless she'd worked for some other aristocratic family, and even then he would have only seen her in passing. His taste in women had never run to housemaids, and in all truth he tended not to notice them. Miss, he frowned, I say, what's your name? Sophie Beckett, she gasped, sounding as if there were a very large frog caught in her throat. Miss Beckett, he continued, would you be so kind as to answer the following question? No, she burst out. You're not going to answer, he asked, his eyes amused. No, I do not want to tup with these three men. The words practically exploded from her mouth. Well, that seems to settle that, Benedict said. He glanced up at the man still holding her. I suggest you release her so that Cavender here may relieve her of employment. And where will she go? Cavender sneered. I can assure you she won't work in this district again. Sophie turned to Benedict, wondering much the same thing. Benedict gave a careless shrug. I'll find her a position in my mother's household. He looked over at her and raised a brow. I assume that's acceptable. Sophie's mouth dropped open in horrified surprise. He wanted to take her to his home. That's not quite the reaction I expected, Benedict said dryly. It will certainly be more pleasant than your employment here. At the very least, I can assure you you won't be raped. What do you say? Sophie glanced frantically at the three men who had intended to rape her. She really didn't have a choice. Benedict Bridgerton was her only means off the Cavender property. She knew she couldn't possibly work for his mother. To be in such close proximity to Benedict and still have to be a servant would be more than she could bear. But she could find a way to avoid that later. For now she just needed to get away from Philip. She turned to Benedict and nodded, still afraid to use her voice. She felt as if she were choking inside, although she wasn't certain whether that was from fear or relief. Good, he said. Shall we be off? She gave a rather pointed look at the arm that was still holding her hostage. Oh, for the love of God, Benedict snarled. Will you let go of her or will I have to shoot your damned hand off? Benedict wasn't even holding a gun, but the tone of his voice was such that the man let go instantly. Good, Benedict said, holding his arm out toward the maid. She stepped forward and, with trembling fingers, placed her hand on his elbow. You can't just take her, Philip yelled. Benedict gave him a supercilious look. I just did. You'll be sorry you did this, Philip said. I doubt it. Now get out of my sight. Philip made a huffy sound, then turned to his friends and said, Let's get out of here. Then he turned to Benedict and added, Don't think you shall ever receive another invitation to one of my parties. My heart is breaking, Benedict drawled. Philip let out one more outraged snort, and then he and his two friends stalked back to the house. Sophie watched them walk away, then slowly dragged her gaze back to Benedict. When she'd been trapped by Philip and his leering friends, 
She'd known what they wanted to do to her, and she'd almost wanted to die. And then, all of a sudden, there was Benedict Bridgerton, standing before her like a hero from her dreams, and she'd thought maybe she had died, because why else would he be here with her unless she was in heaven? She'd been so completely and utterly stunned, she'd almost forgotten that Philip's friend still held her pinned against him, and was grabbing her behind in a most humiliating manner. For one brief second, the world had melted away, and the only thing she could see, the only thing she knew, was Benedict Bridgerton. It had been a moment of perfection. But then the world had come crashing back, and all she could think was, what on earth was he doing here? It was a disgusting party, full of drunkards and whores, when she'd met him two years ago, he hadn't seen the sort who would frequent such events, but she'd only known him for a few short hours. Perhaps she'd misjudged him. She closed her eyes in agony. For the past two years, the memory of Benedict Bridgerton had been the brightest light in her drab and dreary life. If she'd misjudged him, if he was little better than Philip and his friends, then she'd be left with nothing not even a memory of love. But he had saved her. That was irrefutable. Maybe it didn't really matter why he'd come to Philip's party, only that he had, and he had saved her. Are you all right? he suddenly asked. Sophie nodded, looking him squarely in the eye, waiting for him to recognize her. Are you certain? She nodded again, still waiting. It had to happen soon. Good. They were handling you roughly. I'll be all right. Sophie chewed on her lower lip. She had no idea how he would react once he realized who she was. Would he be delighted? Furious? The suspense was killing her. How much time will it take for you to pack your things? Sophie blinked rather dumbly, then realized she was still holding her satchel. It's all right here, she said. I was trying to leave when they caught me. Smart girl, he murmured approvingly. Sophie just stared at him, unable to believe he hadn't recognized her. Let's be off, then, he said. It makes me ill just to be on Cavendish property. Sophie said nothing, but her chin jutted slightly forward, and her head tilted to the side as she watched his face. Are you certain you're all right? he asked. And then Sophie started to think. Two years ago, when she'd met him, half of her face had been covered by a mask. Her hair had been lightly powdered, making it seem blonder than it actually was. Furthermore, she'd since cut it and sold the locks to a wig maker. Her previous long waves were now short curls. Without Mrs. Gibbons to feed her, She'd lost nearly a stone. And when one got right down to it, they'd only been in each other's company a mere hour and a half. She stared at him, right into his eyes. And that was when she knew. He wasn't going to recognize her. He had no idea who she was. Sophie didn't know whether to laugh or to cry. Chapter 7 It was clear to all of the guests at the Mottram Ball Thursday last that Miss Rosamond Railing has set her cap for Mr. Philip Cavender. It is the opinion of this author that the two are well matched indeed. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 30th of April, 1817 Ten minutes later Sophie was sitting next to Benedict Bridgerton in his phaeton. "'Is there something in your eye?' he asked politely. That caught her attention. "'I... I beg your pardon?' "'You keep blinking,' he explained. "'I thought perhaps you had something in your eye.' Sophie swallowed hard, trying to suppress a round of nervous laughter. What was she supposed to say to him? "'The truth?' that she was blinking because she kept expecting to wake up from what could only be a dream, or maybe a nightmare. "'Are you certain you're all right?' he asked. 
She nodded. Just the after-effects of shock, I imagine, he said. She nodded again, letting him think that was all that affected her. How could he not have recognised her? She'd been dreaming of this moment for years. Her Prince Charming had finally come to rescue her, and he didn't even know who she was. What was your name again? he asked. I'm terribly sorry. It always takes me twice to remember a name. Miss Sophia Beckett. There seemed little reason to lie. She hadn't told him her name at the masquerade. I'm pleased to meet you, Miss Beckett, he said, keeping his eyes on the dark road. I'm Mr. Benedict Bridgerton. Sophie acknowledged his greeting with a nod, even though he wasn't looking at her. She held silent for a moment, mostly because she simply didn't know what to say in such an unbelievable situation. It was, she realised, the introduction that had never taken place two years earlier. Finally, she just said, That was a very brave thing you did. He shrugged. There were three of them and only one of you. Most men would not have intervened. This time he did look at her. I hate bullies, was all he said. She nodded again. They would have raped me. I know, he replied. And then he added, I have four sisters. She almost said, I know, but caught herself just in time. How was a housemaid from Wiltshire supposed to know that? So, instead, she said, I expect that is why you were so sensitive to my plight. I would like to think another man would come to their aid, should they ever find themselves in a similar situation. I pray you never have to find out. He nodded grimly. As do I. They rode on, silence cloaking the night. Sophie remembered the masquerade ball, when they hadn't lacked for conversation, even for a moment. It was different now, she realised. She was a housemaid, not a glorious woman of the ton. They had nothing in common. But still, she kept waiting for him to recognise her, to yank the carriage to a halt, clasp her to his chest, and tell her he'd been looking for her for two years. But that wasn't going to happen, she soon realised. He couldn't recognise the lady in the housemaid, and in all truth, why should he? People saw what they expected to see, and Benedict Bridgerton surely didn't expect to see a fine lady of the ton in the guise of a humble housemaid. Not a day had gone by that she hadn't thought of him, hadn't remembered his lips on hers, or the heady magic of that costumed night. He had become the centrepiece of her fantasies, dreams in which she was a different person, with different parents. In her dreams... She'd met him at a ball, maybe her own ball, hosted by her devoted mother and father. He courted her sweetly, with fragrant flowers and stolen kisses. And then, on a mellow spring day, while the birds were singing and a gentle breeze ruffled the air, he got down on one knee and asked her to marry him, professing his everlasting love and adoration. It was a fine daydream surpassed only by the one in which they lived happily ever after, with three or four splendid children, born safely within the sacrament of marriage. But even with all her fantasies, she never imagined she'd actually see him again, much less be rescued by him from a trio of licentious attackers. She wondered if he ever thought of the mysterious woman in silver, with whom he'd shared one passionate kiss. She liked to think that he did, but she doubted that it had meant as much to him as it had to her. He was a man, after all, and had most likely kissed dozens of women. And for him, that one night had been much like any other. Sophie still read Whistledown whenever she could get her hands on it. She knew that he attended scores of balls. Why should one masquerade stand out in his memory? Sophie sighed and looked down at her hands, still clutching the drawstring to her small bag. She wished she owned gloves, but her only pair had worn out earlier that year, and she hadn't been able to afford another. Her hands looked rough and chapped, and her fingers were growing cold. Is that everything you own? Benedict asked, motioning to the bag. She nodded. I haven't much, I'm afraid. 
just a change of clothing and a few personal mementos. He was silent for a moment, then said, You have quite a refined accent for a housemaid. He was not the first to make that observation, so Sophie gave him her stock answer. My mother was a housekeeper to a very kind and generous family. They allowed me to share some of their daughter's lessons. Why do you not work there? With an expert twist of his wrists, he guided his team to the left side of the fork in the road. I assume you do not speak of the Cavenders. No, she replied, trying to devise a proper answer. No one had ever bothered to probe deeper than her offered explanation. No one had ever been interested enough to care. My mother passed on, she finally replied, and I did not deal well with the new housekeeper. He seemed to accept that, and they rode on for a few minutes. The night was almost silent, save for the wind and the rhythmic clip-clop of the horse's hooves. Finally, Sophie, unable to contain her curiosity, asked, "'Where are we going?' "'I have a cottage not far away,' he replied. "'We'll stay there a night or two. "'Then I'll take you to my mother's home. "'I'm certain she'll find a position for you in her household.' Sophie's heart began to pound. "'This cottage of yours—' "'You will be properly chaperoned,' he said with a faint smile. "'The caretakers will be in attendance, "'and I assure you that Mr. and Mrs. Crabtree "'are not likely to let anything untoward occur in their house.' "'I thought it was your house.' "'His smile grew deeper. "'I have been trying to get them to think of it as such for years, "'but I have never been successful.' Sophie felt her lips tug up at the corners. They sound like people I would like very much. I expect you would. And then there was more silence. Sophie kept her eyes scrupulously straight ahead. She had the most absurd fear that if their eyes met, he would recognise her. But that was mere fancy. He'd already looked her squarely in the eye, more than once even, and he still thought her nothing but a housemaid. After a few minutes, however, she felt the oddest tingling in her cheek, and as she turned to face him, she saw that he kept glancing at her with an odd expression. "'Have we met?' he blurted out. "'No,' she said, her voice a touch more choked than she would have preferred. "'I don't believe so.' "'I'm sure you're right,' he muttered. "'But still, you do seem rather familiar. "'All housemaids look the same.' she said with a wry smile. I used to think so, he mumbled. She turned her face forward, her jaw dropping. Why had she said that? Didn't she want him to recognise her? Hadn't she spent the last half hour hoping and wishing and dreaming and... And that was the problem. She was dreaming. In her dreams, he loved her. In her dreams, he asked her to marry him. In reality, he might ask her to become his mistress, and that was something she'd sworn she would never do. In reality, he might feel honour-bound to return her to Araminta, who would probably turn her straight away over to the magistrate for stealing her shoe clips, and Sophie didn't for one moment think that Araminta hadn't noticed their disappearance. No, it was best if he did not recognise her. It would only complicate her life— and considering that she had no source of income, and in fact very little beyond the clothes on her back, her life did not need complications at this point. And yet she felt unaccountably disappointed that he had not instantly known who she was. "'Is that a raindrop?' Sophie asked, eager to keep the conversation on more benign topics. Benedict looked up. The moon was now obscured by clouds— it didn't look like rain when we left, he murmured. A fat raindrop landed on his thigh. But I do believe you're correct. She glanced at the sky. The wind has picked up quite a bit. I hope it doesn't storm. It's sure to storm, he said wryly, as we are in an open carriage. If I had taken my coach, there wouldn't be a cloud in the sky. How close are we to your cottage? About half an hour away, I should think. He frowned. Provided we are not slowed by the rain. Well, 
I do not mind a bit of rain, she said gamely. There are far worse things than getting wet. They both knew exactly what she was talking about. I don't think I remembered to thank you, she said, her words quiet. Benedict turned his head sharply. By all that was holy, there was something damned familiar about her voice. But when his eyes searched her face, all he saw was a simple housemaid. A very attractive housemaid, to be sure, but a housemaid nonetheless. No one with whom he would ever have crossed paths. It was nothing, he finally said. To you, perhaps. To me, it was everything. Uncomfortable with such appreciation, he just nodded and gave one of those grunts men tended to emit when they didn't know what to say. It was a very brave thing you did, she said. He grunted again. And then the heavens opened up in earnest. It took about one minute for Benedict's clothes to be soaked through. I'll get there as quickly as I can, he yelled, trying to make himself heard over the wind. Don't worry about me. Sophie called back, but when he looked over at her, he saw that she was huddling into herself, her arms wrapped tightly over her chest as she tried to conserve the heat of her body. Let me give you my coat! She shook her head and actually laughed. It'll probably make me even wetter, soaked as it is. He nudged the horses into a faster pace, but the road was growing muddy and the wind was whipping the rain every which way, reducing the already mediocre visibility. Bloody hell! This was just what he needed. He'd had a head cold all last week, and he probably wasn't completely recovered. A ride in the freezing rain would most likely set him back, and he'd spend the next month with a runny nose, watery eyes, all those infuriating, unattractive symptoms. Of course... Benedict couldn't quite contain a smile. Of course, if he were ill again, his mother couldn't try to cajole him into attending every single party in town, all in the hopes that he would find some suitable young lady and settle down into a quiet and happy marriage. To his credit, he always kept his eyes open, was always on the lookout for a prospective bride. He certainly wasn't opposed to marriage on principle, his brother Antony and his sister Daphne had made splendidly happy matches. But Antony's and Daphne's marriages were splendidly happy because they'd been smart enough to wed the right people. And Benedict was quite certain he had not yet met the right person. No, he thought, his mind wandering back a few years. That wasn't entirely true. He'd once met someone, the Lady in Silver. When he'd held her in his arms and twirled her around the balcony in her very first waltz, he'd felt something different inside, a fluttering, tingling sensation. It should have scared the hell out of him, but it hadn't. It had left him breathless, excited, and determined to have her. But then she'd disappeared. It was as if the world were actually flat, and she'd fallen right off the edge. He'd learned nothing in that irritating interview with Lady Penwood, and when he'd queried his friends and family, no one knew anything about a young woman wearing a silver dress. She hadn't arrived with anyone, and she hadn't left with anyone. For all intents and purposes, she hadn't even existed. He'd watched for her at every ball, party, and music hall he attended. Hell, he attended twice as many functions as usual— just in the hopes that he'd catch a glimpse of her. But he'd always come home disappointed. He'd thought he would stop looking for her. He was a practical man, and he'd assumed that eventually he would simply give up. And in some ways he had. After a few months, he found himself back in the habit of turning down more invitations than he accepted. A few months after that, he realised that he was once again able to meet women and not automatically compare them to her. But he couldn't stop himself from watching for her. He might not feel the same urgency, but whenever he attended a ball or took a seat at a musicale, he found his eyes sweeping across the crowd, his ears straining for the lilt of her laughter. She was out there somewhere, 
He'd long since resigned himself to the fact that he wasn't likely to find her, and he hadn't searched actively for over a year. But he smiled wistfully. He just couldn't stop from looking. It had become, in a very strange way, a part of who he was. His name was Benedict Bridgerton. He had seven brothers and sisters, was rather skilled with both a sword and a sketching crayon, and he always kept his eyes open for the one woman who had touched his soul. He kept hoping and wishing and watching. And even though he told himself it was probably time to marry, he just couldn't muster the enthusiasm to do so. Because what if he put his ring on some woman's finger and the next day he saw her? It would be enough to break his heart. No, it would be more than that. It would be enough to shatter his soul. Benedict breathed a sigh of relief as he saw the village of Rosemead approaching. Rosemead meant that his cottage was a mere five minutes away, and lud, but he couldn't wait to get inside and throw himself into a steaming tub of water. He glanced over at Miss Beckett. She, too, was shivering. But, he thought with a touch of admiration, she hadn't let out even a peep of complaint. Benedict tried to think of another woman of his acquaintance who would have stood up to the elements with such fortitude, and came up empty-handed. Even his sister Daphne, who was as good a sport as any, would have been howling about the cold by now. "'We're almost there,' he assured her. "'I'm all—' "'Oh, are you all right?' Benedict was gripped by a wave of coughs, the deep, hacking kind that rumbled down in one's chest. His lungs felt as if they were on fire— and his throat like someone had taken a razor blade to it. I'm fine, he gasped, jerking slightly on the reins to make up for the lack of direction he'd given the horses while he was coughing. You don't sound fine. Had a head cold last week, he said with a wince. Damn, but his lungs felt sore. That didn't sound like your head, she said, giving him what she obviously hoped was a teasing smile. But it didn't look like a teasing smile. In truth, she looked terribly concerned. Must have moved, he muttered. I don't want you getting sick on my account. He tried to grin, but his cheekbones ached too much. I would have been caught in the rain whether I'd taken you along or not. Still, whatever she'd intended to say was lost under another stream of deep, chesty coughs. Sorry, he mumbled. Let me drive, she said, reaching for the reins. He turned to her in disbelief. This is a phaeton, not a single horse wagon. Sophie fought the urge to throttle him. His nose was running, his eyes were red, he couldn't stop coughing, and still he found the energy to act like an arrogant peacock. I assure you, she said slowly, that I know how to drive a team of horses. And where did you acquire that skill? the same family that allowed me to share in their daughter's lessons. Sophie lied. I learned to drive a team when the girls learned. The lady of the house must have taken quite a liking to you, he said. She did quite, Sophie replied, trying not to laugh. Araminta had been the lady of the house, and she'd fought tooth and nail every time her father had insisted that she be allowed to receive the same instruction as Rosamond and Posy. They'd all three learned how to drive teams the year before the Earl had died. I'll drive, thank you, Benedict said sharply. Then he ruined the entire effect by launching into yet another coughing fit. Sophie reached for the reins. For the love of... Here, he said, thrusting them toward her as he wiped his eyes. Take them, but I'll be watching you. I would expect no less, she said peevishly. The rain didn't exactly make for ideal driving conditions, and it had been years since she'd held reins in her hands, but she thought she acquitted herself rather nicely. There were some things one didn't forget, she supposed. It felt rather nice, actually, to do something she hadn't done since her previous life, when she'd been, officially at least, an earl's ward. She'd had fine clothes then, and good food, and interesting lessons, and— she sighed. It hadn't been perfect, but it had been better than anything that had come after. What's wrong? Benedict asked. Nothing. Why should you think something is wrong? 
you sighed. You heard me over the wind? she asked incredulously. I've been paying close attention. I'm sick enough. Cough, cough. Without you landing us in a ditch. Sophie decided not even to credit him with a reply. Turn right up ahead, he directed. It'll take us directly to my cottage. She did as he asked. Does your cottage have a name? My cottage. I might have known, she muttered. He smirked. Quite a feat, in her opinion, since he looked sick as a dog. I'm not kidding, he said. Sure enough, in another minute, they pulled up in front of an elegant country house, complete with a small, unobtrusive sign in front reading, My Cottage. The previous owner coined the name, Benedict said, as he directed her toward the stables, but it seemed to fit me as well. Sophie looked over at the house, which, while fairly small, was no humble dwelling. You call this a cottage? No, the previous owner did, he replied. You should have seen his other house. A moment later they were out of the rain, and Benedict had hopped down and was unhitching the horses. He was wearing gloves, but they were completely sodden and slipping on the bridle, and so he peeled them off and flung them away. Sophie watched him as he went about his work, his fingers were wrinkled like prunes and trembling from the cold. Let me help, she said, stepping forward. I can do it. Of course you can, she said placatingly. But you can do it faster with my help. He turned, presumably to refuse her again, then doubled over as he was racked by coughs. Sophie quickly rushed in and led him to a nearby bench. Sit down, please, she implored him. I'll finish up the job. She thought he'd disagree, but this time he gave in. I'm sorry, he said hoarsely. I... There's nothing to feel sorry about, she said, making quick work of the job, or as quick as she could. Her fingers were still numb, and bits of her skin had turned white from having been wet for so long. Not very... He coughed again, this one lower and deeper than before. Gentlemanly of me... Oh, I think I can forgive you this time, considering the way you saved me earlier this evening. Sophie tried to give him a jaunty smile, but for some reason it wobbled, and without warning she found herself inexplicably near tears. She turned quickly away, not wanting him to see her face. But he must have seen something, or maybe just sensed that something was wrong, because he called out, Are you all right? I'm fine, she replied but her voice came out strained and choked, and before she knew it, he was next to her, and she was in his arms. It's all right, he said soothingly. You're safe now. The tears burst forth. She cried for what could have been her fate that evening, and she cried for what had been her fate for the past nine years. She cried for the memory of when he'd held her in his arms at the masquerade, and she cried because she was in his arms right now. She cried because he was so damned nice, and even though he was clearly ill, even though she was, in his eyes, nothing but a housemaid, he still wanted to care for her and protect her. She cried because she hadn't let herself cry in longer than she could remember, and she cried because she felt so alone. And she cried because she'd been dreaming of him for so very long, and he hadn't recognised her. It was probably best that he did not, but her heart still ached from it. Eventually, her tears subsided, and he stepped back, touching her chin as he said, Do you feel better now? She nodded, surprised that it was true. Good. You had a scare, and... He jerked away from her, doubling over as he coughed. We really need to get you inside, Sophie said, brushing away the last streaks of her tears. Inside the house, that is. He nodded. I'll race you to the door. Her eyes widened in shock. She couldn't believe that he had the spirit to make a joke of this when he was obviously feeling so poorly. But she wrapped the drawstring of her bag around her hands, hitched up her skirts, and ran for the front door to the cottage. By the time she reached the steps, she was laughing from the exertion,
giggling at the ridiculousness of running wildly to get out of the rain when she was already soaked to the bone. Benedict had, not surprisingly, beaten her to the small portico. He might have been ill, but his legs were significantly longer and stronger. When she skidded to a halt at his side, he was banging on the front door. Don't you have a key? Sophie yelled. The wind was still howling, making it difficult to be heard. He shook his head. I wasn't planning on stopping here. Do you think the caretakers will even hear you? I bloody well hope so, he muttered. Sophie wiped away the rivulets of water running over her eyes and peeked in a nearby window. It's very dark, she told him. Do you think they might not be home? I don't know where else they'd be. Shouldn't there at least be a maid or a footman? Benedict shook his head. I'm so rarely here it seemed foolish to hire a full staff. The maids only come in for the day. Sophie grimaced. I'd suggest we look for an open window, but that's rather unlikely in the rain. Not necessary, Benedict said grimly. I know where the spare key is hidden. Sophie looked at him in surprise. Why do you sound so glum about it? He coughed several times before answering. Because it means I have to go back out into the bloody storm. Sophie knew he was truly reaching the end of his patience. He'd already sworn twice in front of her, and he didn't seem the sort to curse in front of a woman, even a mere housemaid. Wait here, he ordered, and then before she could reply, he left the shelter of the portico and dashed away. A few minutes later, she heard a key turning in the lock, and the front door swung open to reveal Benedict, holding a candle and dripping all over the floor. I don't know where Mr. and Mrs. Crabtree are, he said, his voice raspy from all his coughing, but they're definitely not here. Sophie gulped. We're alone, he nodded. Completely. She edged toward the stairs. I'd better find the servants' quarters. Oh, no, you won't, he growled, grabbing hold of her arm. I won't, he shook his head. You, dear girl, aren't going anywhere. Chapter 8 It seems one cannot take two steps at a London ball these days without stumbling across a society matron lamenting the difficulties of finding good help. Indeed, this author thought that Mrs. Featherington and Lady Penwood were going to come to blows at last week's Smythe Smith musicale. It seems that Lady Penwood stole Mrs. Featherington's lady's maid right out from under her nose one month ago, promising higher wages and free cast-off clothing. It should be noted that Mrs. Featherington also gave the poor girl cast-off clothing, but anyone who has ever observed the attire of the Featherington girls would understand why the lady's maid would not view this as a benefit. The plot thickened, however, when the lady's maid in question fled back to Mrs. Featherington, begging to be rehired. It seemed that Lady Penwood's idea of a lady's maid included duties more accurately ascribed to the scullery maid, upstairs maid, and cook. Someone ought to tell the woman that one girl cannot do the work of three. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 2nd of May, 1817 We're going to build a fire, Benedict said, and get warm before either of us goes off to bed. I didn't save you from Cavender just so you could die of influenza. Sophie watched him cough anew the spasms racking his body and forcing him to bend over at the waist. Begging your pardon, Mr. Bridgerton, she could not help commenting. But of the two of us, I should think you're more in danger of contracting influenza. Just so, he gasped. And I assure you, I have no desire to be so afflicted either. So, he bent over again as he was once again engulfed by coughs. Mr. Bridgerton, Sophie asked, concern in her voice. He swallowed convulsively and barely managed to say, Just help me get a fire blazing before I cough myself into oblivion. Sophie's brow knit with worry. His coughing fits were coming closer and closer together, and each time they were deeper, more rumbly, 
as if they were coming from the very pit of his chest. She made easy work of the fire. She'd certainly had enough experience setting them as a housemaid, and soon they were both holding their hands as close to the flames as they dared. I don't suppose your change of clothing remained dry, Benedict said, nodding towards Sophie's sodden satchel. I doubt it, she said ruefully, but it's no matter. If I stand here long enough, I'll dry out. Don't be silly, he scoffed, turning around so that the fire might heat his back. I'm sure I can find you a change of clothing. You have women's clothing here? she asked doubtfully. You're not so fussy that you can't wear breeches and a shirt for one evening, are you? Until that very moment, Sophie had probably been exactly that fussy, but put that way, it did seem a little silly. I suppose not, she said. Dry clothing certainly sounded appealing. Good, he said briskly. Why don't you light the furnaces in two bedrooms, and I'll find us both some clothing? I can stay in the servants' quarters, Sophie said quickly. Not necessary, he said, striding out of the room and motioning for her to follow. I've extra rooms, and you are not a servant here. But I am a servant, she pointed out, hurrying after him. Do whatever you please, then. He started to march up the stairs, but had to stop halfway up to cough. You can find a tiny little room in the servants' quarters with a hard little pallet, or you can avail yourself of a guest bedroom, all of which, I assure you, come equipped with feather mattresses and goose-down coverlets. Sophie knew that she should remember her place in the world and march right up the next flight of stairs to the attic. But by God above, a feather mattress and down coverlet sounded like heaven on earth. She hadn't slept in such comfort in years. I'll just find a small guest bedroom, she acceded. The uh, smallest you have. Half of Benedict's mouth quirked up in a dry, I told you so, sort of smile. Pick whichever room you like, but not that one, he said, pointing to the second door on the left. That's mine. I'll get the furnace started in there immediately, she said. He needed the warmth more than she did, and besides, she found herself inordinately curious to see what the inside of his bedroom looked like. One could tell a lot about a person by the decor of his bedchamber. Provided, of course, she thought with a grimace, that one possessed enough funds to decorate in the manner one preferred. Sophie sincerely doubted that anyone could have told anything about her from her little attic turret at the Cavenders, except for the fact that she had not a penny to her name. Sophie left her satchel in the hall and scurried into Benedict's bedchamber. It was a lovely room, warm and masculine, and very comfortable. Despite the fact that Benedict had said he was rarely in residence, there were all sorts of personal items on the desk and tables, miniatures of what had to be his brothers and sisters, leather-bound books, and even a small glass bowl filled with rocks. How odd! Sophie murmured, moving forward, even though she knew she was being dreadfully invasive and nosy. Each one is meaningful in some way, came a deep voice from behind her. I've collected them since... He stopped to cough. Since I was a child. Sophie's face flushed red at having been caught so shamelessly snooping, but her curiosity was still piqued, so she held one up. It was of a pinkish hue, with a ragged grey vein running straight through the middle. What about this one? I picked that one up on a hike, Benedict said softly. It happened to be the day my father died. Oh. Sophie dropped the rock back on the pile as if burned. I'm so sorry. It was long ago. I'm still sorry. He smiled sadly. As am I. Then he coughed so hard that he had to lean against the wall. You need to get warm, Sophie said quickly. Let me get to work on that fire. Benedict tossed a bundle of clothing onto the bed. For you, he said simply. Thank you, she said, keeping her attention focused on the small furnace. It was dangerous to remain in the same room as him. She didn't think he was likely to make an untoward advance. He was far too much of a gentleman to foist himself on a woman he barely knew.
know. The danger lay squarely within herself. Frankly, she was terrified that if she spent too much time in his company, she might fall head over heels in love. And what would that get her? Nothing but a broken heart. Sophie huddled in front of the small iron furnace for several minutes, stoking the flame until she was confident that it would not flicker out. There, she announced, once she was satisfied. She stood up, arching her back slightly as she stretched and turned around. That should take care of... Oh, my! Benedict Bridgerton looked positively green. Are you all right? she asked, hurrying to his side. Don't feel too well, he slurred, leaning heavily against the bedpost. He sounded vaguely intoxicated, but Sophie had been in his company for at least two hours, and she knew that he had not been drinking. You need to get into bed, she said, stumbling under his weight, when he decided to lean against her instead of the bedpost. He grinned. You coming? She lurched back. Now I know you're feverish. He lifted his hand to touch his forehead, but he smacked his nose instead. Ow! he yelped. Sophie winced in sympathy. His hand crept up to his forehead. Hmm, maybe I am a bit hot. It was horribly familiar of her, but a man's health was at stake, so Sophie reached out and touched her hand to his brow. It wasn't burning, but it certainly wasn't cool. You need to get out of those wet clothes, she said. Immediately. Benedict looked down, blinking as if the sight of his sodden clothing was a surprise. Yes, he murmured thoughtfully. Yes, I believe I do. His fingers went to the buttons on his shirt, but they were clammy and numb and kept slipping and sliding. Finally, he just shrugged at her and said helplessly, I can't do it. Oh, dear. Here, I'll... Sophie reached out to undo his buttons, jerked her hands back nervously, then finally gritted her teeth and reached out again. She made quick work of the buttons, doing her best to keep her gaze averted as each undone button revealed another two inches of his skin. Almost done, she muttered. Just a moment now. He didn't say anything in reply, so she looked up. His eyes were closed, and his entire body was swaying slightly. If he weren't standing up, she'd have sworn that he was asleep. Mr. Bridgerton, she asked softly. Mr. Bridgerton? Benedict's head jerked up violently. What? What? You fell asleep. He blinked confusedly. Is there a reason that's bad? You can't fall asleep in your clothing. He looked down. How'd my shirt get undone? Sophie ignored the question, instead nudging him until his behind was leaning against the mattress. Sit, she ordered. She must have sounded suitably bossy, because he did. Have you something dry we can change you into? She asked. He shrugged the shirt off, letting it land on the floor in a messy heap. Never sleep with clothes. Sophie felt her stomach lurch. Well, tonight I think you should, and what are you doing? He looked over at her, as if she'd asked the most inane question in the world. Taking my breeches off. Couldn't you at least wait until I'd turned my back? He stared at her blankly. She stared back. He stared some more. Finally, he said, Well? Well what? Aren't you going to turn your back? Oh, she yelped spinning around as if someone had lit a fire under her feet. Benedict shook his head wearily as he sat on the edge of the bed and pulled off his stockings. God save him from prudish misses. She was a housemaid, for God's sake. Even if she was a virgin, and given her behaviour he rather suspected she was, she'd surely seen a male form before. Housemaids were always slipping in and out of rooms without knocking, carrying towels and sheets and what have you. It was inconceivable she'd never accidentally barged in on a naked man. He stripped off his breeches. Not an easy task, considering they were still more than a little damp, and he had quite literally to peel them from his skin. When he was well and truly naked, 
he quirked a brow in the direction of Sophie's back. She was standing rigidly, her hands fisted tightly at her sides. With surprise, he realized the sight of her made him smile. He was starting to feel a bit sluggish, and it took him two tries before he was able to lift his leg high enough to climb into bed. With considerable effort, he leaned forward and grabbed the edge of his coverlet, dragging it over his body. Then, completely worn out, he sagged back against the pillows and groaned. "'Are you all right?' Sophie called. He made an effort to say, "'Fine,' but it came out more like, "'Mph!' He heard her moving about, and when he summoned up the energy to lift one eyelid halfway open, he saw that she'd moved to the side of the bed. She looked concerned. For some reason, that seemed rather sweet. It had been quite a long time since any woman, who wasn't related to him, had been concerned for his welfare. "'I'm fine,' he mumbled, trying to give her a reassuring smile. But his voice sounded like it was coming through a long, narrow tunnel. He reached up and tugged at his ear. His mouth felt like he was talking properly. The problem must be with his ears. "'Mr. Bridgerton? Mr. Bridgerton?' He pried an eyelid open again. "'Go to bed,' he grunted. "'Get dry.' "'Are you certain?' He nodded. It was getting too difficult to speak. "'Very well. But I'm going to leave your door open. If you need me in the night, just call out.' He nodded again. Or at least he tried to. Then he slept. It took Sophie barely a quarter of an hour to get ready for bed. A surfeit of nervous energy kept her going as she changed into dry clothing and readied the furnace in her room. But once her head hit the pillow, she felt herself succumbing to an exhaustion so total it seemed to come from her very bones. It had been a long day, she thought groggily, a really long day, between attending to her morning chores dashing around the house to escape Cavender and his friends, her eyelids drifted shut. It had been an extraordinarily long day, and... Sophie sat up suddenly, her heart pounding. The fire in the furnace had burned low, so she must have fallen asleep. She'd been dead tired, though, so something must have woken her. Was it Mr. Bridgerton? Had he called out? He'd not looked well when she'd left him but neither had he seemed at death's door. Sophie hopped out of bed, grabbed a candle, then dashed toward the door of her room, grabbing hold of the waistband of the two big breeches Benedict had lent her when they started to slip down her hips. When she reached the hall, she heard the sound that must have woken her up. It was a deep groan, followed by a thrashing noise, followed by what could only be called a whimper. Sophie dashed into Benedict's room, stopping briefly at the furnace to light her candle. He was lying in his bed, almost preternaturally still. Sophie edged toward him, her eyes focusing on his chest. She knew he couldn't possibly be dead, but she'd feel an awful lot better once she saw his chest rise and fall. "'Mr. Bridgerton,' she whispered. "'Mr. Bridgerton?' No response. She crept closer, leaning over the edge of the bed, Mr. Bridgerton? His hand shot out and grabbed her shoulder, pulling her off balance until she fell onto the bed. Mr. Bridgerton! Sophie squealed. Let go! But he'd started to thrash and moan, and there was enough heat coming off his body that Sophie knew he was in the grips of a fever. She somehow managed to wrench herself free, and she went tumbling off the bed while he continued to toss and turn, mumbling streams of words that made no sense. Sophie waited for a quiet moment, then darted her hand out to touch his forehead. It was on fire. She chewed on her lower lip as she tried to decide what to do. She had no experience nursing the feverish, but it seemed to her that the logical thing would be to cool him off. On the other hand, sick rooms always seemed to be kept closed, stuffy and warm. So maybe... Benedict started to thrash again, and then, out of nowhere, he murmured, "'Kiss me.' Sophie lost hold of her breeches. They fell to the floor, 
She let out a little yelp of surprise as she quickly bent to retrieve them. Clutching the waistband securely with her right hand, she reached out to pat his hand with her left, then thought the better of it. "'You're just dreaming, Mr. Bridgerton,' she told him. "'Kiss me,' he repeated, but he did not open his eyes. Sophie leaned in closer. Even by the light of one solitary candle, she could see his eyeballs moving quickly under his lids. It was bizarre, she thought, to see another person dream. "'God damn it!' he suddenly yelled. "'Kiss me!' Sophie lurched back in surprise, setting her candle hastily on the bedside table. "'Mr. Bridgerton, I—' she began, fully intending to explain why she could not even begin to think about kissing him. But then she thought, why not? Her heart fluttering wildly, she leaned down and brushed the barest, lightest, most gentle of kisses on his lips. I love you, she whispered. I've always loved you. To Sophie's everlasting relief, he didn't move. It wasn't the sort of moment she wanted him to remember in the morning. But then, just when she was convinced that he'd settled back into a deep sleep, his head began to toss from side to side, leaving deep indentations in his feather pillow. Where'd you go? he grunted hoarsely. Where'd you go? I'm right here, Sophie replied. He opened his eyes, and for the barest of seconds appeared completely lucid as he said, not you. Then his eyes rolled back, and his head started tossing from side to side again. Well, I'm all you've got, Sophie muttered. Don't go anywhere, she said with a nervous laugh. I'll be right back. And then, her heart pounding with fear and nerves, she ran out of the room. If there was one thing Sophie had learned in her days as a housemaid— it was that most households were run in essentially the same way. It was for that reason that she had no trouble at all finding spare linens to replace Benedict's sweat-soaked sheets. She also scavenged a pitcher full of cool water and a few small towels for dampening his brow. Upon her return to his bedroom, she found him lying still again, but his breathing was shallow and rapid. Sophie reached out and touched his brow again. She couldn't be certain, but it seemed to her that it was growing warmer. Oh, dear, this was not good, and she was singularly unqualified to care for a feverish patient. Araminta, Rosamond, and Posy had never had a sick day in their lives, and the Cavenders had all been uncommonly healthy as well. The closest she'd ever come to nursing had been helping Mrs. Cavender's mother, who'd been unable to walk, but she'd never taken care of someone with a fever. She dunked a cloth in the pitcher of water, then wrung it out until it was no longer dripping from the corners. This ought to make you feel a little better, she whispered, placing it gingerly on his brow. Then she added, in a rather unconfident voice, At least I hope it will. He didn't flinch when she touched him with the cloth. Sophie took that as an excellent sign, and she prepared another cool towel, she had no idea where to put it, though. His chest somehow didn't seem right, and she certainly wasn't going to allow the bedsheet to drift any lower than his waist, unless the poor man was at death's door. And even then, she wasn't certain what she could possibly do down there that would resurrect him. So she finally just dabbed with it behind his ears, and a little on the sides of his neck. "'Does that feel better?' she asked, not expecting any sort of an answer, but feeling nonetheless that she ought to continue with her one-sided conversation. I really don't know very much about caring for the ill, but it just seems to me like you'd want something cool on your brow. I know if I was sick, that's how I'd feel. He shifted restlessly, mumbling something utterly incoherent. Really? Sophie replied, trying to smile but failing miserably. I'm glad you feel that way. He mumbled something else. No, she said, dabbing the cool cloth on his ear. I'd have to agree with what you said the first time. He went still again. I'd be happy to reconsider, she said worriedly. Please don't take offence. 
he didn't move. Sophie sighed. One could only converse so long with an unconscious man before one started to feel extremely silly. She lifted up the cloth she'd placed on his forehead and touched his skin. It felt kind of clammy now, clammy and still warm, which was a combination she wouldn't have thought possible. She decided to leave the cloth off for now, and she laid it over the top of the pitcher. There seemed little she could do for him at that very moment, so Sophie stretched her legs and walked slowly around his room, shamelessly examining everything that wasn't nailed down, and quite a bit that was. The collection of miniatures was her first stop. There were nine on the writing desk. Sophie surmised that they were of Benedict's parents and seven brothers and sisters. She started to put the siblings in order according to their ages, but then it occurred to her that the miniatures most likely hadn't been painted all at the same time, so she could be looking at a likeness of his older brother at fifteen and younger brother at twenty. She was struck by how alike they all were, with the same deep chestnut hair, wide mouths and elegant bone structure. She looked closely to try to compare eye colour, but found it impossible in the dim candlelight, and besides, eye colour often wasn't easily discerned on a miniature anyway. Next to the miniatures was the bowl with Benedict's rock collection. Sophie picked a few of them up in turn, rolling them lightly over her palm. Why are these so special to you, I wonder? she whispered, placing them carefully back in the bowl. They just looked like rocks to her, but she supposed that they might appear more interesting and unique to Benedict if they represented special memories for him. She found a small wooden box that she absolutely could not open. It must have been one of those trick boxes she'd heard about that came from the Orient. And most intriguing, leaning against the side of the desk, was a large sketchbook filled with pencil drawings, mostly of landscapes, but with a few portraits as well. Had Benedict drawn them? Sophie squinted at the bottom of each drawing. The small squiggles certainly looked like two bees. Sophie sucked in her breath, an unbidden smile lighting her face. She'd never dreamed that Benedict was an artist. There had never even been a peep about it in Whistledown, and it seemed like the sort of thing the gossip columnist would have figured out over the years. Sophie drew the sketchbook closer to her candle and flipped through the pages. She wanted to sit with the book and spend ten minutes perusing each sketch, but it seemed too intrusive to examine his drawings in such detail. She was probably just trying to justify her nosiness, but somehow it didn't seem as bad just to give them a glance. The landscapes were varied. Some were of my cottage, or should she call it his cottage, and some were of a larger house which Sophie supposed was the country home of the Bridgerton family. Most of the landscapes featured no architecture at all, just a babbling brook, or a windswept tree, or a rain-dappled meadow. And the amazing thing about his drawings was that they seemed to capture the whole and true moment. Sophie could swear that she could hear that brook babbling, or the wind ruffling the leaves on that tree. The portraits were fewer in number, but Sophie found them infinitely more interesting. There were several of what had to be his littlest sister, and a few of what she thought must be his mother. One of Sophie's favourites was of what appeared to be some kind of outdoor game. At least five Bridgerton siblings were holding long mallets, and one of the girls was depicted at the forefront, her face screwed up in determination as she tried to aim a ball through a wicket. Something about the picture almost made Sophie laugh out loud. She could feel the merriment of the day, and it made her long desperately for a family of her own. She glanced back at Benedict, still sleeping quietly in his bed. Did he realise how lucky he was to have been born into such a large and loving clan? With a sigh, Sophie flipped through a few more pages until she reached the end of the book. The very last sketch was different from the rest, if only because it appeared to be of a night scene, and the woman in it was holding her skirts above her ankles as she ran across... Good God!
Sophie gasped, thunderstruck. It was her. She brought the sketch closer to her face. He'd gotten the details of her dress, that wonderful, magical silver concoction that had been hers for only a single evening, perfectly. He'd even remembered her long elbow-length gloves and the exact manner in which her hair had been styled. Her face was a little less recognisable, but one would have to make allowances for that, given that he'd never actually seen it in its entirety. Well, not until now. Benedict suddenly groaned, and when Sophie glanced over, she saw that he was shifting restlessly in the bed. She closed up the sketchbook and put it back into its place before hurriedly making her way to his side. Mr. Bridgerton, she whispered. She wanted desperately to call him Benedict. That was how she thought of him. That was what she'd called him in her dreams these long two years. But that would be inexcusably familiar, and certainly not in keeping with her position as a servant. Mr. Bridgerton, she whispered again, are you all right? His eyelids fluttered open. Do you need anything? He blinked several times, and Sophie couldn't be sure whether he'd heard her or not. He looked so unfocused, she couldn't even be sure whether he'd truly seen her. Mr. Bridgerton? He squinted. Sophie, he said hoarsely, his throat sounding terribly dry and scratchy. The housemaid. She nodded. I'm here. What do you need? Water, he rasped. Right away. Sophie had been dunking the cloths into the water in the pitcher, but she decided that now was no time to be fussy, so she grabbed hold of the glass she'd brought up from the kitchen and filled it. Here you are, she said, handing it to him. His fingers were shaky, so she did not let go of the glass as he brought it to his lips. He took a couple of sips, then sagged back against his pillows. Thank you, he whispered. Sophie reached out and touched his brow. It was still quite warm, but he seemed lucid once again, and she decided to take that as a sign that the fever had broken. I think you'll be better in the morning. He laughed. Not hard, and not with anything approaching vigour, but he actually laughed. Not likely, he croaked. Well, not recovered, she allowed, but I think you'll feel better than you do right now. It would certainly be hard to feel worse. Sophie smiled at him. Do you think you can scoot to one side of your bed so I can change your sheets? He nodded and did as she asked, closing his weary eyes as she changed the bed around him. That's a neat trick, he said when she was done. Mrs. Cavender's mother often came to visit, Sophie explained. She was bedridden so I had to learn how to change the sheets without her leaving the bed. It's not terribly difficult. He nodded. I'm going back to sleep now. Sophie gave his shoulder a reassuring pat. She just couldn't help herself. You'll feel better in the morning, she whispered. I promise. Chapter 9 it has oft been said that physicians make the worst patients, but it is the opinion of this author that any man makes a terrible patient. One might say it takes patience to be a patient, and heaven knows, the males of our species lack an abundance of patience. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 2nd of May, 1817 The first thing Sophie did the following morning was scream. She'd fallen asleep in the straight-backed chair next to Benedict's bed. Her limbs sprawled most inelegantly, and her head cocked to the side in a rather uncomfortable position. Her sleep had been light at first. Her ears perked to listen for any sign of distress from the sickbed. But after an hour or so of complete, blessed silence, exhaustion claimed her, and she fell into a deeper slumber, the kind from which one ought to awaken in peace with a restful, easy smile on one's face. Which may have been why, when she opened her eyes and saw two strange people staring at her, she had such a fright that it took a full five minutes for her heart to stop racing. 
Who are you? The words tumbled out of Sophie's mouth before she realized exactly who they must be. Mr. and Mrs. Crabtree, the caretakers of my cottage. Who are you? The man demanded, not a little bit belligerently. Sophie Beckett, she said with a gulp. I... She pointed desperately at Benedict. He... Spit it out, girl! Don't torture her! Came a croak from the bed. Three heads swiveled in Benedict's direction. You're awake! Sophie exclaimed. Wish to God I weren't, he muttered. My throat feels like it's on fire. Would you like me to fetch you some more water? Sophie asked solicitously. He shook his head. Tea, please. She shot to her feet. I'll go get it. I'll get it, Mrs. Crabtree said firmly. Would you like help? Sophie asked timidly. Something about this pair made her feel like she were ten years old. They were both short and squat, but they positively exuded authority. Mrs. Crabtree shook her head. A fine housekeeper I am if I can't prepare a pot of tea. Sophie gulped. She couldn't tell whether Mrs. Crabtree was miffed or joking. I never meant to imply... Mrs. Crabtree waved off her apology. Shall I bring you a cup? You shouldn't fetch anything for me, Sophie said. I must... Bring her a cup, Benedict ordered. But... He jabbed his finger at her, grunting, Be quiet, before turning to Mrs. Crabtree and bestowing upon her a smile that could have melted an ice cap. Would you be so kind as to include a cup for Miss Beckett on the tray? Of course, Mr. Bridgerton, she replied. But may I say... You can say anything you please once you return with the tea, he promised. She gave him a stern look. I have a lot to say. Of that I have no doubt. Benedict, Sophie and Mr. Crabtree waited in silence while Mrs. Crabtree left the room. And then, when she was safely out of earshot, Mr. Crabtree positively chortled and said, You're in for it now, Mr. Bridgerton. Benedict smiled weakly. Mr. Crabtree turned to Sophie and explained, When Mrs. Crabtree has a lot to say, she has a lot to say. Oh, Sophie replied. She would have liked to have said something slightly more articulate, but oh was truly the best she could come up with on such short notice. And when she has a lot to say, Mr. Crabtree continued, his smile growing wide and sly, she likes to say it with great vigour. Fortunately, Benedict said in a dry voice, we'll have our tea to keep us occupied. Sophie's stomach grumbled loudly. And, Benedict continued, shooting her an amused glance, a fair bit of breakfast too, if I know Mrs. Crabtree. Mr. Crabtree nodded. Already prepared, Mr. Bridgerton. We saw your horses in the stables when we returned from our daughter's house this morning, and Mrs. Crabtree got to work on breakfast straight away. She knows how you love your eggs. Benedict turned to Sophie and gave her a conspiratorial sort of smile. I do love eggs. Her stomach grumbled again. We didn't know there'd be two of you, though, Mr. Crabtree said. Benedict chuckled, then winced at the pain. I can't imagine that Mrs. Crabtree didn't make enough to feed a small army. Well, she didn't have time to prepare a proper breakfast with beef pie and fish, Mr. Crabtree said. But I believe she has bacon and ham and eggs and toast. Sophie's stomach positively growled. She clapped her hand to her belly, just barely resisting the urge to hiss, Be quiet. You should have told us you were coming, Mr. Crabtree added shaking a finger at Benedict. We never would have gone visiting if we'd known to expect you. It was a spur-of-the-moment decision, Benedict said, stretching his neck from side to side. Went to a bad party and decided to leave. Mr. Crabtree jerked his head towards Sophie. Where'd she come from? She was at the party. I wasn't at the party, Sophie corrected. I just happened to be there. Mr. Crabtree squinted at her suspiciously. What's the difference? I wasn't attending the party, 
I was a servant at the house. You're a servant? Sophie nodded. That's what I've been trying to tell you. You don't look like a servant. Mr. Crabtree turned to Benedict. Does she look like a servant to you? Benedict shrugged helplessly. I don't know what she looks like. Sophie scowled at him. It might not have been an insult, but it certainly wasn't a compliment. If she's somebody else's servant, Mr. Crabtree persisted, then what's she doing here? May I save my explanations until Mrs. Crabtree returns? Benedict asked, since I'm certain she'll repeat all of your questions. Mr. Crabtree looked at him for a moment, blinked, nodded, then turned back to Sophie. Why are you dressed like that? Sophie looked down and realised with horror that she'd completely forgotten she was wearing men's clothes. Men's clothes so big that she could barely keep the breeches from falling to her feet. My clothes were wet, she explained. From the rain. Mr. Crabtree nodded sympathetically. Quite a storm last night. That's why we stayed over at our daughter's. We'd planned to come home, you know. Benedict and Sophie just nodded. She doesn't live terribly far away, Mr. Crabtree continued, just on the other side of the village. He glanced over at Benedict, who nodded immediately. Has a new baby, he added. A girl. Congratulations, Benedict said, and Sophie could see from his face that he was not merely being polite. He truly meant it. A loud clomping sound came from the stairway. Surely Mrs. Crabtree returning with breakfast. I ought to help, Sophie said, jumping up and dashing for the door. Once a servant, always a servant, Mr. Crabtree said sagely. Benedict wasn't sure, but he thought he saw Sophie wince. A minute later, Mrs. Crabtree entered, bearing a splendid silver tea service. Where's Sophie? Benedict asked. I sent her down to get the rest. Mrs. Crabtree replied. She should be up in no time. Nice girl, she added in a matter-of-fact tone. But she needs a belt for those breeches you lent her. Benedict felt something squeeze suspiciously in his chest at the thought of Sophie the housemaid, with her breeches round her ankles. He gulped uncomfortably when he realised the tight sensation might very well be desire. Then he groaned and grabbed at his throat, because uncomfortable gulps were even more uncomfortable after a night of harsh coughing. You need one of my tonics, Mrs. Crabtree said. Benedict shook his head frantically. He'd had one of her tonics before. It had had him retching for three hours. I won't take no for an answer, she warned. She never does, Mr. Crabtree added. The tea will work wonders, Benedict said quickly. I'm sure but Mrs. Crabtree's attention had already been diverted. "'Where is that girl?' she muttered, walking back to the door and looking out. "'Selfie! Selfie!' "'If you can keep her from bringing me a tonic,' Benedict whispered urgently to Mr. Crabtree, "'it's a fiver in your pocket.' Mr. Crabtree beamed. "'Consider it done.' "'There she is,' Mrs. Crabtree declared, Oh, heaven above! What is it, dearie? Mr. Crabtree asked, ambling toward the door. The poor thing can't carry a tray and keep her breeches up at the same time, she replied, clucking sympathetically. Aren't you going to help her? Benedict asked from the bed. Oh, yes, of course. She hurried out. I'll be right back, Mr. Crabtree said over his shoulder. Don't want to miss this. Someone get the bloody girl a belt, Benedict yelled grumpily. It didn't seem quite fair that everyone got to go out to the hall and watch the sideshow while he was stuck in bed, and he definitely was stuck there. Just the thought of getting up made him dizzy. He must have been sicker than he'd realised the night before. He no longer felt the urge to cough every few seconds, but his body felt worn out, exhausted, his muscles ached, and his throat was damned sore. Even his teeth didn't feel quite right. He had vague recollections of Sophie taking care of him, 
she'd put cool compresses on his forehead, watched over him, even sung him a lullaby, but he'd never quite seen her face. Most of the time he hadn't had the energy to open his eyes, and even when he had, the room had been dark, always leaving her in shadows, reminding him of... Benedict sucked in his breath, his heart thumping crazily in his chest, as, in a sudden flash of clarity, he remembered his dream. He'd dreamed of her. It was not a new dream, although it had been months since he'd been visited by it. It was not a fantasy for the innocent, either. Benedict was no saint, and when he dreamed of the woman from the masquerade, she was not wearing her silver dress. She was not, he thought with a wicked smile, wearing anything. But what perplexed him was why this dream would return now, after so many months of dormancy. Was there something about Sophie that had triggered it? He'd thought, he'd hoped, that the disappearance of the dream had meant he was over her. Obviously not. Sophie certainly didn't look like the woman he'd danced with two years earlier. Her hair was all wrong, and she was far too thin. He distinctly remembered the lush, curvy feel of the masked woman in his arms. In comparison, Sophie could only be called scrawny. He supposed their voices were a bit similar, but he had to admit to himself that, as time passed, his memories of that night grew less vivid, and he could no longer recall his mystery woman's voice with perfect clarity. Besides, Sophie's accent, while exceptionally refined for a housemaid, was not as upper crust as hers had been. Benedict let out a frustrated snort. How he hated calling her her. That seemed the cruelest of her secrets. She'd kept from him even her name. Part of him wished she'd just lied and given him a false name. At least then he'd have something to think of her by in his mind. Something to whisper in the night when he was staring out the window, wondering where in hell she was. Benedict was saved from further reflection by the sounds of stumbling and bumbling in the hallway. Mr. Crabtree was the first to return, staggering under the weight of the breakfast tray. "'What happened to the rest?' Benedict asked suspiciously, eyeing the door. "'Mrs. Crabtree went off to find Sophie some proper clothing,' Mr. Crabtree replied, setting the tray down on Benedict's desk. "'Ham or bacon?' "'Both. I'm famished. And what the devil does she mean by proper clothing?' A dress, Mr. Bridgerton. That's what women wear. Benedict seriously considered lobbing a candle stump at him. I meant, he said, with what he considered saintly patience, where is she going to find a dress? Mr. Crabtree walked over with a plate of food on a footed tray that would fit over Benedict's lap. Mrs. Crabtree has several extras. She's always happy to share. Benedict choked on the bite of egg he'd shuffled into his mouth. "'Mrs. Crabtree and Sophie are hardly the same size. Neither are you,' Mr. Crabtree pointed out. "'And she wore your clothes just fine. I thought you said the breeches fell off in the hall.' "'Well, we don't have to worry about that with the dress, do we? I hardly think her shoulders are going to slip through the neck hole.' Benedict decided it was safer for his sanity to mind his own business— and he turned his full attention to his breakfast. He was on his third plate when Mrs. Crabtree bustled in. "'Here we are,' she announced. Sophie slunk in, practically drowning in Mrs. Crabtree's voluminous dress, except, of course, at her ankles. Mrs. Crabtree was a good five inches shorter than Sophie. Mrs. Crabtree beamed. "'Doesn't she look smashing?' Oh, yes, Benedict replied, lips twitching. Sophie glared at him. You'll have plenty of room for breakfast, he said gamely. It's only until I get her clothing cleaned up, Mrs. Crabtree explained. But at least it's decent. She waddled over to Benedict. How is your breakfast, Mr. Bridgerton? Delicious, he replied. I haven't eaten so well in months. Mrs. Crabtree leaned forward and whispered, 
I like your Sylvie. May we keep her? Benedict choked. On what, he didn't know, but he choked nonetheless. I beg your pardon. Mr. Crabtree and I aren't as young as we used to be. We could use another set of hands around here. I, uh, well, he cleared his throat. I'll think about it. Excellent. Mrs. Crabtree crossed back to the other side of the room and grabbed Sophie's arm. You come with me. Your stomach has been growling all morning. When was the last time you ate? Uh, sometime yesterday, I should think. When yesterday? Mrs. Crabtree persisted. Benedict hid a smile under his napkin. Sophie looked utterly overwhelmed. Mrs. Crabtree tended to do that to a person. Uh, well, actually... Mrs. Crabtree planted her hands on her hips. Benedict grinned. Sophie was in for it now. Are you going to tell me that you didn't eat yesterday? Mrs. Crabtree boomed. Sophie shot a desperate look at Benedict. He replied with a don't-look-to-me-for-help shrug. Besides, he rather enjoyed watching Mrs. Crabtree fuss over her. He'd be willing to bet that the poor girl hadn't been fussed over in years. I was very busy yesterday, Sophie hedged. Benedict frowned. She'd probably been busy running from Philip Cavender and the pack of idiots he called friends. Mrs. Crabtree shoved Sophie into the seat behind the desk. Eat, she ordered. Benedict watched as Sophie tucked into the food. It was obvious that she was trying to put on her best manners, but eventually hunger must have gotten the best of her, because after a minute she was practically shoveling the food into her mouth. It was only when Benedict noticed that his jaw was clamped together like a vice that he realised he was absolutely furious, at whom he wasn't precisely certain. But he did not like seeing Sophie so hungry. They had an odd little bond, he and the housemaid. He'd saved her, and she'd saved him. Oh, he doubted his fever from the night before would have killed him. If it had been truly serious, he'd still be battling it now. But she had cared for him, and made him comfortable, and probably hastened his road to recovery. Will you make certain she eats at least another plateful? Mrs. Crabtree asked Benedict. I'm going to make up a room for her. In the servants' quarters, Sophie said quickly. Don't be a silly. Until we hire you on, you're not a servant here. But nothing more about it, Mrs. Crabtree interrupted. Would you like my help, dearie? Mr. Crabtree asked. Mrs. Crabtree nodded, and in a moment the couple was gone. Sophie paused in her quest to consume as much food as humanly possible to stare at the door through which they'd just disappeared. She supposed they considered her one of their own, because if she'd been anything but a servant, they'd never have left her alone with Benedict. Reputations could be ruined on far less. "'You didn't eat at all yesterday, did you?' Benedict asked quietly. Sophie shook her head. Next time I see Cavender, he growled, I'm going to beat him to a bloody pulp. If she were a better person, she would have been horrified. But Sophie couldn't quite prevent a smile at the thought of Benedict further defending her honour, or of seeing Philip Cavender with his nose relocated to his forehead. Fill up your plate again, Benedict said, if only for my sake. I assure you that Mrs. Crabtree counted how many eggs and strips of bacon were on the platter when she left, and she'll have my head if the numbers haven't gone down by the time she returns. She's a very nice lady, Sophie said, reaching for the eggs. The first plate of food had barely touched upon her hunger. She needed no further urging to eat. The best. Sophie expertly balanced a slice of ham between a serving fork and spoon, and moved it to her plate. How are you feeling this morning, Mr. Bridgerton? Very well, thank you. Or if not well, then at least a damn sight better than I did last night. I was very worried about you, she said, spearing a corner of the ham with her fork, and then cutting a piece off with her knife. 
It was very kind of you to care for me. She chewed, swallowed, then said, It was nothing, really. Anyone would have done it. Perhaps, he said, but not with such grace and good humour. Sophie's fork froze in mid-air. Thank you, she said softly. That is a lovely compliment. I didn't... <clears throat> he cleared his throat. Sophie eyed him curiously, waiting for him to finish whatever it was he wanted to say. Never mind, he mumbled. Disappointed, she put a piece of ham in her mouth. I didn't do anything for which I ought to apologize, did I? He suddenly blurted out. Sophie spat the ham out into her napkin. I'll take that as a yes, he muttered. No, she said quickly. Not at all. You merely startled me. His eyes narrowed. You wouldn't lie to me about this, would you? Sophie shook her head as she remembered the single, perfect kiss she'd given him. He hadn't done anything that required an apology, but that didn't mean that she hadn't. You're blushing, he accused. No, I'm not. Yes, he said. You are. If I'm blushing... She replied pertly, It's because I'm wondering why you would think you had any reason to apologize. You have a rather smart mouth for a servant, he said. I'm sorry, Sophie said quickly. She had to remember her place. But that was hard to do with this man. The one member of the ton who had treated her, if only for a few hours, as an equal. I meant it as a compliment, he said. Do not stifle yourself on my account. She said nothing. I find you rather... He paused, obviously searching for the correct word. Refreshing. Oh, she set her fork down. Thank you. Have you plans for the rest of the day? He asked. She looked down at her huge garments and grimaced. I thought I'd wait for my clothes to be readied. And then I suppose I'll see if any of the nearby houses are in need of housemaids. Benedict scowled at her. I told you I would find you a position with my mother. And I do appreciate that, she said quickly. But I would prefer to stay in the country. He shrugged the shrug of one who has never been thrown one of life's great stumbles. You can work at Aubrey Hall, then, in Kent. Sophie chewed on her lower lip. She couldn't exactly come out and say she didn't want to work for his mother because then she'd have to see him. She couldn't think of a torture that would be more exquisitely painful. You shouldn't think of me as your responsibility, she finally said. He gave her a rather superior glance. I told you I would find you a new position. But what could there possibly be to discuss? Nothing, she grumbled. Nothing at all. Clearly, it was no use arguing with him just then. Good. He leaned back contentedly against his pillows. I'm glad you see it my way. Sophie stood. I should be going. To do what? She felt rather stupid as she said, I don't know. He grinned. Have fun with it, then. Her hand tightened around the handle of the serving spoon. Don't do it, he warned. Do what? Throw the spoon. I wouldn't dream of it, she said tightly. He laughed aloud. Oh, yes, you would. You're dreaming of it right now. You just wouldn't do it. Sophie's hand was gripping the spoon so hard it shook. Benedict was chuckling so hard his bed shook. Sophie stood, still holding the spoon. Benedict smiled. Are you planning to take that with you? Remember your place. Sophie was screaming at herself. Remember your place. Whatever could you be thinking, Benedict mused, to look so adorably ferocious. No, don't tell me, he added. I'm sure it involves my untimely and painful demise. Slowly and carefully, Sophie turned her back to him, and put the spoon down on the table. She didn't want to risk any sudden movements. One false move, 
and she knew she'd be hurling it at his head. Benedict raised his brows approvingly. That was very mature of you. Sophie turned around slowly. Are you this charming with everyone, or only me? Oh, only you, he grinned. I shall have to make sure you take me up on my offer to find you employment with my mother. You do bring out the best in me, Miss Sophie Beckett. This is the best, she asked with obvious disbelief. I'm afraid so. Sophie just shook her head as she walked to the door. Conversations with Benedict Bridgerton could be exhausting. Oh, Sophie, he called out. She turned around. He smiled slyly. I knew you wouldn't throw the spoon. What happened next was surely not Sophie's fault. She was, she was convinced, temporarily and fleetingly possessed by a demon, because she absolutely did not recognize the hand that shot out to the small table next to her and picked up a stump of a candle. True, the hand appeared to be connected quite firmly to her arm, but it didn't look the least bit familiar as it drew back and hurled the stump across the room, straight at Benedict Bridgerton's head. Sophie didn't even wait to see if her aim had been true. But as she stalked out the door, she heard Benedict explode with laughter. Then she heard him shout out, Well done, Miss Beckett! And she realized that for the first time in years, her smile was one of pure, unadulterated joy. Chapter 10 Although he responded in the affirmative, or so says Lady Covington, Benedict Bridgerton did not make an appearance at the annual Covington Ball. Complaints were heard from young women and their mamas across the ballroom. According to Lady Bridgerton, his mother, not his sister-in-law, Mr. Bridgerton left for the country last week and has not been heard from since. Those who might fear for Mr. Bridgerton's health and well-being should not fret. Lady Bridgerton sounded more annoyed than worried. Last year, no less than four couples met their future spouses at the Covington Ball. The previous year, three. Much to Lady Bridgerton's dismay, if any matches are made at this year's Covington Ball, her son Benedict will not be among the grooms. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 5th of May, 1817 There were advantages, Benedict soon discovered, to a long, drawn-out recovery. The most obvious was the quantity and variety of most excellent food brought forth from Mrs. Crabtree's kitchen. He'd always been fed well at my cottage, but Mrs. Crabtree truly rose to the occasion when she had someone tucked away in the sick room. And even better, Mr. Crabtree had managed to intercept all of Mrs. Crabtree's tonics and replace them with Benedict's best brandy. Benedict dutifully drank every drop, but the last time he looked out the window, it appeared that three of his rose bushes had died, presumably where Mr. Crabtree had dumped the tonic. It was a sad sacrifice, but one Benedict was more than willing to make after his last experience with Mrs. Crabtree's tonics. Another perk of staying abed was the simple fact that, for the first time in years, he could enjoy some quiet time. He read, sketched, and even closed his eyes and just daydreamed, all without feeling guilty for neglecting some other task or chore. Benedict soon decided that he'd be perfectly happy leading the life of the indolent. But the best part of his recovery by far was Sophie. She popped into his room several times a day, sometimes to fluff his pillows, sometimes to bring him food, sometimes just to read to him. Benedict had a feeling that her industriousness was due to her desire to feel useful, and to thank him with deeds for saving her from Philip Cavender. But he didn't much care why she came to visit. He just liked it that she did. She'd been quiet and reserved at first, obviously trying to adhere to the standard that servants should be neither seen nor heard. But Benedict had had none of that, and, 
and he'd purposefully engaged her in conversation, just so she couldn't leave, or he'd goad and needle her, simply to get a rise out of her, because he liked her far better when she was spitting fire than when she was meek and submissive. But mostly, he just enjoyed being in the same room with her. It didn't seem to matter if they were talking or if she was just sitting in a chair, leafing through a book while he stared out the window. Something about her presence brought him peace. A sharp knock at the door broke him out of his thoughts, and he looked up eagerly, calling out, Enter! Sophie poked her head in, her shoulder-length curls shaking slightly as they brushed against the edge of the door. Mrs. Crabtree thought you might like tea. Tea? Or tea and biscuits? Sophie grinned, pushing the door open with her hip as she balanced the tray. Oh, the latter, to be sure. Excellent. And will you join me? She hesitated, as she always did, but then she nodded, as she also always did. She'd long since learned that there was no arguing with Benedict when he had his mind set on something. Benedict rather liked it that way. The colour is back in your cheeks, she commented, as she set the tray down on a nearby table. And you don't look nearly so tired. I should think you'll be up and out of bed soon. Oh, soon, I'm sure, he said evasively. You're looking healthier every day. He smiled gamely. Do you think so? She lifted the teapot and paused before she poured. Yes, she said with an ironic smile. I wouldn't have said so otherwise. Benedict watched her hands as she prepared his tea. She moved with an innate sense of grace, and she poured the tea as if she'd been to the manor born. Clearly, the art of afternoon tea had been another one of those lessons she'd learned from her mother's generous employers— or maybe she'd just watched other ladies closely while they'd prepared tea. Benedict had noticed that she was a very observant woman. They'd enacted this ritual often enough that she didn't have to ask how he liked his tea. She handed him his cup, milk, no sugar, and then placed a selection of biscuits and scones on a plate. Fix yourself a cup, Benedict said, biting into a biscuit, and come sit by me. She hesitated again. He knew she'd hesitate, even though she'd already agreed to join him. But he was a patient man, and his patience was rewarded with a soft sigh as she reached out and plucked another cup off the tray. After she'd fixed her own cup, two lumps of sugar, just the barest splash of milk, she sat in the velvet-covered, straight-backed chair by his bed, regarding him over the rim of her teacup as she took a sip. No biscuits for you? Benedict asked. She shook her head. I had a few straight out of the oven. Lucky you. They're always best when they're warm. He polished off another biscuit, brushed a few crumbs off of his sleeve, and reached for another. And how have you spent your day? Since I last saw you two hours earlier. Benedict shot her a look that said he recognized her sarcasm, but chose not to respond to it. I helped Mrs. Crabtree in the kitchen, Sophie said. She's making a beef stew for supper and needed some potatoes peeled. Then I borrowed a book from your library and read in the garden. Really? What did you read? A novel. Was it good? She shrugged. Silly, but romantic. I enjoyed it. And do you long for romance? Her blush was instantaneous. That's a rather personal question, don't you think? Benedict shrugged and started to say something utterly flip, like it was worth a try. But as he watched her face, her cheeks turning delightfully pink, her eyes cast down to her lap, the strangest thing happened. He realized he wanted her. He really, really wanted her. He wasn't certain why this so surprised him, of course he wanted her. He was as red-blooded as any man, and one couldn't spend a protracted amount of time around a woman as gamine and adorable as Sophie without wanting her. Hell, he wanted half the women he met, in a purely low-intensity, non-urgent sort of way.'
but in that moment, with this woman, it became urgent. Benedict changed positions. Then he bunched the coverlet up over his lap. Then he changed positions again. Is your bed uncomfortable? Sophie asked. Do you need me to fluff your pillows? Benedict's first urge was to reply in the affirmative, grab her as she leaned across him, and then have his wicked way with her, since they would, rather conveniently, be in bed. But he had a sneaking suspicion that that particular plan would not go over well with Sophie. So instead he said, I'm fine, then winced when he realised his voice sounded oddly squeaky. She smiled as she eyed the biscuits on his plate, saying, Maybe just one more. Benedict moved his arm out of the way to allow her easy access to his plate, which was, he realised somewhat belatedly, resting on his lap. The sight of her hand reaching toward his groin, even if she was aiming for a plate of biscuits, did funny things to him. To his groin, to be precise. Benedict had a sudden vision of things shifting down there, and he hastily grabbed the plate lest it become unbalanced. Do you mind if I take the last? Fine, he croaked. She plucked a ginger biscuit off the plate and frowned. You look better, she said, giving the biscuit a little sniff. But you don't sound better. Is your throat bothering you? Benedict took a quick sip of his tea. Not at all. I must have swallowed a piece of dust. Oh, drink some more tea then. That shouldn't bother you for long. She set her teacup down. Would you like me to read to you? Yes, Benedict said quickly, bunching up his coverlet around his waist. She might try to take away the strategically placed plate, and then where would he be? Are you certain you're all right? She asked, looking far more suspicious than concerned. He smiled tightly. Just fine. Very well, she said, standing up. What would you like me to read? Oh, anything, he said, with a blithe wave of his hand. Poetry? Splendid. He would have said splendid had she offered to read a dissertation on botany in the Arctic tundra. Sophie wandered over to a recessed bookshelf and idly perused its contents. Byron? she asked. Blake? Blake, he said quite firmly. An hour's worth of Byron's romantic drivel would probably send him quite over the edge. She slid a slim volume of poetry off the shelf and returned to her chair, swishing her rather unattractive skirts before she sat down. Benedict frowned. He'd never really noticed before how ugly her dress was. Not as bad as the one Mrs. Crabtree had lent her, but certainly not anything designed to bring out the best in a woman. He ought to buy her a new dress. She would never accept it, of course, but maybe if her current garments were accidentally burned. Mr. Bridgerton? But how could he manage to burn her dress? She'd have to not be wearing it, and that posed a certain challenge in and of itself. Are you even listening to me? Sophie demanded. Hmm? You're not listening to me. Uh, sorry, he admitted. My apologies. My mind got away from me. Please continue. She began anew, and in his attempt to show how much attention he was paying her, he focused his eyes on her lips, which proved to be a big mistake. Because suddenly those lips were all he could see, and he couldn't stop thinking about kissing her, and he knew, absolutely knew, that if one of them didn't leave the room in the next thirty seconds, he was going to do something for which he'd owe her a thousand apologies. Not that he didn't plan to seduce her, just that he'd rather do it with a bit more finesse. Oh, dear, he blurted out. Sophie gave him an odd look. He didn't blame her. He sounded like a complete idiot. He didn't think he'd uttered the phrase, oh, dear, in years, if ever. Hell. He sounded like his mother. Is something wrong? Sophie asked. I just remembered something, he said rather stupidly, in his opinion. She raised her brows in question. 
something that I'd forgotten, Benedict said. The things one remembers, she said, looking exceedingly amused, are most often things one had forgotten. He scowled at her. I'll need a bit of privacy. She stood instantly. Of course, she murmured. Benedict fought off a groan. Damn, she looked hurt. He hadn't meant to injure her feelings. He just needed to get her out of the room so that he didn't yank her into the bed. It's a personal matter, he told her, trying to make her feel better, but suspecting that all he was doing was making himself look like a fool. Oh, she said knowingly, would you like me to bring you the chamber pot? I can walk to the chamber pot, he retorted, forgetting that he didn't need to use the chamber pot. She nodded and stood, setting the book of poetry onto a nearby table. I'll leave you to your business. Just ring the bell pull when you need me. I'm not going to summon you like a servant, he growled. But I am not for me or not, he said. The words emerged a little more harshly than was necessary. But he'd always detested men who preyed on helpless female servants. The thought that he might be turning into one of those repellent creatures was enough to make him gag. Very well, she said her words meek, like a servant. Then she nodded like a servant. He was fairly certain she did it just to annoy him, and left. The minute she was gone, Benedict leapt out of the bed and ran to the window. Good. No one was in sight. He shrugged off his dressing gown, replaced it with a pair of breeches and a shirt and jacket, and looked out the window again. Good. Still no one. Boots. Boots, he muttered, glancing around the room. Where the hell were his boots? Not his good boots, the pair for mucking around in the mud. Ah, there they were. He grabbed the boots and yanked them on. Back to the window. Still no one. Excellent. Benedict threw one leg over the sill, then another, then grabbed hold of the long, sturdy branch that jutted out from a nearby elm tree. From there, it was an easy shimmy, wiggle, and balancing act down to the ground. And from there, it was straight to the lake, to the very cold lake, to take a very cold swim. If he needed the chamber pot, Sophie muttered to herself, he could have just said so. It's not as if I haven't fetched chamber pots before. She stamped down the stairs to the main floor, not entirely certain why she was going downstairs. She had nothing specific to do there, but heading in that direction simply because she couldn't think of anything better to do. She didn't understand why he had so much trouble treating her like what she was, a servant. He kept insisting that she didn't work for him and didn't have to do anything to earn her keep at my cottage— and then, in the same breath, assured her that he would find her a position in his mother's household. If he would just treat her like a servant, she'd have no trouble remembering that she was an illegitimate nobody, and he was a member of one of the Ton's wealthiest and most influential families. Every time he treated her like a real person, and it was her experience that most aristocrats did not treat servants like anything remotely approaching a real person, it brought her back to the night of the masquerade, when she'd been, for one perfect evening, a lady of glamour and grace, the sort of woman who had a right to dream about her future with Benedict Bridgerton. He acted as if he actually liked her and enjoyed her company, and maybe he did, but that was the cruelest twist of all, because he was making her love him, making a small part of her think she had the right to dream about him. And then, inevitably, she had to remind herself of the truth of the situation, and it hurt so damned much. Oh, there you are, Miss Sophie. Sophie lifted up her eyes, which had been absently following the cracks in the parquet floor, to see Mrs. Crabtree descending the stairs behind her. "'Good day, Mrs. Crabtree,' Sophie said. "'How is that beef stew coming along?' "'Fine, fine,' Mrs. Crabtree said absently, 
We were a bit short on carrots, but I think it will be tasty nonetheless. Have you seen Mr. Bridgerton? Sophie blinked in surprise at the question. In his room, just a minute ago. Well, he's not there now. I think he had to use the chamber pot. Mrs. Crabtree didn't even blush. It was the sort of conversation servants often had about their employers. Well, if he did use it, he didn't use it, if you know what I mean, she said. The room smelled as fresh as a spring day. Sophie frowned. And he wasn't there? Neither hide nor hair. I can't imagine where he might have gone. Mrs. Crabtree planted her hands on her ample hips. I'll search the downstairs and you search the up. One of us is bound to find him. I'm not sure that's such a good idea, Mrs. Crabtree. If he's left his room, he probably had a good reason. Most likely he doesn't want to be found. But he's ill, Mrs. Crabtree protested. Sophie considered that, then pictured his face in her mind. His skin had held a healthy glow, and he hadn't looked the least bit tired. I'm not so certain about that, Mrs. Crabtree, she finally said. I think he's malingering on purpose. Don't be silly, Mrs. Crabtree scoffed. Mr. Bridgerton would never do something like that. Sophie shrugged. I wouldn't have thought so, but truly, he doesn't look the least bit ill any longer. It's my tonics, Mrs. Crabtree said with a confident nod. I told you they'd speed up his recovery. Sophie had seen Mr. Crabtree dump the tonics in the rose bushes. She'd also seen the aftermath. It hadn't been a pretty sight. How she managed to smile and nod, she'd never know. Well, I for one would like to know where he went, Mrs. Crabtree continued. He shouldn't be out of bed, and he knows it. I'm sure he'll return soon, Sophie said placatingly. In the meantime, do you need any help in the kitchen? Mrs. Crabtree shook her head. No, no. All that stew needs to do now is cook. And besides, Mr. Bridgerton has been scolding me for allowing you to work. But no arguments, if you please, Mrs. Crabtree cut in. He's right, of course. You're a guest here, and you shouldn't have to lift a finger. I'm not a guest, Sophie protested. Well, then, what are you? That gave Sophie pause. I have no idea, she finally said. But I'm definitely not a guest. A guest would be... A guest would be... She struggled to make sense of her thoughts and feelings. I suppose a guest would be someone who is of the same social rank, or at least close to it. A guest would be someone who has never had to wait upon another person, or scrub floors, or empty chamber pots. A guest would be anyone the master of the house chooses to invite as a guest, Mrs. Crabtree retorted. That's the beauty of being the master of the house. You can do anything you please, and you should stop belittling yourself. If Mr. Bridgerton chooses to regard you as a house guest, then you should accept his judgment and enjoy yourself. When was the last time you were able to live in comfort without having to work your fingers to the bone in return? He can't truly regard me as a house guest, Sophie said quietly. If he did, he would have installed a chaperone for the protection of my reputation. As if I would allow anything untoward in my house, Mrs. Crabtree bristled. Of course you wouldn't, Sophie assured her. But where reputations are at stake, appearance is just as important as fact. And in the eyes of society, a housekeeper does not qualify as a chaperone, no matter how strict and pure her morals may be. If that's true, Mrs. Crabtree protested, then you need a chaperone, Miss Sophie. Don't be silly. I don't need a chaperone because I'm not of his class. No one cares if a housemaid lives and works in the household of a single man. No one thinks any less of her, and certainly no one who would consider her for marriage would consider her ruined. Sophie shrugged. It's the way of the world, and obviously it's the way Mr. Bridgerton thinks, whether he'll admit it or not, because he has never once said a word about it being improper for me to be here. 
Well, I don't like it, Mrs. Crabtree announced. I don't like it one bit. Sophie just smiled, because it was so sweet of the housekeeper to care. I think I'm going to take myself off for a walk, she said. As long as you're certain you don't need any help in the kitchen. And, she added with a sly grin, as long as I'm in this strange, hazy position, I might not be a guest, but it is the first time in years I'm not a servant, and I'm going to enjoy my free time while it lasts. Mrs. Crabtree gave her a hearty pat on the shoulder. You do that, Miss Sophie, and pick a flower for me while you're out there. Sophie grinned and headed out the front door. It was a lovely day, unseasonably warm and sunny, and the air held the gentle fragrance of the first blooms of spring. She couldn't recall the last time she'd taken a walk for the simple pleasure of enjoying the fresh air. Benedict had told her about a nearby pond, and she thought she might amble that way, maybe even dip her toes in the water if she was feeling particularly daring. She smiled up at the sun. The air might be warm, but the water was surely still freezing so early in May. Still, it would feel good. Anything felt good that represented leisure time and peaceful, solitary moments. She paused for a moment, frowning thoughtfully at the horizon. Benedict had mentioned that the lake was south of my cottage, hadn't he? A southward route would take her right through a rather densely wooded patch, but a bit of a hike certainly wouldn't kill her. Sophie picked her way through the forest, stepping over tree roots and pushing aside low-lying branches, letting them snap back behind her with reckless abandon. The sun barely squeaked through the canopy of leaves above her, and down at ground level it felt more like dusk than midday. Up ahead she could see a clearing, which she assumed must be the pond. As she drew closer, she saw the glint of sunlight on water, and she breathed a little sigh of satisfaction, happy to know that she'd gone in the correct direction. But as she drew even closer, she heard the sound of someone splashing about, and she realised, with equal parts terror and curiosity, that she was not alone. She was only ten or so feet from the edge of the pond, easily visible to anyone in the water, so she quickly flattened herself behind the trunk of a large oak. If she had a sensible bone in her body, she'd turn right around and run back to the house. But she just couldn't quite keep herself from peeking around the tree and looking to see who might be mad enough to splash about in a lake so early in the season. With slow, silent movements, she crept out from behind the tree, trying to keep as much of herself concealed as possible and she saw a man, a naked man, a naked Benedict. Chapter 11 The housemaid wars rage on in London. Lady Penwood called Mrs. Featherington a conniving ill-bred thief in front of no less than three society matrons, including the very popular Dowager Viscountess Bridgerton. Mrs. Featherington responded by calling Lady Penwood's home no better than a workhouse, citing the ill-treatment of her lady's maid, whose name, this author has learned, is not Estelle, as was originally claimed, and furthermore she is not remotely French. The girl's name is Bess, and she hails from Liverpool. Lady Penwood stalked away from the altercation in quite a huff, followed by her daughter, Miss Rosamond Ryling. Lady Penwood's other daughter, Posy, who was wearing an unfortunate green gown, remained behind, with a somewhat apologetic look in her eyes, until her mother returned, grabbed her by the sleeve, and dragged her off. This author certainly does not make up the guest lists at society parties, but it is difficult to imagine that the Penwoods will be invited to Mrs. Featherington's next soiree. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers 7th of May, 1817 It was wrong of her to stay. So wrong, so very, very wrong, and yet she did not move an inch. She found a large, bald, painted rock, 
mostly obscured by a short, squat bush, and sat down, never once taking her eyes off of him. He was naked. She still couldn't quite believe it. He was, of course, partially submerged, with the edge of the water rippling against his ribcage. The lower, she thought giddily, edge of his ribcage. Or perhaps, if she were to be honest with herself, she'd have to rephrase her previous thought to, he was, unfortunately, partially submerged. Sophie was as innocent as the next, as, well, the next innocent, but dash it all, she was curious, and she was more than halfway in love with this man. Was it so very wicked to wish for a huge gust of wind, powerful enough to create a small tidal wave that would whip the water away from his body and deposit it somewhere else? Anywhere else? Very well, it was wicked. She was wicked, and she didn't care. She'd spent her life taking the safe road, the prudent path. Only one night in her short life had she completely thrown caution to the wind, and that night had been the most thrilling, the most magical, the most stupendously wonderful night of her life. And so she decided to remain right where she was, stay the course, and see what she saw. It wasn't as if she had anything to lose. She had no job, no prospects, save for Benedict's promise to find her a position in his mother's household, and she had a feeling that would be a very bad idea anyway. And so she sat back, tried not to move a muscle, and kept her eyes wide, wide open. Benedict had never been a superstitious man, and he'd certainly never thought himself the sort with a sixth sense. But once or twice in his life, he'd experienced a strange surge of awareness, a sort of mystical, tingling feeling that warned him that something important was afoot. The first time had been the day his father had died. He'd never told anyone about this, not even his older brother Antony, who'd been utterly devastated by their father's death. But that afternoon, as he and Antony had raced across the fields of Kent in some silly horse race, he'd felt an odd, numb feeling in his arms and legs, followed by the strangest pounding in his head. It hadn't hurt, precisely, but it had sucked the air from his lungs and left him with the most intense sensation of terror he could ever imagine. He'd lost the race, of course. It was difficult to grip reins when one's fingers refused to work properly, and when he'd returned home, he'd discovered that his terror had not been unwarranted. His father was already dead, having collapsed after being stung by a bee. Benedict still had difficulty believing that a man as strong and vital as his father could be felled by a bee, but there had been no other explanation. The second time it had happened, however, the feeling had been completely different. It had been the night of his mother's masquerade right before he'd seen the woman in the silver dress. Like the time before, the sensation had started in his arms and legs, but instead of feeling numb, this time he felt an odd tingling, as if he'd just suddenly come alive after years of sleepwalking. Then he'd turned and seen her, and he'd known she was the reason he was there that night, the reason he lived in England, hell, the very reason he'd been born. Of course, she had gone and proven him wrong by disappearing into thin air, but at the time he'd believed all that, and if she'd let him, he would have proven it to her as well. Now, as he stood in the pond, the water lapping at his midriff, just above his navel, he was struck once again by that odd sense of somehow being more alive than he'd been just seconds earlier. It was a good feeling, an exciting, breathless rush of emotion— it was like before, when he'd met her. Something was about to happen, or maybe someone was near. His life was about to change. And he was, he realised with a wry twist of his lips, naked as the day he was born. It didn't exactly put a man at an advantage, at least not unless he was in between a pair of silk sheets with an attractive young woman at his side, or underneath. He took a step into slightly deeper waters, the soft sludge of the pond bottom squishing between his toes. Now the water reached a couple of inches higher. He was bloody well freezing, but at least he was mostly covered up. He scanned the shore, 
looking up into trees and down in the bushes. There had to be someone there. Nothing else could account for the strange, tingling feeling that had now spread throughout his body. And if his body could tingle while submerged in a lake so cold, he was terrified to see his own privates. The poor things felt like they'd shrunk to nothing, which was not what a man liked to imagine. Then it must be a very strong tingle indeed. Who is out there? he called out. No answer. He hadn't really expected one, but it had been worth a try. He squinted as he searched the shore again, turning a full 360 degrees as he watched for any sign of movement. He saw nothing but the gentle ruffling of the leaves in the wind, but as he finished his sweep of the area, he somehow knew. Sophie! He heard a gasp, followed by a huge flurry of activity. Sophie Beckett! he yelled. If you run from me right now, I swear I will follow you, and I will not take the time to don my clothing. The noises coming from the shore slowed. I will catch up with you, he continued, because I'm stronger and faster, and I might very well feel compelled to tackle you to the ground, just to be certain you do not escape. The sounds of her movement ceased. Good, he grunted. Show yourself. She didn't. Sophie, he warned. There was a beat of silence, followed by the sound of slow, hesitant footsteps. And then he saw her, standing on the shore in one of those awful dresses he'd like to see sunk to the bottom of the Thames. What are you doing here? he demanded. I went for a walk. What are you doing here? she countered. You're supposed to be ill. That... she waved her arm toward him and, by extension, the pond, can't possibly be good for you. He ignored her question and comment. Were you following me? Of course not, she replied, and he rather believed her. He didn't think she possessed the acting talents to fake that level of righteousness. I would never follow you to a swimming hole, she continued. It would be indecent. And then her face went completely red, because they both knew she hadn't a leg to stand on with that argument. If she had truly been concerned about decency, she'd have left the pond the second she'd seen him, accidentally or not. He lifted one hand from the water and pointed toward her, twisting his wrist as he motioned for her to turn around. Give me your back while you wait for me, he ordered. It will only take me a moment to pull on my clothing. I'll go home right now, she offered. You'll enjoy greater privacy and... You'll stay, he said firmly. But he crossed his arms. Do I look like a man in the mood to be argued with? She stared at him mutinously. If you run, he warned, I will catch you. Sophie eyed the distance between them, then tried to judge the distance back to my cottage. If he stopped to pull on his clothing, she might have a chance of escaping. But if he didn't, Sophie, he said, I can practically see the steam coming out of your ears. Stop taxing your brain with useless mathematical computations and do as I asked. One of her feet twitched. Whether it was itching to run home or merely turn around, she'd never know. Now, he ordered. With a loud sigh and grumble, Sophie crossed her arms and turned around to stare at a knot-hole in the tree-trunk in front of her, as if her very life depended on it. The infernal man wasn't being particularly quiet as he went about his business, and she couldn't seem to keep herself from listening to, and trying to identify, every sound that rustled and splashed behind her. Now he was emerging from the water. Now he was reaching for his britches. Now he was... It was no use. She had a dreadfully wicked imagination, and there was no getting around it. He should have just let her return to the house. Instead, she was forced to wait, utterly mortified, while he dressed. Her skin felt like it was on fire, and she was certain her cheeks must be eight different shades of red. A gentleman would have let her weasel out of her embarrassment and hole up in her room back at the house for at least three days in hopes that he'd just forget about the entire affair.' 
but Benedict Bridgerton was obviously determined not to be a gentleman this afternoon, because when she moved one of her feet just to flex her toes, which were falling asleep in her shoes, honest, barely half a second passed before he growled, Don't even think about it. I wasn't, she protested. My foot was falling asleep. And hurry up. It can't possibly take so long to get dressed. Oh, he drawled. You're doing this just to torture me, she grumbled. You may feel free to face me at any time, he said, his voice laced with quiet amusement. I assure you that I asked you to turn your back for the sake of your sensibilities, not mine. I'm just fine where I am, she replied. After what seemed like an hour, but what was probably only three minutes, she heard him say, You may turn around now. Sophie was almost afraid to do so. He had just the sort of perverse sense of humour that would compel him to order her around before he'd donned his clothing. But she decided to trust him. Not, she was forced to admit, that she had much choice in the matter. And so she turned around. Much to her relief, and, if she was to be honest with herself, a fair bit of disappointment, he was quite decently dressed save for a smattering of damp spots where the water from his skin had seeped through the fabric of his clothing. "'Why didn't you just let me run home?' she asked. "'I wanted you here,' he said simply. "'But why?' she persisted. He shrugged. "'I don't know. Punishment, perhaps, for spying on me.' "'I wasn't!' Sophie's denial was automatic, but she cut herself off halfway through— because of course she'd been spying on him. Smart girl, he murmured. She scowled at him. She would have liked to have said something utterly droll and witty, but she had a feeling that anything emerging from her mouth just then would have been quite the opposite. So she held her tongue. Better to be a silent fool than a talkative one. It's very bad form to spy on one's host, he said, planting his hands on his hips, and somehow managing to look both authoritative and relaxed at the same time. It was an accident, she grumbled. Oh, I believe you there, he said. But even if you didn't intend to spy on me, the fact remains that when the opportunity arose, you took it. Do you blame me? He grinned. Not at all. I would have done precisely the same thing. Her mouth fell open. Oh, don't pretend to be offended he said. I'm not pretending. He leaned a bit closer. To tell the truth, I'm quite flattered. It was academic curiosity, she ground out. I assure you. His smile grew sly. So you're telling me that you would have spied upon any naked man you'd come across? Of course not. As I said, he drawled, leaning back against a tree. I'm flattered. Well, now that we have that settled, Sophie said with a sniff, I'm going back to your cottage. She made it only two steps before his hand shot out and grabbed a small measure of the fabric of her dress. I don't think so, he said. Sophie turned back around with a weary sigh. You have already embarrassed me beyond repair. What more could you possibly wish to do to me? Slowly, he reeled her in. That's a very interesting question, he murmured. Sophie tried to plant her heels into the ground, but she was no match for the inexorable tug of his hand. She stumbled slightly, then found herself mere inches away from him. The air suddenly felt hot, very hot, and Sophie had the bizarre sense that she no longer quite knew how to work her hands and feet. Her skin tingled, her heart raced, and the bloody man was just staring at her not moving a muscle, not pulling her the final few inches against him, just staring at her. Benedict, she whispered, forgetting that she still called him Mr. Bridgerton. He smiled. It was a small, knowing sort of smile, one that sent chills right down her spine to another area altogether. I like when you say my name, he said. I didn't mean to, she admitted. He touched a finger to her lips. Shh, he admonished.
Don't tell me that. Don't you know that's not what a man wishes to hear? I don't have much experience with men, she said. Now that's what a man wishes to hear. Really? she asked dubiously. She knew men wanted innocence in their wives, but Benedict wasn't about to marry a girl like her. He touched her cheek with one fingertip. It's what I want to hear from you. A soft rush of air crossed Sophie's lips as she gasped. He was going to kiss her. He was going to kiss her. It was the most wonderful and awful thing that could possibly happen. But, oh, how she wanted this. She knew she was going to regret this tomorrow. She let out a smothered, choking sort of laugh. Who was she kidding? She'd regret it in ten minutes. But she had spent the last two years remembering what it felt like to be in his arms, and she wasn't sure she'd make it through the rest of her days without at least one more memory to keep her going. His finger floated across her cheek to her temple, and then from there traced her eyebrow, ruffling the soft hairs as it moved to the bridge of her nose. So pretty, he said softly, like a storybook fairy. Sometimes I think you couldn't possibly be real. Her only reply was a quickening of breath. I think I'm going to kiss you, he whispered. You think? I think I have to kiss you, he said, looking as if he couldn't quite believe his own words. It's rather like breathing. One doesn't have much choice in the matter. Benedict's kiss was achingly tender. His lips brushed across hers in a feather-light caress, back and forth, with just the barest hint of friction. It was utterly breathtaking. But there was something more, something that made her dizzy and weak. Sophie clutched at his shoulders, wondering why she felt so off-balance and strange. And then it suddenly came to her. It was just like before. The way his lips brushed hers, so soft and sweet, the way he began with gentle titillation, rather than forcing entry, it was just what he'd done at the masquerade. After two years of dreams, Sophie was finally reliving the single most exquisite moment of her life. You're crying, Benedict said, touching her cheek. Sophie blinked then reached up to wipe away the tears she hadn't even known were falling. Do you want me to stop? he whispered. She shook her head. No, she didn't want him to stop. She wanted him to kiss her just as he had at the masquerade, the gentle caress giving way to a more passionate joining. And then she wanted him to kiss her some more, because this time the clock wasn't going to strike midnight, and she wouldn't have to flee and she wanted him to know that she was the woman from the masquerade, and she desperately prayed that he would never recognize her, and she was just so bloody confused, and... And he kissed her, really kissed her, with fierce lips and probing tongue, and all the passion and desire a woman could ever want. He made her feel beautiful, precious, priceless. He treated her like a woman, not some serving wench, and until that very moment, she hadn't realised just how much she missed being treated like a person. Gentry and aristocrats didn't see their servants. They tried not to hear them, and when they were forced to converse, they kept it as short and perfunctory as possible. But when Benedict kissed her, she felt real. And when he kissed her, he did so with his entire body. His lips, which had begun the intimacy with such gentle reverence, were now fierce and demanding on hers. His hands, so large and strong they seemed to cover half her back, held her to him with a strength that left her breathless. And his body, dear God, it ought to be illegal the way it was pressed against hers, the heat of it seeping through her clothing, searing her very soul. He made her shiver. He made her melt. He made her want to give herself to him, something she'd sworn she would never do outside the sacrament of marriage. Oh, Sophie, he murmured, his voice husky against her lips. I've never felt... Sophie stiffened, because she was fairly certain he'd intended to say he'd never felt that way before, 
and she had no idea how she felt about that. On the one hand, it was thrilling to be the one woman who could bring him to his knees, make him dizzy with desire and need. On the other hand, he'd kissed her before. Hadn't he felt the same exquisite torture then, too? Dear God, was she jealous of herself? He pulled back a half inch. What's wrong? She gave her head a little shake. Nothing. Benedict touched his fingers to the tip of her chin and tilted her face up. Don't lie to me, Sophie. What's wrong? I'm... I'm only nervous, she stammered. That's all. His eyes narrowed with concerned suspicion. Are you certain? Absolutely certain. She tugged herself from his grasp and took a few steps away from him, her arms hugging over her chest. I don't do this sort of thing, you know. Benedict watched her walk away, studying the bleak line of her back. I know, he said softly. You're not the sort of girl who would. She gave a little laugh at that, and even though he could not see her face, he could well imagine its expression. How do you know that? she asked. It's obvious in everything you do. She didn't turn around. She didn't say anything. And then, before he had any idea what he was saying, the most bizarre question tumbled from his mouth. Who are you, Sophie? he asked. Who are you, really? She still didn't turn around, and when she spoke, her voice was barely above a whisper. What do you mean? Something isn't quite right about you, he said. You speak too well to be a maid. Her hand was nervously fidgeting with the folds of her skirt as she said, Is it a crime to wish to speak well? One can't get very far in this country with a low-born accent. One could make the argument, he said with deliberate softness, that you haven't gotten very far. Her arms straightened into sticks, straight, rigid sticks, with little tight fists at the end. And then, while he waited for her to say something, she started walking away. Wait! he called out, and he caught up with her in under three strides, grabbing hold of her wrist. He tugged at her, until she was forced to turn around. Don't go, he said. It is not my habit to remain in the company of people who insult me. Benedict nearly flinched, and he knew he would be forever haunted by the stricken look in her eyes. I wasn't insulting you, he said, and you know it. I was speaking the truth. You're not meant to be a housemaid, Sophie. It's clear to me, and it ought to be clear to you. She laughed, a hard, brittle sound he'd never thought to hear from her. And what do you suggest I do, Mr. Bridgerton? she asked. Find work as a governess? Benedict thought that was a fine idea, and he started to tell her so. But she interrupted him, saying, And who do you think will hire me? Well, no one, she snapped. No one will hire me. I have no references, and I look far too young. And pretty, he said grimly. He'd never given much thought to the hiring of governesses, but he knew that the duty usually fell to the mother of the house. And common sense told him that no mother wanted to bring such a pretty young thing into her household. Just look what Sophie had had to endure at the hands of Philip Cavender. You could be a lady's maid, he suggested. At least then you wouldn't be cleaning chamber pots. You'd be surprised, she muttered. A companion to an elderly lady. She sighed. It was a sad, weary sound, and it nearly broke his heart. You're very kind to try to help me, she said, but I have already explored all of those avenues. Besides, I am not your responsibility. You could be. She looked at him in surprise. In that moment, Benedict knew that he had to have her. There was a connection between them, a strange, inexplicable bond that he'd felt only one other time in his life with the mystery lady from the masquerade. And while she was gone, vanished into thin air, Sophie was very real. He was tired of mirages. He wanted someone he could see, someone he could touch. And she needed him. She might not realize it yet, 
but she needed him. Benedict took her hand and tugged, catching her off balance and wrapping her to him when she fell against his body. Mr. Bridgerton, she yelped. Benedict, he corrected, his lips at her ear. Let me say my name, he persisted. He could be very stubborn when it suited his interests, and he wasn't going to let her go until he heard his name cross her lips, and maybe not even then. Benedict, she finally relented. I... Hush. He silenced her with his mouth, nibbling at the corner of her lips. When she went soft and compliant in his arms, he drew back, just far enough so that he could focus on her eyes. They looked impossibly green in the late afternoon light, deep enough to drown in. I want you to come back to London with me, he whispered, the words tumbling forth before he had a chance to consider them. Come back and live with me. She looked at him in surprise. Be mine, he said, his voice thick and urgent. Be mine right now. Be mine forever. I'll give you anything you want. All I want in return is you. Chapter 12 Speculation continues to abound concerning the disappearance of Benedict Bridgerton. According to Eloise Bridgerton, who, as his sister, ought to know, he was due back in town several days ago. But as Eloise must be the first to admit, a man of Mr. Bridgerton's age and stature need hardly report his whereabouts to his younger sister. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 9th of May, 1817 "'You want me to be your mistress?' she said flatly. He gave her a confused look, although she couldn't be sure whether that was because her statement was so obvious or because he objected to her choice of words. "'I want you to be with me,' he persisted. The moment was so staggeringly painful, and yet she found herself almost smiling. "'How is that different from being your mistress?' "'Sophie, how is it different?' she repeated, her voice growing strident. "'I don't know, Sophie,' he sounded impatient. "'Does it matter? It does to me.' "'Fine,' he said in a short voice. "'Fine. Be my mistress. And have this.' Sophie had just enough time to gasp before his lips descended on hers with a ferocity that turned her knees to water. It was like no kiss they'd ever shared— harsh with need, and laced with an odd, strange anger. His mouth devoured hers in a primitive dance of passion. His hands seemed to be everywhere, on her breasts, around her waist, even under her skirt. He touched and squeezed, caressed and stroked, and all the while he had her pressed up so tightly against him she was certain she'd melt into his skin. "'I want you,' he said roughly his lips finding the hollow at the base of her throat. I want you right now. I want you here. Benedict, I want you in my bed, he growled. I want you tomorrow, and I want you the next day. She was wicked, and she was weak, and she gave in to the moment, arching her neck to allow him greater access. His lips felt so good against her skin, sending shivers and tingles to the very centre of her being. He made her long for him, long for all the things she couldn't have, and curse the things she could. And then somehow she was on the ground, and he was there with her, half on and half off of her body. He seemed so large, so powerful, and in that moment so perfectly hers. A very small part of Sophie's mind was still functioning, and she knew that she had to say no, had to put a stop to the madness— but God help her, she couldn't. Not yet. She'd spent so long dreaming about him, trying desperately to remember the scent of his skin, the sound of his voice. There had been many nights when the fantasy of him had been all that had kept her company. She had been living on dreams, and she wasn't a woman for whom many had come true. She didn't want to lose this one just yet. Benedict, she murmured, touching the crisp silkiness of his hair and pretending, pretending that he hadn't just asked her to be his mistress, that she was someone else. 
anyone else, anyone but the bastard daughter of a dead earl, with no means of support besides waiting on others. Her murmuring seemed to embolden him, and his hand, which had been tickling her knee for so long, started to inch upward, squeezing the soft skin of her thigh. Years of hard work had made her lean, not fashionably curvy, but he didn't seem to mind. In fact, she could feel his heart begin to beat even more rapidly, hear his breath coming in hoarser gasps. Sophie, 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 he groaned, his lips moving frantically along her face, until they found her mouth again. I need you. He pressed his hips hotly against hers. Do you feel how I need you? I need you too, she whispered. And she did. There was a fire burning within her that had been simmering quietly for years. The sight of him had ignited it anew, and his touch was like kerosene, sending her into a conflagration. His fingers wrestled with the large, poorly made buttons on the back of her dress. I'm going to burn this, he grunted his other hand relentlessly stroking the tender skin at the back of her knee. I'll dress you in silks, in satins. He moved to her ear, nipping at her lobe, then licking the tender skin where her ear met her cheek. I'll dress you in nothing at all. Sophie stiffened in his arms. He'd managed to say the one thing that could remind her why she was here, why he was kissing her. It wasn't love or any of those tender emotions she'd dreamed about, but lust, and he wanted to make her a kept woman, just as her mother had been. Oh, God, it was so tempting, so impossibly tempting. He was offering her a life of ease and luxury, a life with him, at the price of her soul. No, that wasn't entirely true, or entirely a problem, she might be able to live as a man's mistress. The benefits, and how could she consider life with Benedict anything but a benefit, might outweigh the drawbacks. But while she might be willing to make such decisions with her own life and reputation, she would not do so for a child. And how could there not be a child? All mistresses eventually had children. With a tortured cry, she gave him a shove and wrenched herself away, rolling to the side until she found herself on her hands and knees, stopping to catch her breath before hauling herself to her feet. I can't do this, Benedict, she said, barely able to look at him. I don't see why not, he muttered. I can't be your mistress. He rose to his feet. And why is that? Something about him pricked at her. Maybe it was the arrogance of his tone, Maybe it was the insolence in his posture. Because I don't want to, she snapped. His eyes narrowed, not with suspicion, but with anger. You wanted to just a few seconds ago. You're not being fair, she said in a low voice. I wasn't thinking. His chin jutted out belligerently. You're not supposed to be thinking. That's the point of it. She blushed as she redid her buttons. He'd done a very good job of making her not think. She'd almost thrown away a lifetime of vows and morals, all at one wicked kiss. Well, I won't be your mistress, she said again. Maybe if she said it enough, she'd feel more confident that he wouldn't be able to break down her defences. And what are you going to do instead? he hissed. Work as a housemaid? If I have to. You'd rather wait on people? polish their silver, scrub out their damned chamber pots, then come and live with me. She said only one word, but it was low and true. Yes. His eyes flashed furiously. I don't believe you. No one would make that choice. I did. You're a fool. She said nothing. Do you understand what you're giving up? He persisted, his arm waving wildly as he spoke. She'd hurt him, she realized. She'd hurt him and insulted his pride, and he was lashing out like a wounded bear. Sophie nodded, even though he wasn't looking at her face. I could give you whatever you wanted, he bit off. Clothes? Jewels? Hell, forget about the clothes and jewels. I could give you a bloody roof over your head. 
which is more than you have now. That is true, she said quietly. He leaned forward, his eyes burning hot into hers. I could give you everything. Somehow she managed to stand up straight, and somehow she managed not to cry, and somehow she even managed to keep her voice even, as she said, If you think that's everything, then you probably wouldn't understand why I must refuse. She took a step back, intending to head to his cottage and pack her meagre bag, but he obviously wasn't through with her yet, because he stopped her with a strident, Where are you going? Back to the cottage, she said, to pack my bag. And where do you think you're going to go with that bag? Her mouth fell open. Surely he didn't expect her to stay. Do you have a job? he demanded. A place to go? No, she replied. But he planted his hands on his hips and glared at her. And you think I'm going to just let you leave here, with no money or prospects? Sophie was so surprised, she started to blink uncontrollably. Well, she stammered, I didn't think. No, you didn't think, he snapped. She just stared at him, eyes wide and lips parted, unable to believe what she was hearing. You bloody fool, he swore. Do you have any idea how dangerous it is in the world for a woman alone? Uh, yes, she managed. Actually, I do. If he heard her, he gave no indication just went on about men who take advantage, and helpless women, and fates worse than death. Sophie wasn't positive, but she thought she even heard the phrase roast beef and pudding. About halfway through his tirade, she lost all ability to focus on his words. She just kept watching his mouth and hearing the tone of his voice, all the while trying to comprehend the fact that he seemed remarkably concerned for her welfare, considering that she'd just summarily rejected him. Are you even listening to a word I'm saying? Benedict demanded. Sophie did not nod or shake her head, instead doing an odd combination of both. Benedict swore under his breath. That's it, he announced. You're coming back to London with me. That seemed to wake her up. I just said I'm not. You don't have to be my damned mistress, he bit off. But I'm not leaving you to fend for yourself. I was fending for myself quite adequately before I met you. Adequately, he sputtered. At the Cavenders? You call that adequate? You're not being fair, and you're not being intelligent. Benedict thought that his argument was most reasonable, if a little overbearing, but Sophie obviously did not agree, because, much to his surprise, he found himself lying face up on the ground, having been felled by a remarkably quick right hook. Don't you ever call me stupid, she hissed. Benedict blinked, trying to get his eyesight back to the point where he only saw one of her. I wasn't. Yes, you were, she replied in a low, angry voice. Then she turned on her heel and in the split second before she stalked away, he realised he had only one way to stop her. He certainly wasn't going to make it to his feet with anything resembling speed in his current befuddled state, so he reached out and grabbed one of her ankles with both of his hands, sending her sprawling onto the ground right next to him. It wasn't a particularly gentlemanly manoeuvre, but beggars really couldn't be choosers, and besides, she had thrown the first punch— you're not going anywhere, he growled. Sophie slowly lifted her head, spitting out dirt as she glared at him. I cannot believe, she said scathingly, that you just did that. Benedict let go of her foot and hauled himself to a crouching position. Believe it. You, he held up a hand. Don't say anything now, I beg you. Her eyes bugged out. You're begging me. I hear your voice, he informed her. Therefore, you must be speaking. But, and as for begging you, he said, effectively cutting her off again, I assure you it was merely a figure of speech. She opened her mouth to say something, then obviously thought the better of it, 
clamping her lips shut with a petulant look of a three-year-old. Benedict let out a short breath, then offered her his hand. She was, after all, still sitting in the dirt and not looking especially happy about it. She stared at his hand with remarkable revulsion, then moved her gaze to his face and glared at him with such ferocity that Benedict wondered if he had recently sprouted horns. Still not saying a word, she ignored his offer of help and hefted herself to her feet. As you like, he murmured. A poor choice of words, she snapped, then started marching away. As Benedict was on his feet this time, he felt no need to incapacitate her. Instead, he dogged her every step, remaining a mere, and annoying he was sure, two paces behind her. Finally, after about a minute, she turned around and said, Please leave me alone. I'm afraid I can't, he said. Can't or won't? He thought about that for a moment. Can't. She scowled at him and kept walking. I find it as difficult to believe as you do, Benedict called out, keeping pace with her. She stopped and turned around. That is impossible. I can't help it, he said with a shrug. I find myself completely unwilling to let you go. Unwilling is a far cry from can't. I didn't save you from Cavender just to let you squander your life away. That isn't your choice to make. She had a point there, but he wasn't inclined to give it to her. Perhaps, he allowed, but I'm going to make it anyway. You're coming with me to London. We will discuss it no further. You're trying to punish me, she said, because I refused you. No, he said slowly, considering her words even as he answered. No, I'm not. I'd like to punish you. And in my current state of mind, I'd even go so far as to say you deserve to be punished. But that's not why I'm doing it. Then why are you? It's for your own good. That's the most condescending, patronizing. I'm sure you're right, he allowed. But nonetheless, in this particular case, at this particular moment, I know what's best for you. And you clearly don't. So don't hit me again, he warned. Sophie looked down at her fist, which she hadn't even realised was pulled back and ready to fly. He was turning her into a monster. There was no other explanation. She didn't think she'd ever hit anyone in her life, and here she was, ready to do it for the second time that day. Eyes never leaving her hand, she slowly unclenched her fist, stretching her fingers out like a starfish and holding them there for the count of three. How, she said in a very low voice, do you intend to stop me from going my way? Does it really matter? he asked, shrugging nonchalantly. I'm sure I'll think of something. Her mouth fell open. Are you saying you'd tie me up and— I didn't say anything of the sort, he cut in with a wicked grin. But the idea certainly has its charms. You are despicable, she spat. And you sound like the heroine of a very poorly written novel, he replied. What did you say you were reading this morning? Sophie felt the muscles working frenetically in her cheek, felt her jaw clenching to the point where she was certain her teeth would shatter. How Benedict managed to be the most wonderful and the most awful man in the world at the very same time, she would never understand. Right now, though, the awful side seemed to be winning and she was quite certain, logic aside, that if she remained in his company one more second, her head would explode. I'm leaving, she said, with, in her opinion, great drama and resolve. But he just answered her with a sly half-smile and said, I'm following. And the bloody man remained two strides behind her the entire way home. Benedict didn't often go out of his way to annoy people, with the notable exception of his siblings, but Sophie Beckett clearly brought out the devil in him. He stood in the doorway to her room as she packed, casually lounging against the doorframe. His arms were crossed in a manner that he somehow knew would vex her,
and his right leg was slightly bent, the toe of his boot stubbed up against the floor. Don't forget your dress, he said helpfully. She glared at him. The ugly one, he added, as if clarification were necessary. They're both ugly, she spat out. Ah, a reaction. I know. She went back to shoving her belongings into her satchel. He waved an arm expansively. Feel free to take a souvenir. She straightened, her hands planted angrily on her hips. Does that include the silver tea service? Because I could live for several years on what that would fetch. You may certainly take the tea service, he replied genially, as you will not be out of my company. I will not be your mistress, she hissed. I told you I won't do it. I can't do it. Something about her use of the word can't struck him as significant. He mulled that over for a few moments while she gathered up the last of her belongings and cinched shut the drawstring to her satchel. That's it, he murmured. She ignored him, instead marching toward the door and giving him a pointed look. He knew she wanted him to get out of the way so she could depart. He didn't move a muscle, save for one finger that thoughtfully stroked the side of his jaw. You're illegitimate, he said. The blood drained from her face. You are, he said, more to himself than to her. Strangely, he felt rather relieved by the revelation. It explained her rejection of him, made it into something that had nothing to do with him and everything to do with her. It took the sting out. I don't care if you're illegitimate, he said, trying not to smile. It was a serious moment, but by God, he wanted to break out in a grin, because now she'd come to London with him and be his mistress. There were no more obstacles, and you don't understand anything, she said, shaking her head. It's not about whether I'm good enough to be your mistress. I would care for any children we might have, he said solemnly, pushing himself away from the doorframe. Her stance grew even more rigid, if that were possible. And what about your wife? I don't have a wife. Ever? He froze. A vision of the masquerade lady danced through his mind. He'd pictured her many ways. Sometimes she wore her silver ball gown, sometimes nothing at all. Sometimes she wore a wedding dress. Sophie's eyes narrowed as she watched his face. Then she snorted derisively as she stalked past him. He followed. That's not a fair question, Sophie, he said, dogging her heels. She moved down the hall, not even pausing when she reached the stairs. I think it's more than fair. He raced down the stairs until he was below her, halting her progress. I have to marry some day. Sophie stopped. She had to. He was blocking her path. Yes, you do, she said. But I don't have to be anyone's mistress. Who was your father, Sophie? I don't know, she lied. Who was your mother? She died at my birth. I thought you said she was a housekeeper. Clearly I misrepresented the truth, she said, past the point of caring that she'd been caught in a lie. Where did you grow up? It's of no interest, she said, trying to squirm her way past him. One of his hands wrapped itself around her upper arm, holding her firmly in place. I find it very interesting. Let me go! Her cry pierced the silence of the hall, loud enough so that the Crabtrees would certainly come running to save her, except that Mrs. Crabtree had gone to the village and Mr. Crabtree was outside, out of earshot. There was no one to help her, and she was at his mercy. I can't let you go, he whispered. You're not cut out for a life of servitude. It will kill you. If it were going to kill me, she returned, it would have done so years ago. But you don't have to do this any longer, he persisted. Don't you dare try to make this about me, she said, nearly shaking with emotion. You're not doing this out of concern for my welfare. You just don't like being thwarted. That is true, he admitted. But I also won't see you cast adrift.
I have been adrift all my life, she whispered, and she felt the traitorous sting of tears prick her eyes. God above, she didn't want to cry in front of this man. Not now, not when she felt so off-balance and weak. He touched her chin. Let me be your anchor. Sophie closed her eyes. His touch was painfully sweet, and a not very small part of her was aching to accept his offer, to leave the life she'd been forced to live and cast her lot with him, this marvellous, wonderful, infuriating man who had haunted her dreams for years. But the pain of her childhood was still too fresh, and the stigma of her illegitimacy felt like a brand on her soul. She would not do this to another child. I can't, she whispered. I wish. What do you wish? he asked urgently. She shook her head. She'd been about to tell him that she wished that she could, but she knew that such words would be unwise. He would only latch on to them and press his cause anew, and that would make it all the harder to say no. You leave me no choice, then he stated grimly. Her eyes met his. Either you come with me to London, and... He held up a silencing hand when she tried to protest. And I will find you a position in my mother's household, he added pointedly. Or, she asked, her voice sullen. Or, I will have to inform the magistrate that you have stolen from me. Her mouth abruptly tasted like acid. You wouldn't, she whispered. I certainly don't want to. But you would, he nodded. I would. They'd hang me, she said, or send me to Australia. Not if I requested otherwise. And what would you request? His brown eyes looked strangely flat, and she suddenly realised that he wasn't enjoying the conversation any more than she was. I would request he said, that you be released into my custody. That would be very convenient for you. His fingers, which had been touching her chin all the while, slid down to her shoulder. I'm only trying to save you from yourself. Sophie walked to a nearby window and looked out, surprised that he hadn't tried to stop her. You're making me hate you, you know, she said. I can live with that. She gave him a curt nod. I will wait for you in the library, then. I would like to leave today. Benedict watched her walk away, stood utterly still as the door to the library closed behind her. He knew she would not flee. She was not the sort to go back on her word. He couldn't let this one go. She had left, the great and mysterious she, he thought with a bitter smile, the one woman who had touched his heart, the same woman who had not even given him her name. But now there was Sophie, and she did things to him, things he hadn't felt since her. He was sick of pining for a woman who practically didn't exist. Sophie was here, and Sophie would be his. And, he thought with grim determination, Sophie was not going to leave him, I can live with you hating me, he said to the closed door. I just can't live without you. Chapter 13 It was previously reported in this column that this author predicted a possible match between Miss Rosamond Ryling and Mr. Philip Cavender. This author can now say that this is not likely to occur, Lady Penwood, Miss Ryling's mother, has been heard to say that she will not settle for a mere mister, even though Miss Ryling's father, while certainly well-born, was not a member of the aristocracy. Not to mention, of course, that Mr. Cavender has begun to show a decided interest in Miss Cressida Cooper. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 9th of May, 1817 Sophie started feeling ill the minute the carriage departed my cottage. By the time they stopped for the night at an inn in Oxfordshire, she was downright queasy. And when they reached the outskirts of London, 
well, she was quite convinced she would throw up. Somehow, she managed to keep the contents of her stomach where they belonged, but as their carriage wended farther into the tangled streets of London, she was filled with an intense sense of apprehension. No, not apprehension. Doom. It was May, which meant that the season was in full swing, which meant that Araminta was in residence, which meant that Sophie's arrival was a bad, bad idea. Very bad, she muttered. Benedict looked up. Did you say something? She crossed her arms mutinously. Just that you're a very bad man. He chuckled. She'd known he would chuckle, and it still irritated her. He pulled the curtain away from the window and looked out. We're nearly there, he said. He'd said that he was taking her directly to his mother's residence. Sophie remembered the grand house in Grosvenor Square as if she'd been there the night before. The ballroom was huge, with hundreds of sconces on the walls, each adorned by a perfect beeswax candle. The smaller rooms had been decorated in the Adam style, with exquisitely scalloped ceilings and pale pastel walls. It had been Sophie's dream house, quite literally. In all her dreams of Benedict and their fictional future together, she'd always seen herself in that house. It was silly, she knew, since he was a second son, and thus not in line to inherit the property. But still, it was the most beautiful home she'd ever beheld, and dreams weren't meant to be about reality anyway. If Sophie had wanted to dream her way right into Kensington Palace, that was her prerogative. Of course, she thought with a wry smile, she wasn't likely ever to see the interior of Kensington Palace. What are you smiling about? Benedict demanded. She didn't bother to glance up as she replied, I'm plotting your demise. He grinned. Not that she was looking at him, but it was one of those smiles she could hear in the way he breathed. She hated that she was that sensitive to his every nuance, especially since she had a sneaking suspicion that he was the same way about her. At least it sounds entertaining, he said. What does? she asked, finally moving her eyes from the lower hem of the curtain, which she'd been staring at for what seemed like hours. My demise, he said, his smile crooked and amused. If you're going to kill me, you might as well enjoy yourself while you're at it, because Lord knows I won't. Her jaw dropped a good inch. You're mad, she said. Probably. He shrugged rather casually before settling back in his seat and propping his feet up on the bench across from him. I've all but kidnapped you, after all. I should think that would qualify as the maddest thing I've ever done. You could let me go now, she said, even though she knew he never would. Here in London, where you could be attacked by footpads at any moment, that would be most irresponsible of me, don't you think? It hardly compares to abducting me against my will. I didn't abduct you, he said, idly examining his fingernails. I blackmailed you. There's a world of difference. Sophie was saved from having to reply by the jolt of the carriage as it ground to a halt. Benedict flipped back the curtains one last time, then let them fall into place. Ah, oh, here we are. Sophie waited while he disembarked, then moved to the doorway. She briefly considered ignoring his outstretched hand and jumping down herself, but the carriage was quite high off the ground and she really didn't wish to make a fool of herself by tripping and landing in the gutter. It would be nice to insult him, but not at the cost of a sprained ankle. With a sigh, she took his hand. Very smart of you, Benedict murmured. Sophie looked at him sharply. How did he know what she'd been thinking? I almost always know what you're thinking, he said. She tripped. Whoa, he called out, catching her expertly before she landed in the gutter. He held her just a moment longer than was necessary before depositing her on the pavement. Sophie would have said something, except that her teeth were ground together far too tightly for words. Doesn't the irony just kill you? Benedict asked, smiling wickedly. She pried open her jaw. No, 
that it may very well kill you. He laughed, the blasted man. Come along, he said. I'll introduce you to my mother. I'm sure she'll find some position or another for you. She may not have any openings, Sophie pointed out. He shrugged. She loves me. She'll make an opening. Sophie held her ground, refusing to take a single step alongside him until she'd made her point. I'm not going to be your mistress. His expression was remarkably bland as he murmured, Yes, you've said as much. No, I mean, your plan isn't going to work. He was all innocence. I have a plan. Oh, please, she scoffed. You're going to try to wear me down in hopes that eventually I'll give in. I would never dream of it. I'm sure you dream of quite a bit more, she muttered. He must have heard her because he chuckled. Sophie crossed her arms mutinously, not caring that she looked most undignified in such a position, standing right there on the pavement in full view of the world. No one would pay her half a mind anyway, dressed as she was in the coarse woolens of a servant. She supposed she ought to adopt a brighter outlook and approach her new position with a more optimistic attitude. But drat it all, she wanted to be sullen just then. Frankly, she thought she'd earned it. If anyone had a right to be sullen and disgruntled, it was she. We could stand here on the pavement all day, Benedict said, his voice slightly laced with sarcasm. She started to shoot him an angry glare, but that was when she noticed where they were standing. They weren't in Grosvenor Square. Sophie wasn't even certain where they were. Mayfair, to be sure, but the house before them definitely wasn't the house at which she'd attended the masquerade. Uh, is this Bridgerton House? she asked. He quirked a brow. How did you know my home is called Bridgerton House? You've mentioned it, which was thankfully true. He'd talked about both Bridgerton House and the Bridgerton's country residence, Aubrey Hall, several times during their conversations. Oh, he seemed to accept that. Well, no, actually it's not. My mother moved out of Bridgerton House nearly two years ago. She hosted one last ball. It was a masquerade, actually and then turned the residence over to my brother and his wife. She'd always said she would leave just as soon as he married and started a family of his own. I believe his first child was born a mere month after she left. Was it a boy or a girl? she asked, even though she knew the answer. Lady Whistledown always reported such things. A boy, Edmund. They had another son, Miles, earlier this year. How nice for them. Sophie murmured, even though it felt like her heart was strangling. She wasn't likely to have children of her own, and that was one of the saddest realizations she'd ever reached. Children required a husband, and marriage seemed a pipe dream. She hadn't been raised to be a servant, and thus she had very little in common with most of the men she met in her daily life. Not that the other servants weren't good and honorable people, but it was difficult to imagine sharing her life with someone who, for example, couldn't read. Sophie didn't need to marry someone of particularly high birth, but even the middle class was out of her reach. No self-respecting man in trade would marry a housemaid. Benedict motioned for her to follow him, and she did, until they reached the front steps. Sophie shook her head. I'll use the side entrance. His lips thinned. You'll use the front entrance. I'll use the side entrance, she said firmly. No woman of breeding will hire a maid who enters through the front. You're with me, he ground out. You'll use the front entrance. A bubble of mirth escaped her lips. Benedict, just yesterday you wanted me to become your mistress. Would you dare bring your mistress to meet your mother through the front door? She'd confounded him with that. Sophie grinned as she watched his face twist with frustration. She felt better than she had in days. Would you, she continued, mostly just to torture him further, 
bring your mistress to meet her at all? You're not my mistress, he bit off. Indeed. His chin jutted out, and his eyes bored into hers with barely leashed fury. You're a bloody little housemaid, he said, his voice low, because you've insisted upon being a housemaid. And as a housemaid you are, if somewhat low on the social scale, still utterly respectable. Certainly respectable enough for my mother. Sophie's smile faltered. She might have pushed him too far. Good, Benedict grunted, once it was clear that she was not going to argue the point any further. Come with me. Sophie followed him up the steps. This might actually work to her advantage. Benedict's mother surely would not hire a maid who had the effrontery to use the front door. And since she had steadfastly refused to be Benedict's mistress, he would have to accept defeat and allow her to return to the country. Benedict pushed open the front door, holding it until Sophie entered before him. The butler arrived within seconds. Wickham, Benedict said. Kindly inform my mother that I am here. I will indeed, Mr. Bridgerton, Wickham replied. And might I take the liberty of informing you that she has been rather curious as to your whereabouts this past week? I would be shocked if she hadn't been, Benedict replied. Wickham nodded toward Sophie with an expression that hovered somewhere between curiosity and disdain. Might I inform her of your guest's arrival? Please do. Might I inform her of your guest's identity? Sophie looked over at Benedict with great interest, wondering what he'd say. Her name is Miss Beckett, Benedict replied. She is here to seek employment. One of Wickham's brows rose. Sophie was surprised. She didn't think that butlers were supposed to show any expression whatsoever. As a maid, Wickham inquired. As whatever, Benedict said, his tone beginning to show the first traces of impatience. Very good, Mr. Bridgerton, Wickham said, and then he disappeared up the staircase. I don't think he thought it was very good at all. Sophie whispered to Benedict, careful to hide her smile. Wickham is not in charge here. Sophie let out a little, whatever you say, sort of sigh. I imagine Wickham would disagree. He looked at her with disbelief. He's the butler. And I'm a housemaid. I know all about butlers. More, I dare say, than you do. His eyes narrowed. You act less like a housemaid than any woman of my acquaintance. She shrugged and pretended to inspect a still life painting on the wall. You bring out the worst in me, Mr. Bridgerton. Benedict, he hissed. You've called me by my given name before. Use it now. Your mother is about to descend the stairs, she reminded him. And you are insisting that she hire me as a housemaid. Do many of your servants call you by your given name? He glared at her, and she knew he knew she was right. You can't have it both ways, Mr. Bridgerton, she said, allowing herself a tiny smile. I only wanted it one way, he growled. Benedict! Sophie looked up to see an elegant, petite woman descending the stairs. Her colouring was fairer than Benedict's, but her features marked her clearly as his mother. Mother, he said, striding to meet her at the bottom of the stairs. It is good to see you. It would be better to see you, she said pertly, had I known where you were this past week. The last I'd heard you'd gone off to the Cavender party, and then everyone returned without you. I left the party early, he replied, then went off to my cottage. His mother sighed. I suppose I can't expect you to notify me of your every movement, now that you're thirty years of age. Benedict gave her an indulgent smile. She turned to Sophie. This must be your Miss Beckett. Indeed, Benedict replied. She saved my life while I was at my cottage. Sophie started. I didn't. She did, Benedict cut in smoothly. I took ill from driving in the rain, and she nursed me to health. You would have recuperated without me, she insisted. 
but not, Benedict said, directing his words at his mother, with such speed or in such comfort. Weren't the crab trees at home? Violet asked. Not when we arrived, Benedict replied. Violet looked at Sophie with such obvious curiosity that Benedict was finally forced to explain. Miss Beckett had been employed by the Cavenders, but certain circumstances made it impossible for her to stay. I see, Violet said unconvincingly. Your son saved me from a most unpleasant fate, Sophie said quietly. I owe him a great deal of thanks. Benedict looked to her in surprise. Given the level of her hostility toward him, he hadn't expected her to volunteer complimentary information. But he supposed he should have done. Sophie was highly principled, not the sort to let anger interfere with honesty. It was one of the things he liked best about her. I see, Violet said again, this time with considerably more feeling. I was hoping you might find her a position in your household, Benedict said. But not if it's too much trouble, Sophie hastened to add. No, Violet said slowly, her eyes settling on Sophie's face with a curious expression. No, it wouldn't be any trouble at all, but... Both Benedict and Sophie leaned forward, awaiting the rest of the sentence. Have we met? Violet suddenly asked. I don't think so, Sophie said, stammering slightly. How could Lady Bridgerton think she knew her? She was positive their paths had not crossed at the masquerade. I can't imagine how we could have done. I'm certain you're right, Lady Bridgerton said with a wave of her hand. There is something vaguely familiar about you, but I'm sure it's just that I've met someone with similar features. It happens all the time, especially to me. Benedict said with a crooked smile. Lady Bridgerton looked to her son with obvious affection. It's not my fault all my children ended up looking remarkably alike. If the blame can't be placed with you, Benedict asked, then where may we place it? Entirely upon your father, Lady Bridgerton replied jauntily. She turned to Sophie. They all look just like my late husband. Sophie knew she should remain silent, but the moment was so lovely and comfortable that she said, I think your son resembles you. Do you think? Lady Bridgerton asked, clasping her hands together with delight. How lovely! And here I've always just considered myself a vessel for the Bridgerton family. Mother, Benedict said. She sighed. Am I speaking too plainly? I do that more and more in my old age. You are hardly elderly, mother. She smiled. Benedict, why don't you go visit with your sisters while I take your Miss Bennet? Beckett, he interrupted. Yes, of course. Beckett, she murmured. I shall take her upstairs and get her settled in. You need only take me to the housekeeper, Sophie said. It was most odd for a lady of the house to concern herself with the hiring of a housemaid. Granted, the entire situation was unusual, what with Benedict asking that she be hired on, but it was very strange that Lady Bridgerton would take a personal interest in her. Mrs. Watkins is busy, I'm sure, Lady Bridgerton said. Besides, I believe we have need for another lady's maid upstairs. Have you any experience in that area? Sophie nodded. Excellent. I thought you might. You speak very well. My mother was a housekeeper, Sophie said automatically. She worked for a very generous family, and she broke off in horror, belatedly remembering that she'd told Benedict the truth, that her mother had died at her birth. She shot him a nervous look, and he answered it with a vaguely mocking tilt of his chin, silently telling her that he wasn't going to expose her lie. The family she worked for was very generous, Sophie continued, a relieved rush of air passing across her lips, and they allowed me to share many lessons with the daughters of the house. I see, Lady Bridgerton said. That explains a great deal. I find it difficult to believe you've been toiling as a housemaid. You are clearly educated enough to pursue loftier positions.' 
She reads quite well, Benedict said. Sophie looked to him in surprise. He ignored her, instead saying to his mother, She read to me a great deal during my recuperation. Do you write as well? Lady Bridgerton asked. Sophie nodded. My penmanship is quite neat. Excellent. It is always handy to have an extra pair of hands at my disposal when we are addressing invitations. And we do have a ball coming up later in the summer. I have two girls out this year, she explained to Sophie. I'm hopeful that one of them will choose a husband before the season is through. I don't think Eloise wants to marry, Benedict said. Quiet your mouth, Lady Bridgerton said. Such a statement is sacrilege around here, Benedict said to Sophie. Don't listen to him, Lady Bridgerton said, walking toward the stairs. Here, come with me, Miss Beckett. What did you say your given name was? Sophia, Sophie. Come with me, Sophie. I'll introduce you to the girls. And, she added, her nose crinkling with distaste, we'll find you something new to wear. I cannot have one of our maids dressed so shabbily. A person would think we didn't pay you a fair wage. It had never been Sophie's experience that members of the Tom were concerned about paying their servants fairly, and she was touched by Lady Bridgerton's generosity. You, Lady Bridgerton said to Benedict, wait for me downstairs. We have much to discuss, you and I. I'm quaking in my boots, he deadpanned. Between him and his brother, I don't know which one of them will kill me first, Lady Bridgerton muttered. Which brother? Sophie asked. Either. Both. All three. Scoundrels, the lot of them. But they were scoundrels she clearly loved. Sophie could hear it in the way she spoke, see it in her eyes when they lit with joy upon seeing her son. And it made Sophie lonely and wistful and jealous. How different her life might have been had her mother lived through childbirth. They might have been unrespectable, Mrs. Beckett a mistress and Sophie a bastard, but Sophie liked to think that her mother would have loved her, which was more than she received from any other adult, her father included. Come along, Sophie, Lady Bridgerton said briskly. Sophie followed her up the stairs, wondering why, if she were merely about to begin a new job, she felt as if she were entering a new family. It felt nice, and it had been a long, long while since her life had felt nice. Chapter 14 Rosamond Ryling swears that she saw Benedict Bridgerton back in London. This author is inclined to believe the veracity of the account. Miss Ryling can spot an unmarried bachelor at fifty paces. Unfortunately for Miss Ryling, she can't seem to land one. Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, 12th of May, 1817 Benedict had barely taken two steps toward the sitting room when his sister Eloise came dashing down the hall. Like all the Bridgertons, she had thick chestnut hair and a wide smile. Unlike Benedict, however, her eyes were a clear, crisp grey, a shade quite unlike that possessed by any of her brothers and sisters. Benedict! she called out, throwing her arms rather exuberantly around him. Where have you been? Mother has been grumbling all week, wondering where you'd gone off to. Funny. When I spoke to Mother not two minutes ago, her grumbles were about you, wondering when you were finally planning to marry. Eloise pulled a face. When I meet someone worth marrying, that's when. I do wish someone new would move to town. I feel as though I meet the same hundred or so people over and over again. You do meet the same hundred or so people over and over again. Exactly my point, she said. There are no secrets left in London. I already know everything about everyone. Really? Benedict asked, with no small measure of sarcasm. Mock me all you want, she said, jabbing her finger toward him in a manner he was sure his mother would deem unladylike. But I am not exaggerating. Not even a little bit, he grinned. She scowled at him. Where were you this past week? <laughs> 
he walked into the sitting room and plopped down on a sofa. He probably should have waited for her to sit, but she was just his sister after all, and he'd never felt the need to stand on ceremony when they were alone. Went to the Cavender party, he said, propping his feet up on a low table. It was abominable. Mother will kill you if she catches you with your feet up, Eloise said, sitting down in a chair that was Kitty Corner to him. And why was the party so dreadful? The company. He looked at his feet and decided to leave them where they were. A more boring bunch of lazy louts I've never met. As long as you don't mince words. Benedict raised a brow at her sarcasm. You are hereby forbidden from marrying anyone who was in attendance. An order I shall probably have no difficulty obeying. She tapped her hands against the arms of her chair. Benedict had to smile. Eloise had always been a bundle of nervous energy. But, she said, looking up with narrowed eyes, that doesn't explain where you were all week. Has anyone ever told you that you are exceedingly nosy? Oh, all the time. Where were you? And persistent, too. It's the only way to be. Where were you? Have I mentioned I'm considering investing in a company that manufactures human-sized muscles? She threw a pillow at him. Where were you? As it happens, he said, gently tossing the pillow back in her direction, the answer isn't the least bit interesting. I was at my cottage, recuperating from a nasty cold. I thought you'd already recuperated. He regarded her with an expression that was an unlikely cross between amazement and distaste. How do you know that? I know everything. You should know that by now. She grinned. Colds can be so nasty. Did you have a setback? He nodded. After driving in the rain. Well, that wasn't very smart of you. Is there any reason, he asked, glancing about the room, as if he were directing his question at someone other than Eloise, why I am allowing myself to be insulted by my ninny-hammer of a younger sister? Probably because I do it so well. She kicked at his foot, trying to knock it off the table. Mother will be here at any second, I'm sure. No, she won't, he returned. She's busy. Doing what? He waved his hand toward the ceiling. Orienting the new maid. She sat up straight. We have a new maid. Nobody told me about it. Heavens, he drawled. Something has happened and Eloise doesn't know about it. She leaned back in her chair, then kicked his foot again. Housemaid? Lady's maid? Scullery? Why do you care? It's always good to know what's what. Ladies' maid, I believe. Eloise took all of one half second to digest that. And how do you know? Benedict figured he might as well tell her the truth. The Lord knew. She'd know the whole story by sundown. Even if he didn't. Because I brought her here. The maid? No, mother. Of course the maid. Since when do you trouble yourself with the hiring of servants? Since this particular young lady nearly saved my life by nursing me while I was ill. Eloise's mouth fell open. You were that ill? Might as well let her believe he'd been at death's door. A little pity and concern might work to his advantage next time he needed to wheedle her into something. I have felt better, he said mildly. Where are you going? She'd already risen to her feet. To go find Mother and meet the new maid. She's probably going to wait on Francesca and me, now that Marie is gone. You lost your maid? Eloise scowled. She left us for that odious Lady Penwood. Benedict had to grin at her description. He remembered his one meeting with Lady Penwood quite well. He, too, had found her odious. Lady Penwood is notorious for mistreating her servants. She's gone through three ladies' maids this year. Still, Mrs. Featherington's right out from under her nose, but the poor girl only lasted a fortnight. Benedict listened patiently to his sister's tirade, amazed that he was even interested. And yet, for some strange reason, he was. Marie will come crawling back in a week, 
asking us to take her back on. You mark my words, Eloise said. I always mark your words, he replied. I just don't always care. You, Eloise returned, pointing her finger at him, are going to regret that you said that. He shook his head, smiling faintly. Doubtful. Hm. I'm going upstairs. Do enjoy yourself. She poked her tongue out at him. Surely not appropriate behaviour for a woman of twenty-one, and left the room. Benedict managed to enjoy just three minutes of solitude before footsteps once again sounded in the hall, tapping rhythmically in his direction. When he looked up, he saw his mother in the doorway. He stood immediately. Certain manners could be ignored for one's sister, but never for one's mother. I saw your feet on the table, Violet said, before he could even open his mouth. I was merely polishing the surface with my boots. She raised her brows, then made her way to the chair so recently vacated by Eloise and sat down. All right, Benedict, she said in an extremely no nonsense voice. Who is she? Miss Beckett, you mean? Violet gave him one business like nod. I have no idea. Save that she worked for the Cavenders, and was apparently mistreated by their son. Violet blanched. Did he? Oh dear. Was she? I don't think so, Benedict said grimly. In fact, I'm certain she wasn't, but not for lack of trying on his part. The poor thing! How lucky for her that you were there to save her. Benedict found he didn't like to relive that night on the Cavenders' lawn. Even though the escapade had ended quite favourably, he could not seem to stop himself from racing through the gamut of what ifs. What if he hadn't come along in time? What if Cavender and his friends had been a little less drunk and a little more obstinate? Sophie could have been raped. Sophie would have been raped. And now that he knew Sophie had grown to care about her, the very notion chilled him to the bone. Well, Violet said. She is not who she says she is. Of that I'm certain. Benedict sat up straight. Why do you say that? She is far too educated to be a housemaid. Her mother's employers may have allowed her to share in some of their daughter's lessons, but all of them? I doubt it. Benedict, the girl speaks French. She does. Well, I can't be positive, Violet admitted. But I caught her looking at a book on Francesca's desk that was written in French. Looking is not the same as reading, mother. She shot him a peevish look. I'm telling you. I was looking at the way her eyes were moving. She was reading it. If you say so, you must be correct. Violet's eyes narrowed. Are you being sarcastic? Normally, Benedict said with a smile, I would say yes. But in this case, I was speaking quite seriously. Perhaps she is the cast off daughter of an aristocratic family, Violet mused. Cast off? Forgetting herself with child, she explained. Benedict was not used to his mother speaking quite so frankly. Er,、uh, no, he said, thinking about Sophie's steadfast refusal to become his mistress. I don't think so. But then he thought. Why not? Maybe she refused to bring an illegitimate child into this world because she had already had an illegitimate child and didn't want to repeat the mistake. Benedict's mouth suddenly tasted quite sour. If Sophie had had a child, then Sophie had had a lover. Or maybe, Violet continued, warming to the endeavour, she's the illegitimate child of a nobleman. That was considerably more plausible and more palatable. One would think he'd have settled enough funds on her so that she didn't have to work as a housemaid. A great many men completely ignore their byblows, Violet said, her face wrinkling with distaste. It's nothing short of scandalous. More scandalous than their having the byblows in the first place. Violet's expression turned quite peevish. Besides, Benedict said. Leaning back against the sofa and propping one ankle on the other knee, if she were the bastard of a nobleman, 
and he'd cared for her enough to make sure she had schooling as a child, then why is she completely penniless now? Hmm, that's a good point. Violet tapped her index finger against her cheek, pursed her lips, then continued tapping. But have no fear, she finally said. I shall discover her identity within a month. I'd recommend asking Eloise for help, Benedict said dryly. Violet nodded thoughtfully. Good idea. That girl could get Napoleon to spill his secrets. Benedict stood. I must be going. I'm weary from the road and would like to get home. You can always avail yourself here. He gave her a half-smile. His mother liked nothing better than to have her children close at hand. I need to get back to my own lodgings, he said, leaning down and dropping a kiss on her cheek. Thank you for finding a position for Sophie. Miss Beckett, you mean? Violet asked, her lips curving slyly. Sophie, Miss Beckett, Benedict said, feigning indifference. Whatever you wish to call her. When he left, he did not see his mother smiling broadly at his back. Sophie knew that she should not allow herself to grow too comfortable at Bridgerton House. She would, after all, be leaving just as soon as she could make the arrangements. But as she looked around her room, surely the nicest any servant had ever been assigned, and she thought about Lady Bridgerton's friendly manner and easy smile, she just couldn't help wishing that she could stay forever. But that was impossible. She knew that as well as she knew that her name was Sophia Maria Beckett, not Sophia Maria Gunningworth. First and foremost, there was always the danger that she'd come into contact with Araminta, especially now that Lady Bridgerton had elevated her from housemaid to lady's maid. A lady's maid might, for example, find herself acting as a chaperone or escort on outings outside the house outings to places where Araminta and the girls might choose to frequent. And Sophie had no doubt that Araminta would find a way to make her life a living hell. Araminta hated her in a way that defied reason, went beyond emotion. If she saw Sophie in London, she would not be content simply to ignore her. Sophie had no doubt that Araminta would lie, cheat and steal just to make Sophie's life more difficult. She hated Sophie that much. But if Sophie were to be honest with herself, the true reason she could not remain in London was not Araminta. It was Benedict. How could she avoid him when she lived in his mother's household? She was furious with him right now, beyond furious in all truth. But she knew, deep down, that anger could only be short-lived. How could she resist him, day in and day out, when the mere sight of him made her weak with longing? Some day soon he'd smile at her, one of those sideways crooked sorts of smiles, and she'd find herself clutching onto the furniture just to keep herself from melting into a pathetic pool on the floor. She'd fallen in love with the wrong man, she could never have him on her terms, and she refused to go to him on his. It was hopeless. Sophie was saved from any further depressing thoughts by a brisk knock on her door. When she called out, Yes, the door opened, and Lady Bridgerton entered the room. Sophie immediately jumped to her feet and bobbed a curtsy. Was there anything you needed, my lady? she asked. No, not at all. Lady Bridgerton replied. I was merely checking to see if you were getting settled in. Is there anything I can get for you? Sophie blinked. Lady Bridgerton was asking her if she needed anything, rather the reverse of the usual lady-servant relationship. Uh, no, thank you, Sophie said. I would be happy to get something for you, though. Lady Bridgerton waved her offer away. No need. You shouldn't feel you have to do anything for us today. I'd prefer that you get yourself settled in first, so that you do not feel distracted when you begin. Sophie cast her eyes toward her small bag. I don't have much to unpack. Truly, I should be happy to begin work immediately. Nonsense. It's already nearly the end of the day, 
and we are not planning to go out this evening anyway. The girls and I have made do with only one lady's maid for the past week. We shall certainly survive for one more night. But Lady Bridgerton smiled. No arguments, if you please. One last day free is the least I can do after you saved my son. I did very little, Sophie said. He would have been fine without me. Nonetheless, you aided him when he needed help, and for that I am in your debt. It was my pleasure, Sophie replied. It was the very least I owed him after what he did for me. Then, to her great surprise, Lady Bridgerton walked forward and sat down in the chair behind Sophie's writing desk. Writing desk? Sophie was still trying to fathom that. What maid had ever been blessed with a writing desk? So tell me, Sophie, Lady Bridgerton said with a winning smile, one that instantly reminded her of Benedict's easy grin. Where are you from? East Anglia, originally, Sophie replied, seeing no reason to lie. The Bridgertons were from Kent. It was unlikely that Lady Bridgerton would be familiar with Norfolk, where Sophie had grown up. Not so very far from Sandringham, if you know where that is. I do indeed, Lady Bridgerton said. I haven't been, but I've heard that it is a lovely building. Sophie nodded. It is, quite. Of course I've never been inside, but the exterior is beautiful. Where did your mother work? Blackheath Hall, Sophie replied, this lie slipping easily off her tongue. She'd been asked that question often enough. She'd long since settled upon a name for her fictional home. Are you familiar with it? Lady Bridgerton's brow furrowed. No, I don't believe so. A bit north of Swaffham. Lady Bridgerton shook her head. No, I do not know it. Sophie gave her a gentle smile. Not many people do. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Sophie was unused to an employer wanting to know so much about her personal background. Usually all they cared about were her employment record and references. No, she said. There was only me. Ah, well, at least you had the company of the girls with whom you shared lessons. That must have been nice for you. It was good fun, Sophie lied. In all truth, studying with Rosamond and Posy had been sheer torture. She'd much preferred lessons when she'd been alone with her governess, before they'd come to live at Penwood Park. I must say, it was very generous of your mother's employers. I'm sorry. Lady Bridgerton interrupted herself, her brow furrowing. What did you say their name was? Grenville. Her forehead wrinkled again. I'm not familiar with them. They don't often come to London. Ah, well, that explains it, Lady Bridgerton said. But as I was saying, it was very generous of them to allow you to share in their daughter's lessons. What did you study? Yeah.